everybody today to the Winter Pulse meeting. Uh, my name is Sean Deerland and I'm a director with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers. I'll be your host for the meeting today. Before we get started, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. Please ensure that your phones are turned to silent mode. In the event of the, an emergency, uh, exit the north entrance into the north parking lot. You may exit the west doors and down the stairs into the main parking lot. There's an emergency exit down the staff hallway along the kitchen down the stairs, press the green button and exit the staff entrance in the parking lot. So if you're like me, I didn't catch any of that. So we'll just follow where everybody's going if we need to. Um, there are bathrooms located out the north, double doors in the rotunda area. There are also bathrooms located out the southwest set of doors beside the boardroom and conference room. We're very pleased to meet here in Swift Current. Recognize that everyone can't travel here today. We're proud to offer a live stream option uh, sponsored by Corteva AgriSciences. So welcome everyone uh, attending online. We have a great turnout today and we hope you find today's agenda informative and useful for your farming operations. Um, so I think we have a slide here from our sponsor. Oh, we've got it up there now. Uh, on behalf of Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, I'd like to thank our sponsors today. In addition to Corteva AgriScience, this event is proudly sponsored by FMC Canada, which is sponsoring our morning coffee break. Gowan Canada is sponsoring lunch, and Syngenta Canada is sponsoring our afternoon coffee break. Thank you for supporting this event and Pulse Growers in Saskatchewan. For those in attendance today, if you provided a CCA number at the time of your pre-registration, or when entering today, you'll receive credits for today's presentation presentations. After today, a recording will also be made available online. Uh, so be sure to watch for an email from SPG on how to access those recordings following today's meetings. Today we'll be using Slido, an interactive tool that allows all attendees, both in person and virtual, to ask questions and participate in live polls. Follow the steps on the screen to access Slido. You can uh, open a new window on your computer, phone, or tablet, open your browser, enter the URL slido.com, and enter the event code 3849772. And I'm assuming that'll be up on screen when we need it. You have to click join event. On each table, you can also find a QR code for Slido and the event code in the blue box at the bottom of the card. When a presenter launches a Slido poll in their presentation, you'll be able to participate under the poll tab of your Slido window. There'll also be a Q&A tab open for the day. So if you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them there and the presenter will be able to address those at the end of their presentation. Feel free to add your questions at any point during the presentations. There are also handouts and resources relevant to today's sessions. Those resources will be included in the email you'll receive following today's events. Um, so at this time, I wanna acknowledge some of the SPG board members and staff that we have joining us today. Um, we have Robin Henry, I'm not sure if I see Robin. Oh, there you are. Uh, we have BJ Hobrick, he was here, oh, there he is. Um, and Trent Richards, I didn't see Trent come in. Uh, maybe he's not here yet. Uh, they're all directors of the SPG board, including myself. Uh, we also have some SPG staff here today, so if you could please stand up and wave so we know who we are. Um, I encourage you all to mix and mingle with our board members and staff during our breaks today. It's a good time to ask any questions or um yeah interact with us engaging with growers is important to spg and these winter meetings are one of the main ways we can connect update and share organizational and extension information improved yield and of established pulse crops like lentils peas as well as increasing adoption of smaller acreage crops like chickpeas are both important strategies and key results areas of spg and we'll be covering topics related to these priorities today so we're going to start today's meeting with a presentation about the on-farm agronomic look back and outlook for pulses. And that will be provided by Mike Brown, an agronomy manager with SPG. 
Mike is focused on providing lentil, chickpea, and dry bean extension information and leading related agronomy program initiatives. And remember, any questions that you have, uh, please enter them into Slido at any time during the presentation. So welcome, Mike. I'll hand it off to you. Great. Thanks, Sean. I think this is a slide advancer. All right, look at that. This guy, this thing kind of also looks like uh, your automatic slide openers for your trailers. So if you're within a couple miles, maybe check your gates after you leave here. <laughs> so the topics I'm going to touch on today are soil moisture and herbicide carryover, uh, managing pulses after a dry year, some interim uh, seed test survey results, uh, pulse pest survey results, kosher, and then our profit on farm trial results we have from this year. So starting off with soil moisture and herbicide carryover, I uh, I thought I'd throw a quote up here from Pallister after he did his expedition to uh, or through what is now the Pallister Triangle, and basically he uh, he pulled no punches, letting you know that the land's going to be useless here. So um, I think the producers of the Pallister Triangle have kind of taken this in in spite and proven him wrong recently. We, I mean, this is 160 years ago and we've seen some, uh, you know, some some pretty productive land in, in this area, but uh, some of his points to carry on over the past few years, it's been really hot and it's been really dry. So Les Henry's soil moisture map that he's uh, put out in Grain News this year, he had changed it. So normally it, it finishes on November 1st. Um, this year he's, he's changed it to uh, freeze up versus that November 1st, as we did see some rain and some snowfall uh, able to soak in before before the soils actually froze. So we did change, if you remember the map from last year, it was pretty much the entire thing was red. Um, this year we did we did lose a lot of the red and now we're into yellow, but yellow still does count as, uh, as dry. So again, dry across most of uh, Western Canada. So we'll take a bit of a look, step back in time here, looking at some of the historical cropland, topsoil moisture conditions and the annual growing season cumulative rainfall over the past three years. So we'll start in 2021, lots of topsoil considered very short, large swaths of the province receiving under 10 inches of precipitation, which is going to be 10 inches is about that canary yellow color. 2022, much of the same, a slight reprieve in the east side of the province, but the west remained dry. And 2023, again, a large area remaining short to very short, and most of the province receiving less than that 10 inches of precipitation, um, except for a few pockets where we'd see more of those, those spotty showers that really might not even register on some of these weather stations. So overlaying those three years of the, the maps, we can see that there's a lot of risk of, uh, of dry area and basically the entire west half of the province. Um, which also leads to risks of herbicide carryover. So these are the maps that the ministry comes out with. Um, this is the 2024 carryover risk maps, and you can see that they've got three different stages of risk. So we've got our pre-seed applications with the map from May 2nd, our early in-crop applications on May 30th, and then our later in-crop applications on June 13th. So uh, depending what and when you sprayed can really have an influence on on the carryover potential in, in these soils. So then looking at the past three years, these were these maps are based on the uh, the later in crop application timing. So um, looking from 2022, 2023 and 2024 risk maps, you can see that 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 west half of the province is quite uh, quite red or uh, brown and if we overlay those maps and and kind of get an idea of where you know where the three years have we've seen potential layering and not breakdown of of uh, herbicides in in a few of those uh, areas um, there's a lot of high risk potential in uh, in that southwest uh, south central corners of the province um, so this is something to be aware of, making sure you're selecting fields with lower risk for pulses because our pulses are sensitive to a lot of uh, carryover chemistries um, and then scouting them as well too. So making sure you're getting out in the field in, uh, in the seedling stages to kind of check and see if there is any, any carryover damage in the field. Now looking at herbicide degradation, so again, this is a largely microbial driven process. Microbes require water, just like any other living organism, um, as part of their, 
you know, cellular reproduction and, and uh, activities, they need moisture to live. So uh, the drier the soil, the less microbial activity you're going to have, the less breakdown. So not all herbicides are, are broken down by, by microbes. You know, we have the potential for, uh, for hydrolysis as well as UV degradation as well, but a good majority of them are going to require microbial breakdown. Um, so in a drought year, you're going to have less microbial breakdown activity and a higher risk of carryover. Some examples of uh, seedling damage from residual herbicides here. So um, you can see there's the metribuzin in the chickpea, which is quite common. We see that uh, usually even on a normal year. Uh, Flumioxazin pinching in, in lentils. So this was a fairly common one this past spring. Parasulfatol in pea. So that's that group 27 carryover. And then clopyrrolid in lentils, which was, uh, that was actually an interesting one because the clopyrrolid containing product was sprayed three years ago. Um, we did see heavy rainfall uh, on June 2nd of last year. Um, that was also the, law, the first rain a lot of these fields that had a residual herbicide applied actually saw. So with that heavy rainfall, you're, you can imagine, you know, a square foot in that field that has a residual herbicide applied on it. When you get that heavier of a rainfall, you see a little bit of overland flooding. That herbicide dissolves into that soil or that uh, rainfall water flows into those uh, those furrows. And then you start to see a little bit of that pinching, which is what we saw with the lentils. Luckily, lentils can regrow from the seed or from the scale nodes. So um, a little bit delayed in maturity, but uh, but those plants still were able to to regrow and survive. So now we'll go into managing pulses after a dry year. Here we can see uh, a field of lentils. So the red line is going to be our seed rows. So if you follow that red line down the field, that's going to be your rows of, of lentils. The blue line, you can see it kind of parallels with some inter interchanging rows of uh, you know yellowing lentils to more green lentils. So that blue line is actually going to be the seeding direction of the previous year's crop that did not use much of any of the nitrogen that was applied due to drought. So um, make staging a bit of a nightmare. Um, you start to go out and look at those fields. You've got uh, hey Trent, <laughs> you've got uh, you've got plants that are are going to be physiologically mature, ready for staging for for a regular application, and then you've got stuff that's still grass green and could be flowering too. So um, try and capture the majority of the field at the best stage possible to get uh, you know your highest yield. So don't uh, don't don't run out there and think that you know that that ten percent that's ready to harvest is going to be the 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 you know the the bin buster there might be that 90 percent that's still green that you really want to try and get a hold of so we're gonna look at some of the uh the research here that's been done and i'll I'll touch on some of the older stuff because chris is going to actually touch on some of the newer stuff and i'll, I'll highlight the project that chris is going to speak on later but um you know dry, drier conditions um you know with, uh, with yields that are lower than expected and a lot of the fertility packages that are going down not being totally utilized by crops, um, we definitely are going to see some excess nitrogen in the system. And it's a, it's a concern for our pulses that we want to want to address. Um, so here we can see that, uh, that this was research done in the late 80s, looking at the impact of background end on lentil grain yield. So seeding lentils into soils testing higher for nitrogen did not negatively impact your yield or maturity of lentils, but it may, uh, we'll discuss this in a bit, lead to reduced nitrogen fixation. Now looking at that, at those end rates on biomass production as well, we can see as you increase your nitrogen, nitrogen rate, you're gonna increase your biomass. So that's pretty um, stereotypical for, for any crop you apply nitrogen to, you increase the nitrogen, you increase your biomass. So this work here was done in 2012. They did uh, a study on eight lentil cultivars evaluated under three nitrogen fertility treatments at three locations. The three nitrogen treatments included 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare as a fertilizer addition, uh, addition of rhizobium inoculant, and then an uninoculated, an uninoculated and unfertilized check. When they averaged out the results, the lentil grain yields and biomass were similar between all three treatments at Indian Head and Goodale. 
at the Skarsgård site, the treatments containing nitrogen fertilizer or inoculant significantly out yielded the untreated check plot for both grain yield as well as biomass. Uh, they also checked the days to maturity and no different between any of the treatments at any of the locations across any of the varieties. So this is the project that Chris is going to be talking on uh, later today. So it's an adopt project we had initiated um, Indian Head, Swift Current and Scott. And basically we were trying to determine uh, a couple market classes. So small red and large greens. Is this increasing nitrogen going to have an effect on our days to maturity, our biomass, our yield, our protein? And is that increasing nitrogen also going to have an effect on whether or not we inoculate that plant as well too? So this is a picture of the plots out at Wheatland this year. I had uh, Amber Wall take this picture for me. I tried flying my drone out there. Wheatland's in the landing zone of the Swift Current Airport and I am not licensed to fly my drone in airspace. So I had Amber do it for me. Um, the red dots are 225 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen with and without inoculant. And the purple dots are zero nitrogen with and without inoculant. So um, again, dry year and swift current, not a ton really in, in difference to visually be seen. Um, and we'll let Chris touch on the, the final results. So that makes you have to st stick around till this afternoon at least. So here we'll shift into answering your questions of can I plant pulses on high end ground and and to start with we'll we'll discuss the uh, the the reduction in nitrogen fixation as we move above 50 pounds per acre. So um, you know chickpeas, lentils, peas, uh, right around that 40 to 60 percent average on fixation. Um, as we move north of 50 pounds, you're going to see that risk of of reduction in nitrogen fixation. So that's when you start to get lazy plants in the field. Nobody wants to give away something to get something in return if they can just grab it for free beside them. So the plants aren't going to want to give photosynthate to the rhizobia for nitrogen. They're just going to take up soil residue in, um, in, in place of that. Now, another thing we need to consider is that our pulses are big nitrogen users. So we often think canola is going to be the one we put the groceries to. It's going to have high nitrogen uptake, but uh, looking at you know lentils, peas, soybeans, and fava beans. Fava beans are are a, are a hog on nitrogen, but even at the lower rate, lentils are pretty comparative with uh, with canola. So um, you know all of our pulses have have an equal or higher demand for nitrogen than uh, than the other other crops we grow, including canola. So to finally wrap up and basically answer your question of can you plant a pulse on high nitrogen ground. Uh, yes, you can, but you have to understand there there will be risks associated with that as well, uh, depending on what, what those residual nitrogen rates are. Um, you might see unacceptable vegetative growth if, uh, if you're getting into those really, really high residual rates. Um, you need to determine if that end level is too high for inoculating, but not high enough for your yield targets. So, uh, you, if you're going to run into an inoculation failure, but you're also going to run into a low yield, that's when you might need to start determining whether or not you're going to supplement with some fertilizer nitrogen in place of inoculating. Variability, depending on environment, is going to be huge. Um, dry year, we've seen the past few dry years, right? Fields getting high fertility packages and not being used. If you're going to plant a, a pulse into that ground and, and fertilize it, that crop's probably not going to use all of that nitrogen in the soil as well. So that'll carry over for the future years as well. Uh, in a normal year, it's going to depend on the nitrate levels in the soil. So you might see some, some thicker vegetative growth. You might see a little bit of risk of lodging, and you're probably going to be wanting to apply fungicide for disease. In a wet year, um, you're, depending on your end levels again, you could see very heavy vegetative growth, high, a lot higher risk of lodging and disease. And depending on how high that nitrogen is, you might see a risk of plants not flowering until way later in the season because those uh, extreme end levels, the plants will use it as a luxury uptake. Um, and then you're going to see with that uh, a delayed maturity. And if you do see a cooler fall, I mean, we see cooler falls will delay maturities in all our crops as well. Uh, the other thing to consider too is planting pulse on pulse ground. So if you do have high nitrogen, there is interest um, of, of producers wanting to plant a pulse on a pulse. Um, 
you know, you run the risk with disease carryover and, and root rots with that as well. So definitely something to consider um, when planning, not just for next year, but for future rotations as well too. So now I'll run through some of the seeding progress we had this year, uh, some of the yield estimates and our interim seed survey results. So our 2023 seed pro seeding progress map. So this was to May 8th. Uh, the Southwest mostly in that uh, that 10 to 20% complete range. Um, and then we, we skip ahead two weeks and the Southwest is into the 70 to 85% range and uh, an area there from Maple Creek to Swift Current falling into that 85 to 100% range. So we saw a 50 to 80% swing in those two weeks in the Southwest. So you guys must have had some uh, some long nights and some <laughs> aggressive seeding conditions to to see that much of a change through uh, through two weeks, but um, yeah, I commend you on that. That's a uh, that's a big swing. So our our pulse acreage that we saw this year, um, we were just over five million acres. This data was taken from StatsCan 2023 was the last time it was updated. So 5.1 uh, million acres of pulses. 62% uh, of our pulses were in lentils. So we had just over 3 million acres in lentils, 31% in peas at uh, about 1.6 million acres. Going through the uh, regional pulse yield estimates. So this was from the Ministry of Agriculture's final crop report. Uh, provincial averages, peas at 34 bushels per acre, lentils at 22 bushels per acre, chickpeas 16 and soybeans 31. Southwest, we saw pea yields 56% below the provincial average, uh, lentil yields 41% below, and then the chickpeas came in right around the average. Uh, West Central saw pea yields 18% below the average, and then lentils and soybeans came in right around average. So now looking at our provincial estimated crop yields, the light green bar is going to be our 2022 provincial average, dark green is 2023. And then the trailing line, or the line is the trailing 10-year provincial average. The percentages are, are going to be your, uh, your provincial average change from 2022 to 2023. So for lentils, we saw an increase of 2.6 bushels per acre from 22 to 23, but still 0.7 bushels per acre shy of our 10-year average. Uh, peas stayed flat and were a bushel and a half under the 10-year average and chickpeas decreased by 1.9 bushels per acre, moving them 9.4 bushels under their 10-year average. Of all our crops uh, grown, mustard gained the most over the last year at a 15% increase or 2.7 bushels per acre. It's also the only crop that's above its 10-year average uh, by a value of 2.1 bushels. Lentils came in second at 12% increase to 22 bushels per acre. And the worst decrease we saw was in oats decreasing by 33% or 23 bushels to 70 uh, and followed by flax at a 26% decrease or five bushels to nine, five bushels per acre to 19 bushels per acre average in 2023. So now that we've got the harvest numbers, we can we can take a look and uh, and consider the quality of the grain that was harvested and how it's uh, quality is going to be impacted as we use it for seed for, for this year. So our interim seed test results are showing good quality across the board on most diseases, although we do have uh, less pathogen-free seed in uh, in the peas in relation to Ascochyta. Um, one thing I would bring attention to there, and you can see in the red circle, that's our mean infection level on chickpeas with Ascochyta. So that came back at 0.325%. Uh, our recommendation is to be below 0.3%, and for SCIC coverage, the seed has to come back with a test below 0.3%. Um, you know, al although we are just above that 0.3% threshold, we are way lower than our, our eight-year average of 2.5%. So again, all things considered, uh, really good for, for uh, seedborne disease. Now looking into the germination increases. So we saw increases in all our crops in, in germination. So lentils, we increased by half a percent. Uh, peas, we increased by 2% and chickpeas, we increased by 5.7%. Uh, total samples tested in the chickpeas were 55. Lentils, we tested 347 and peas were 268. So uh, pretty good representation of, of the crops. 
Now looking into the uh, seedborne Ascochyta, you can see the light green is our average Ascochyta free seed over the last eight years compared to dark green, which is the previous year. Our mean infection level over the last eight years is the triangle and then 2023 mean infection is the circle. The amount of pathogen free seed we did see in the lentils was 2% uh, below the eight year average, but um, mean infections coming in 0.3% lower than average. In the peas, we have 11% more pathogen free seed uh, and 1.6% lower mean infection. So that's really good. And in the chickpeas, we have 25% more pathogen free seed and 2.2% lower mean infection. So that's excellent. Um, so an overall takeaway from this year, we have really good seed lots that were tested. We have more pathogen free seed on average, except in the lentils where it's just pretty, pretty close to average. Um, and the stuff that did have any disease infection on it, uh, the mean the mean infection levels were were really low. So I'll just quickly touch on the the threshold for seedborne Ascochyta in chickpeas. There, um, as you can see that picture, it was 0.3 percent Ascochyta, 84 percent germ, and uh, and and it doesn't take much for those chickpeas to rot out. Um, you know, we do see. One seed, one infected seed per 400 tested is that 0.3%. So depending on your sample size and how many tests they run, um, you could risk underrepresentation of those seed lots. And a demonstration done um, at the Wheatland Conservation Area. You can see a picture there from Amber Wall on the chickpea seed treatment demo. We did uh, fungicidal seed treatment, untreated checks, and just bare biologicals. Um, Basically, the, the results from that say that you, you should really be looking at using a fungicide seed treatment um, as well with crop insurance requirements. They require that a seed treatment be applied that at least has activity on Pythium. So we'll run now into some of the survey results and any of the in-season findings here. So just a quick overview of the uh, interpretation of these pulse pest surveys. Um, incidents, you can basically just take away incidents is how many plants in the field had disease. Prevalence is how many fields in the survey had disease. So looking at our prevalence in lentil crops, this shows how many fields showed disease in the survey. Uh, the first number in the column or in the tables are going to be your percent of fields showing disease. And then in the brackets behind is the number of fields that showed symptoms. So we had root rot and anthracnosis are most commonly found diseases in the survey showing up in 74% of the fields. 100% of the fields we can see there uh, surveyed in the west central and the northwest had root rot and 100% surveyed in the east central and northwest had anthracnose. Symphilium is also one to keep an eye on there. So we are seeing, uh, seeing it being picked up in the surveys, um, starting to be found more often in, uh, in the surveys as we go through. Now moving into the incidence. So this shows the percent of plants. So I basically, I just took, because each field that gets surveyed, surveys 100 plants. I just took the, the number of fields surveyed, multiplied by 100, and you can see how many, how many plants were surveyed in each of those areas. Um, the uh, the the first number is going to be the percent of all fields surveyed. Um, the number in the brackets is the percent of plants that showed symptoms of disease. But any fields that had zero disease were removed from the uh, from the calculation. Anything with the same number in brackets with the number in front also means that that field survey every field surveyed had the disease present. So those are going to be the ones that showed 100% of the fields um, from the previous slide. So we uh, we saw a high increase or a high incidence of uh, root rot in the west central and the northwest. Over 70% of the plants showing symptoms and 65% of the plants in the northwest having signs of anthracnose. Overall, 35% of the lentil plants surveyed had signs of root rot. If we take out the completely healthy fields, that jumps up to 48%. Now we'll move into the pea crops. So this is showing how many fields are diseased. Um, again, percent of fields in the front, number of fields in the brackets. We do see a high percent of fields showing signs of root rot and microsphorella, which is not surprising in peas. 100% of the fields in the southeast, west, central, and northwest had signs of root rot. 
100% in the fields in the southeast, east central, northeast and northwest had Microsphorella. So um, a lot of uh, a lot of fields showing showing um, disease in those those areas. One interesting finding we do have too is 88% percent or 88% prevalence of bacterial blight in the southeast. But um, on the report that the ministry put out, this they said that this may have been influenced by crop damage due to adverse weather conditions. So now we'll go into the uh, the incidence and severity. So we can see the percent incidence, how many per plants surveyed, uh, and and showing disease symptoms and severity of root rots of Microsphorella and uh, root rots of Microsphorella. Sorry. Um, severity rankings are going to go from one to seven. So one, you're going to have no disease. Seven, your plant's basically completely dead. 62% uh, of the peas that were looked at had root rot. Highest amount in the southeast, 82%, and the northwest at 79%. Severity was the worst in the northwest at 3.4. 55% showed signs of Microsphorella in the survey. 75% having symptoms in the northwest, and 68% in the east central. Severity was the worst again in the Northwest at 2.4. So now we'll run into the uh, the pea leaf weevil survey. Um, we did see high numbers of feeding notches in the in the north and the east. Um, those notches are going to basically indicate your adult population. So the adults you can see in that picture at the bottom, they feed on the edges of your uh, your leaves and create those. Um, Half moon, uh, half moon notching. So the adults don't usually, I say usually, cause economic damage. But um, if you have a high enough population, they work like any other defoliator. They're going to take away your uh, sources of, well, basically your plant solar panels by getting rid of what conducts photosynthesis. Um, the larvae of these these insects are what really concern us. So they feed on on uh, on pea and faba bean nodules which can lead to nodulation failure and nitrogen deficiency. So if you do have a high enough, uh, high enough presence of pea leaf weevil in the field and they eat all your nodules, you're looking at a top dress application to save yield. Uh, there's also nothing you can do in the current year. So um, I don't know if that pushes you off from scouting because you don't want to look at what you can't control. <laughs> but um, it's good to know at least because then you can go and implement, uh, implement an insecticidal seed treatment. Luckily, you can see the whole southwest is relative is green there. But um, you know, I I wouldn't say don't think about them. Just be cognizant that uh, they are spreading. You know, the map's starting to show more and more where they're moving within the province. Um, scouting on this, you're going to be going out three to six node stage, so late May, early July, early June. Now we'll move into the Ligus. Um, the report from the ministry said there there was uh, it was found in many fields throughout the province, particularly late in season, but no significant damage was was reported. Um, the Prager Lab at the U of S did conduct conduct a survey on the species, so they found that uh, Linealaris was prominent in the north, uh, Elisis and Borealis around Saskatoon, and then Keltoni prominent further south. So uh, Ligus can host on over 385 different plant species. Um, Linealaris is also our, our most popular one in, in our fava beans due to being the northern species. Uh, Borealises are going to be an, an alfalfa loving one. So if you do see a, an alfalfa cut, um, they can move into the neighboring crops as, uh, as that alfalfa gets cut. So something to keep an eye on. And they cause chalk spot in, in peas and lentils. And the threshold is actually quite low. So um, 10 per 25 sweeps or uh, basically half per one sweep, and if you're catching half per one sweep, maybe don't sweep so hard. Now we'll move into the grasshoppers, and I think that's uh, probably going to be a popular topic uh, for down here. I think it's a popular topic for the rest of the province in Western Canada as well, too. So grasshoppers, they're ectotherms. They're basically cold-blooded. They need heat, more heat, more eat. Uh, you can see there the temperature for uh, for the end of May and we had May and June with uh, above average temperatures. Um, if you follow the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network, Megan Van Kosky does updates on the instar levels for grasshoppers. And we were about 10 to 14 days earlier than normal this year. 
just because of, uh, of the temperature we saw in the spring. So our pest species that we deal with, um, our, our four main ones would be the migratory, the two stripe, the clear wing, and the packards. Packards is a pulse lover. So if you're seeing a, an infestation in your lentils or your peas, it's probably a good chance that it would be a, a packards grasshopper. Um, James Tanzi is the provincial entomologist. He'll always say pests, wings in the spring, not a pest. Um, this past year, that might have been a bit of a stretch just by how fast they were moving through instars. We had some fields where they were, uh, you know, we were technically still in spring and they had wings. So um, definitely something to, uh, you know, to keep in mind. Um, the migratory grasshopper, so lives up to its name. Uh, the nymphs can walk up to 160 meters in an hour and the adults can fly 16 to 19 kilometers, swarms traveling up to 100 kilometers in a day. So, um, you know, they're, they're what we would consider probably that, uh, um, you know, the locust um, swarms. So going into the grasshopper survey, um, the forecast, so this was counts done in 2022 uh, for, for forecasting for 2023 by uh, crop insurance staff. Now it's been changed, it looks like, to a, uh, a 2023 survey in season versus forecasting. So anything we'd see that is, uh, is, is in that dark green, the yellow, uh, the brown or the red is going to be a risk, economic risk to lentils. So after much discussion with um, you know producers and agronomists this year, I I kind of re-highlighted the map on what we thought probably it should have looked like. Um, I haven't heard any any complaints or naysayers yet, so I'm just going to stick with this one. Um, this uh, this is actually just south of Elrose on yeah. Highway 4. Um, I, I was coming up after doing a, a check on a lentil field and uh, and thought it looked somebody hit a coyote, hit a deer, kind of got that those tracks in the in the road that uh, you'd expect with some roadkill. So I kept driving and I thought this is going on for a long time and I don't see any carcass. So I pulled over, which also learned that. Uh, your ABS kicks on when you drive on grasshopper guts um, and took, a, they took this picture. So this was grasshoppers. That's grasshopper roadkill. So it is yeah, very slick and it took a, I couldn't imagine how many grasshoppers it would have taken to, uh, to coat the road like that. But um, yeah, it was absolutely mind boggling to, to see that. So now we'll go from one favorite topic to the next favorite topic in the southwest here, uh, kosha. And we'll, we'll watch a quick video for, for the first bit here. This was taken in, uh, in Montana last summer. I don't know if anybody else had this situation these past few years on farm, but yeah, quite an... Uh, an interesting video to come across. Um, you know, kosher plants can unencumbered if there's no competition. A big Christmas tree kosher plant's going to put out about 100,000 uh, seeds there. So the ones we'll see in the field a little bit less due to competition, probably about 20 to 30,000 seeds. So we'll go into some of our top tips for control. I mean, I'm I'm kind of probably beating a dead horse here. You've probably heard this multiple times, multiple presentations from agronomists and uh, industry reps, but um, you know they have to be smaller than five centimeters, and they grow quite quickly. So making sure you're getting good coverage as well too for water. They've got those fine hairs on the leaves, so if you have to use maybe a surfactant um, to try and get that uh, chemistry down onto the actual leaf tissue, something to consider as well um environment so apply when they're actively growing but don't apply when they're actively out of stage uh consider herbicide resistance so using the right mode of action we'll talk about that multiple layers and out competing so um we've got some we can touch on that a bit too and in increasing you know seeding rates and competing with kosha to uh to basically give you the best best option so i talk about control um and actually, I took this definition from Health Canada. So if uh, you know a company registers a product, they have to send in all their package and information to Health Canada, and you're going to have uh, suppression, 60 to 79% range. 
if it's control on label, it's 80% plus. So uh, I, I, I bring this up to, you know, temper your expectations. You're probably going to have escapes. You're probably not going to get 100% control with with uh, chemistries, just, just the way it is. So our options here in our pulse crops, uh, green is our pre-seed options. Tan has pre-seed and pre-harvest, and then the the pink color is our our in-crop options. So, um, you know, we we don't have a ton. Um, if you look in the guide to crop protection at the beginning, pulses hmm, page half a page, wheat two and a half pages. So link tells you who the favorite is for these chem companies. Just just saying, guys. Some more options for lentils, please. So we don't have a lot, but we do have options. Three, four, five, six, nine, 14, and 15. We've got fall and spring, pre-seed, pre-emerge. We've got in-crops. We've got pre-harvest. Except Charles Gettys found group 14 resistant kosha. So uh, yeah, that's a an, another curveball that we get to deal with. Uh, the 14 resistance first ID'd in 2021 in Saskatchewan and then multiple sites in North Dakota in 2022. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing that we were first on this. If you look at all the other herbicide resistant weeds, the states found them first and then we kind of tagged along. Um, we're the leader on this one. So that's either telling us we're doing a really good job scouting or something else. But I mean, it's good that we found it before it got too out of control. Um, found in a mustard field that had uh, had noticed reduced control from authority. Uh, Charles has done some preliminary cross-resistant experiments. So he's done some foliar work on saflofenacil, carfentrazone, tiofenacil, pyroflufen, and asiflorofen. He's also done work on the soil residuals with flumioxazin and sulfentrazone. And so far he's seen that on those populations, asiflorofen's um, the only one that's still showing activity on the kochia there. So asiflorofen, uh, is uh, in Hurricane or Ultra Blazer. So those are soybean products. But if you actually look at the label on them, they don't have kosher on label. So um, keep that in mind. So now I'm just going to touch on a couple of the, the uh, resistant weed survey work that has been done recently. So 2013, Hugh Becky, 17 glyphosate resistant populations at 342 sites and nine RMs. 2019, Sean Sharp, glyphosate resistant kosher in 137 RMs compared to nine in 2013. And then Charles Getty's most recent work in Alberta showing glyphosate at 78% of the sites. Fluoroxapir resistant kosher at 44%, dicamba at 28%, and a 249 at 45% of the sites. So it's uh, it's been spreading and increasing. So taking all of that we, that we just talked about into consideration, on fours, nines, and fourteens, um, this is what we're left with as a for sure on kosher. But this is also a doomsday scenario where you've got two, four, nine, and fourteen resistant kosher in your field, and I really hope you don't have two, four, nine, fourteen kosher in your field. Uh, the red lines are going to be our loss of group four uh, glyphosate or the group fourteen residual. Our dashed yellows are where we basically still have one active with some residual, so a five or a fourteen. Um, and, and Charles work there on the 14s was, was both foliar and soil. So we can see basically that, uh, that the pre harvests are, are pretty much gone. If you've got the, the 14 or the nine, um, although you can probably, the only thing that's going to take care of kosher as a pre harvest is a flamethrower. So, so now we'll move on to managing kosher in our pulse crops. So, um, we have the residuals. We've got a couple in crops. Uh, weed wiping is, um, you know, an, an option, although it's, it might be, um, you know, a little time consuming. Electric weeding, I thought that was an interesting one to put in there. There was some work done in the in uh, soybean fields in the east that showed good promise with that. I say it's chemical, like if you think of how, like a battery works, kind of a chemical reaction. So it's like, okay, I'll throw it in chemical, I guess. Um, and then enlist E3 the soybeans. So they've got the 240 glyphosate and glufosinate stack. Moving into some of the cultural methods. So mowing and swathing, that's been a, quite a popular one um, recently. Increasing your seeding weights, rates. So understand your thousand kernel rate, thousand kernel weight. I've got both those messed up. Um, and, and you can increase, so I'll show on the next slide what we've got some examples on the increased seeding rates, but uh, narrow row spacing, early seeding, managing your saline areas. So if you're, uh, if you're seeding through the field 
and you've got a saline spot, it's never really productive and you just run the drill through it. Um, all you're kind of doing is fertilizing kosher and barley for a, or foxtail barley for a fantastic crop to come out of there and creep into the field. So um, maybe putting in a perennial forage in those areas that, uh, that aren't being productive to kind of push down that weed seed bank. Uh, mechanical, so there are some options there with mechanical, whether or not they're feasible on a field scale. Um, these might be more targeted areas. Um, VR and mapping, so whether you can do uh, targeted, uh, you know, increased herbicide rates in, in certain areas. Um, Steve Shirtliff's doing some work on mapping kosher currently as well too at the U of S. And then character building. So I put that one in there as a, uh, you got a summer student that's not very busy. You got a kid that spends too much time on their phone. I'm not saying go and hand rogue your entire section, but if you've got those patches that are are escaping and, and you're worried, okay, maybe that's actually a risk, go pull a plant. That's, uh, uh, you know, they're not, they're not resistant to your hands. Um, so this is the, the, the increasing seeding rate that I had touched on earlier. So more crop means less room for kochia. You can see 60 pounds of uh, seed in the lentils on the left, 120 pounds on the right. So bumping up your seeding rate, um, you know, pros and cons, you're going to increase your, your uh, canopy, you're going to increase potentially your um, risk for disease, but uh, you can decrease the amount of, of weeds that are going to be competing with your crop. And then Steve Shirtliff took this picture, so he's uh, found this on Twitter, some pictures. He's excited to see people mowing those kosher patches down. Um, Charles had uh, had presented and talked about some of the uh, the maturity on kosher and how fast it it can mature. Um, so making sure you're you're mowing earlier in the season rather than waiting for mowing it after harvest is complete, because most of those plants would have uh, have matured seeds already. So. You want to try and cut that plant down before it starts to to put uh, mature seeds out. So just as a you know a two step method for controlling kochia, it's really simple, guys. You just have to control your young seedlings and then eliminate your seed production. So it's really nothing. But um, yeah, those are some options you can you can utilize for it. Uh, you know whether or not you you take take my advice. I'm. I won't have hurt feelings. I mean, there's there's some stuff in there that probably just doesn't make sense for some producers, but um, you know, we're giving you the options here. Okay, so now we'll move on to some of the fun stuff. So this is our profit pulse replicated on farm independent trials. Uh, these are uh, the trials that we conducted this year um, with uh, uh, producers and agronomists. So we had 20 field scaled sites established. Um, we had 17 lentil seeding rate trials, so those were actually coordinated by Christian Catelier at uh, the Indian Head Agrarm Station. Um, we had one dry bean plant population, one dry bean nitrogen fixing foliar biological, and a faba bean fungicide efficacy. So I'll just quickly touch on our weather, weather data for our dry bean trial. Um, we had the foliar biological on the north half of the quarter. And our plant population on the south half, uh, we had about five inches of rain during the growing season, but we were able to apply nine inches of additional pivot water. The weather station was from uh, Lucky Lake, so it was 23 kilometers away. So the end fixing foliar biological trial, we used uh, Invita from Syngenta. Um, here you can see the yields from each of the replicates as well as the average. Uh, we designed this trial in a randomized strip trial, triple replicated, or treated average yield 45.7 bushels per acre, untreated 45.3, uh, a p-value of 0.32, so we did not see any statistically significant results from this trial. Now moving into our dry bean plant population trial, so five counts, uh, I conducted five counts per treatment along a three-foot section of row uh, did three counts during the season on June 15th, July 5th, and August 28th at the V1, which is first trifoliate, V6, uh, six trifoliate, and R9 physiological maturity. And then did the final plant height and pod clearance on September 5th, which was the day before harvest. Our average plant stand density was a little below our targets, so we came in at 80,000, 105,000, and 131,000, which you can see on the, on the graph on the left. 
the the line with the stars in it it was our target population so as we as we increased our target density our gap to the actual and the and the target did widen a little bit um, but we did uh, we did at least have significant differences between all the treatments at a p value of point less than 0 0.001 so um, basically we wanted to make sure that as we you know, move through, move forward, and interpret this data that we had a significant difference between our populations, and we did. Uh, looking at the yield, we didn't see any differences in yield. The low treatment had a bit more variability compared to the medium and the high. The high yielded one bushel per acre more than the low, but again, not statistically significant. Now, looking at the plant height and the pod clearance, we can see the higher populations. We had about a one centimeter increase in plant height and tighter air bars. So we were consistently finding more plants at that height in the highest population compared to the other two. We saw a little bit more variability in height there. Um, we did not see any uh, any difference in the pod clearance. Stayed consistent across treatments, ranging from 3.7 to 3.9 centimeters. So running the economics on it. Um, using the numbers from the ministry's crop planning guide, we didn't see an economic benefit to increasing the plant populations under the scenarios we tested. Uh, if it was bin run seed, the numbers start to pencil out a bit better. So the higher seeding rate would come in at a, about a 15 bushel or $15 per acre profit versus um, the, the price we used for, for um, seed, certified seed. Uh, overall, we didn't see... Uh, no statistically significant difference on yield, pod height, um, or pod clearance, plant height, and our most economical treatment would have been seeding at 90,000 plants per acre. Now into our fabamine fungicide efficacy trial. So we applied fungicides at uh, five flowers open on the main stem across the field. No statistical difference on the, the yield plant stage or visual infection point as a result of fungicide treatment. Uh, Stemphilium and Botrytis cinera were confirmed on the disease plant samples to, collected during the efficacy check and in figure 1.1, 1 .1, uh, all fungicide products controlled Stemphilium blight except Zolera. Uh, Alternary and Ascochyta were detected in all samples, but none of the fungicides tested had activity on those pathogens. Uh, Sclerotinia and Botrytis fabe were not detected in any samples collected. Mike, you've got a couple minutes remaining. Oh. Sorry, I'll motor through. Okay, Fabbean, we didn't see any results. There you go. <laughs> Figure 1.2, Revipro is the only product without efficacy on Botrytis. I want to get to the lentil seeding rate. It's the good one. Uh, so we had seed, three seeding rate targets, 12, 18, and 24 plants per square foot. Um, our plant density consistently increased as we increased seeding rate. So again, we wanted to see that being a for sure before we start interpreting the data. So moving on to seedling mortality, statistically significant increase in seedling mortality as we increased with seeding rate. In the yield, statistically significant decrease in yield as we increased our seeding rate. Protein, no effect on increasing seeding rate. Seed size, no effect on increasing seeding rate. So our overall takeaway was Increase increasing the seeding rates, increased your plant density, increased the seedling mortality, decreased the yield, no effect on protein, no effect on seed size. So we're also going to continue this trial again this year. Um, a lot of the sites we saw were were really, really dry. So um, I'd be interested to see if we get a more normal year this year and, and if we can compare the results from last year to, to what we see this year. Yeah, that's, this is my last slide, Amanda. Final reminders, test your seed. We've got really good seed lots out there. Just want to confirm that the one you're going to use has uh, has low, low disease. Um, plan your rotation carefully. So remember herbicide carryover. Um, try not to plant a pulse on a pulse. Um, check your weather records. So that's that'll really help as well too with that herbicide carryover. Familiarize yourself with labels. There may be uh, some label additions. There are also some new products out there that are registered on, on our pulses. Let's go regularly. I'm looking at you agronomists. Keep pest thresholds in mind. Uh, early pest removal is the best. Understand your mode of action of the products and then be aware of resistance. So with that, best of luck. May all your pulse crops be happy and healthy. Hope we get some rain. Be nice. Do I go to the...
Do you want me to go to the Q&A slide? Yeah, go ahead. OK. Oh, no questions. Perfect. Hmm. Do I have to stay up here, too? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm not answering questions. Any questions for Mike? Sorry, can I get you just to step to the mic so that everyone online can hear your question? We're putting you on the spot. <laughs> Two questions. Was the seating rate trial reds or greens? Uh, um, we, sorry, I'll, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, there were red, there were reds and greens and one French green. Okay. Second question. If yield decreases, mortality increases, et cetera, with a higher seating rate, but kosha decreases, what's the optimum balance? That's an excellent question. Uh, how big of a headache does kosha cause too, right? So, um, you know, y yield decreased, I should, say that can i go backwards no i can't oh yes i can ha yield okay so yield decreased um but you can see it's you know point point zero one three so it's not well like three asterisks would be extremely significant this isn't this is statistically significant but it's not a huge nose dive on your yield um yeah, and this is one year on a dry year. Uh, you know, if we get a wet year, I'd be really interested to see, and hopefully yield would increase because some of the old research has shown that maximum yields at 22 plants per square foot at some of the agri-arm sites. So um, I'd probably take a little bit of a hit here just with how much of a nightmare kosher is in, in lentils. But... Um, yeah, I guess that's another thing we didn't actually really interpret there was how weed free these fields were as we increase the seeding rates. So good point. Can't see. Did we do anything in a fandomizes your piece? Well, we funded a huge project this year on Fanomyces and the Strategic Research Initiative through the ministry. Um, as far as like field scale work, I didn't do anything. I had I had some interest to line up a couple stuff for field scale work, but they kind of fell through. Um, I'd be interested in continuing that. We do have some work in the ARD side of things, so that's our small plot research working on stuff. Um, and I'm sure Sham is probably going to talk about it later. So, nitrogen position efficiency in end field trials. Didn't plan on it, but I can chat with. Uh, so, Christiane Catelia kind of, we we have her organize the trials, so I can chat with her for this coming year on on measuring the acquisition efficiency on it and see. It's a good question. You got any questions? Uh, <laughs> don't come. <laughs> no, I don't have any questions, but I got I to gotta put in a plug for Mike's two-step program. Uh, we've had really good luck with mowing on our farm with uh, especially kind of the nursery areas, like the field perimeters and around power poles and whatnot like that. If mowed early enough, it seems like it really reduces the kosher the next year. So I just, just a plug for Mike's two-step program. So if there's no other questions, thank you very much, Mike. Um, next, we're going to move on. We have a presentation for you on the new pulse breeding landscape presented by SPG's Executive Director, Carl Potts. Uh, he'll also be joined by Mike Brown, um, SPG's Agronomy Manager, who's going to showcase some new pulse varieties for you. Off to you, Carl. Thanks, Sean, and good morning, everybody. Great to see good attendance in uh, Swift Current as uh, as we've had for for many years. So glad to be back uh, with a with a full room here today. So I'm just going to take a few minutes this morning to talk about our new uh, approach for pulse breeding, why we're excited about it, and some of the the new directions uh, that we're going. SPG has been talking about our new vision uh, and direction for more than two years now, including at annual general meetings, winter grower, uh, grower meetings such as this one over previous years, along with numerous podcasts, media interviews, videos, and tools to get information out to, uh, out to growers. 
You may have seen some news articles, interviews over the past few weeks on this topic, so it's a good chance for us to uh, to talk about this out at, uh, at grower meetings here over the next number of weeks, including this first one we're kicking off here in Swift Current this week. So I'm happy to take any questions at the uh, at the end. But first, a, a little bit of history. Farmers often ask us why why are things changing. And so to give a bit, bit of history on this one, SPG and the Crop Development Centre at the University of Saskatchewan had a long-term breeding agreement that ran from 2005 to 2020. And under that agreement, SPG provided most of the operational funding for the breeding program, about $5 million per year in the final years of that agreement. And as part of that agreement, SPG received the commercial commercialization rights for the CDC pulse varieties that were coming out of that program. And SPG commercialized those, those varieties royalty-free to Saskatchewan farmers. But back in 2018, CDC informed us that they didn't wish to continue with that same previous funding model and instead wanted to move to a model with multiple funders and to generate revenues from the commercialization of pulse varieties through royalties. SPG was interested in continuing that previous breeding model, but when it became clear to us that that wasn't an option, we took a hard look at SPG's role in future funding for breeding and came up with a new vision, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute. And also in the interim, SPG provided co-funding to the CDC breeding projects to help ensure funding for those programs were still in place while any new agreements were being developed. A lot has changed since the early 2000s when the previous agreement on pulse breeding was put into place. There's increased competition from other crops such as wheat and canola and pulses really need to remain profitable for Saskatchewan uh, growers. We know the importance of pulses in rotations uh, to help ensure other crops are sustainable as well. So that's really important. But there's also increased competition from other exporters. Australia is a stiff uh, competitor in red lentils into South Asia and into other markets as well. Russia is increasing its footprint and market share into our largest market for peas, which is China. And genetic gains are getting harder to achieve as well. Farmers face more complex problems, including with root disease and weed management impulses. And Mike talked a bit about that this morning, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later today as well. The most commonly grown yellow pea and red lentil varieties are CDC Meadow and CDC Maxim, which uh, were released more than 15 years ago. So we need faster rates of genetic gain in, in varieties. And for the future, we need more investment in pulse breeding, more breeders, bringing varieties to market, and more competition for the benefit of farmers. And finally, we think that this needs producer investment, as there's a long lead time between new breeding crosses that are made by breeding programs to seed commercialization. Also, pulses are small acreage crops in Canada, relatively, as well as globally. So the business case for new investment uh, in, in pulse breeding is relatively low, at least compared to other uh, globally uh, major crops, which we think uh, grower investment can, can help on that. So what's SPG's vision of, uh, of pulse breeding for the future? SPG wants growers to have access to the best possible genetics for continued competitiveness in the future. Our new breeding vision is to work with multiple breeding programs, both public and private breeders, as well as with seed commercialization companies to deliver high value um, and high performing varieties for the future. And to do this, we'll need to attract additional investment and capacity into pulse breeding for the benefit of producers. And when our board was, was uh, really seeking through a new, uh, new, new partnership, they established two key principles uh, in order for SPG to make new investments in breeding. The first one being an investor mindset. So if SPG is going to invest grower levy dollars up front, and if growers are go going to pay royalties when using those new varieties, then a portion of the royalties uh, th that are generated would need to flow back to SPG for reinvestment back into research and market development and other areas that are benefiting growers. The second principle the board established was value sharing. So wanting to avoid a situation where most or all of the incremental value of a new variety is captured in the cost of the seed. And we ensure this by uh, ensuring that we have a seat at the table when commercialization decisions are made. So those are two really important principles that the board established that really help us guide any new investments that we make into, into breeding. The first new partnership that SPG launched under this new model was with Lima Grain in the summer of 2022. And this represents an 
a new and additional investment, an additional breeding program for pea and lentil being added right here in Saskatchewan. So as I mentioned, the focus is on pea and lentil, both SPG and lima grain contribute funding and germplasm to that collaboration. The breeding work is focused on the highest priorities for growers, including yield, root disease resistance, herbicide tolerance, and with speed and commercial focus. New varieties from this partnership will be commercialized with royalties when varieties are uh, when the varieties are grown, including on farm save seed. So we're, we're excited about this new partnership, and Lima Grain is on the agenda. I think just after uh, this particular session to talk about the focus of their program going going forward. But it's not only Lima Grain uh, partnership that's under this new model. SPG also expects to have breeding collaborations with several several breeding organizations across multiple crops, including one we're working on right now with the CDC. We expect that there'll be additional opportunities for other crops such as lentil, faba bean as well. So what does this all mean for, for growers? We're excited about the future for pulses, but understand that growers might have questions about this new direction. And this is why we're taking every opportunity that we can to talk to growers about this new approach and answer the questions as best as we can. So what does it mean for growers? Existing varieties will remain royalty free. Those CDC varieties that you're currently growing will remain royalty free. And we think this is a really important competitive check as new varieties come out. Those new varieties that will be released under different commercialization models will need to be significantly better in order for growers to, to adopt them. So that's a really key principle. Existing varieties will remain royalty free. New varieties will be commercialized in a different way. These will be through seed companies and will be royalty bearing on all acres, including farm save seed, not just certified seed. We know that moving to royalties on farm save seed is uh, is new for growers, but is is a really important uh, element to creating a new environment to have sustainable revenue for public and private breeding programs in the future. Just to give you an example, for some of the wheat, barley, pea varieties that are out and available with, with variety use agreements in place, those are about $2 an acre or so, I think, on uh, some of those varieties for those crops that have been, been released already. But at the end of the day, it really is about growers' choice, and growers will have the choice to continue to grow those existing royalty-free varieties or choose to grow the new ones if it makes economic sense to do so on their farms. The intended results really are more breeding programs, more investment, larger and faster genetic gain, and major improvements on some of those key issues such as root disease and, and herbicide tolerance as well. So we're excited about that new approach for the future. Um, I would pause there and just see if there's any uh, questions on that element before I turn it back uh, over to Mike to talk a little bit about some of the, the new varieties uh, that uh, that are available. Question at the annual general meeting too, and I'm not opposed to this. I just really want to understand um, as we saw in the last presenter, if we have to pay for seed every year, it turns us from profitable to non-profitable. So the UAs are big, big concern for me. If the UAs are our only choice moving forward, as they are now in the canola model, here in the Southwest, we don't make money on canola, not even most years. So how is the board making sure that this start towards us. I fully understand royalties. We need to find a way to move forward on this. But royalty bearing, how is there is there a cap on that? So it's it is two, three dollars an acre, or is it gonna get to be like canola where it's extraordinary or VUAs where we're buying our seed every year? What is the board's weight at the table that to make sure these things don't happen? And what is your plan to not move us towards that canola model? Because hearing these things is kind of, in my opinion, the start of that, and I'm I'm worried. Yeah, those are good questions, and I know that there are questions and topics that our board talked quite a bit about around uh, around our table. So there's there's a few things there that uh, that we think are competitive that will help keep 
those uh, those costs in check. First of all, as I mentioned before, there'll be uh, existing royalty-free varieties that will continue to be available. So before farmers pay for new seed or sign a you know variety use agreement, they have to be you'll have to be convinced that those varieties are substantially better than the existing ones. So that'll help uh, place uh, you know some limit on you know on on the price and the cost of the seed. The other thing is that through you know our Lemagram partnership as well as new ones that we launch with CDC and others, there'll be multiple seed commercialization companies that are involved in commercializing those those varieties. So um, there won't be a, you know, a monopoly on any one, uh, one company, which will also add competition there as well. Uh, and the other thing I think that was added at our annual general meeting is that we, we have a seat at the table when commercialization decisions are being made. And I think at least the partners that we're working with right now know that uh, that farmers you know need to be profitable as well. So in terms of long term, where costs uh, you know go, but you know we don't know. But you know, in talking with growers at various meetings all over the place, there's there's many that have said to us if if we can have, better resistance for root disease and aphanomyces, you know, willing to certainly willing to pay more and pay something for those uh, those new varieties as well. That applies for uh, herbicide tolerance in you know in lentils to have additional herbicide tolerances. So so big jumps in yield, herbicide tolerance, um, root disease resistance, things that add more value to to farms will be ones that uh, you know that growers will at least have the choice to be able to pay for in the future. Any other uh, any other questions on on this topic? You've got a question on Slido. Okay. Question is: What is the total breeding budget collected by SPG? What's the expected increase in funding from royalties? So. Uh, <laughs> This is is a good question, and it depends on a lot of assumptions, uh, and and it's a long lead time. So, the amount of time from investing in, in new breeding to commercialization, which I think you know, Lorena might uh, talk about a little bit later, you know, is something like seven, eight, nine, you know, up to ten years. So it'll be quite a quite a while before we would expect to be uh, receiving any significant amount of uh, of revenue from. Uh, from commercialization or arrangements, you know, down the road. So it's hard to say what uh, what those will be, but we're not expecting them to be uh, to be all that significant for for quite some time. We put about sixty percent of our total uh, SPG expenditure budget into uh, research and development, and um, and uh, over time, uh, you know, a portion of that will be in in uh, in breeding. That's a relatively small amount now. Um, I would expect that would be um, maybe about 25% of our total um, uh, total R and D uh, budget uh, in the next uh, next number of years. Next question: SP, Will SPG be removing non-refundable status of uh, checkoff uh, because we're ending royalty-free uh, royalty-free seed program? So at the present time, we don't have any uh, plans to change that. We did have a resolution at our annual general meeting a number of years ago to examine a non-refundable, uh, you know, moving to a refundable uh, uh, status. We surveyed growers, and at the time, the majority of uh, producers preferred to uh, to keep with a uh, uh, a, a non-refundable um, uh, uh, non-refundable levy so so yeah that's uh, that's the the plans for uh, you know for now um, in terms of where that uh, where that ends up going in the future there's still a lot of important research that we need uh, we need to fund and like I said before I think it'll be quite a long time before we're, we're generating uh, any sign significant amount of uh, of royalties from uh, from seed commercialization. Okay, anything else on that? If not, I will turn it over uh, over to Mike. <laughs> I'm back. Can't get rid of me that fast.
Okay, so now we'll talk about some of the pulse varieties. Um, so where you can get your information on varieties. So our, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the SAS seed guide. They've also have the uh, uh, seedlocator.net on their website um, and their interactive seed guide as well too. So you can go through there and, and find information on varieties. However, we have also created a regional variety trial portal on SPG's website. So if you scroll to the bottom of our, uh, our website page, we'll have uh, a link there to the portal. Um, it allows you to select varieties, years and locations and do comparisons. So we'll go through some of the uh, example comparisons that we've uh, clipped out from, from the trials uh, around, uh, around Swift Current. Um, and then we also have our, uh, our pulse quality program. So we're not gonna get into detail about that today, but this is a new initiative by SPG and the Saskatchewan Food Industry Development Center where all the varieties that, and seed samples that we have from our uh, regional variety trials are being evaluated for seed characteristics. So keep an eye out for the first report on this to come out over the next few months. So we'll start with our peas. So we can see our trends in pea acres. Um, Meadow has continuously been dominant. Over 80% of our pea acres are planted to our those six leading varieties there. Um, it uh, it's still Meadow is still dominant despite its lower yield potential, but uh, some growers do like the earliness and good seed integrity of this variety. However, we do have some new varieties that uh, have more to offer. Um, they were acres of metal were steadily decreasing, but increased slightly in 2022 and 2023. Some other varieties gaining include Inca, Spectrum, and Carver. And the new variety AAC Chrome is emerging and gaining acres as seed becomes more available, and it actually overtook Amarillo in 2023. So this is a statistical analysis of our long-term RVT yield data on the peas. Um, our top yielding ranking varieties include AAC Chrome, CDC Tollefson, CDC Citrine, and CDC Hickey. The dominant variety, CDC Meadow, you can see there, ranks near the bottom. We had uh, Beyond, Aberdeen, and Julius were in their first year of the variety trials, so we didn't have enough data to include them in this uh, statistical analysis. So looking at the Sask Seed Guide on some of the yellow peas, um, lots of yellow varieties available and a lot coming to the market. So the yellow highlights are ones not yet commercially available. Um, the green highlighted ones may have some seed available, but would be limited. Yields are upwards of 110% of the checks in some of the emerging ones. And we're also starting to see some fusarium root rot resistance um, with MR ratings in some varieties now and uh, good seed coat breakage. Now, when we look more closely into some of the varieties commercially available, um, we do see a lot are up to 10% higher yielding than the Czech Amarillo and are also much better yielding than the older varieties, Golden and Meadow. Newer varieties not only bring higher yields, but again, some increases in disease resistance, such as Microsphorella blight and Fusarium root rot, as well as improved lodging and moderate protein levels, which you can see highlighted there. A few to consider that have seed readily available, AAC Chrome, CDC Inca, CDC Luachco, uh, Luachco and AAC Profit. Luachco and Profit both have uh, very high protein and CDC Spectrum. Seed for AAC Aberdeen, CDC Citrine, CDC Hickey and CDC Tollefson will be in limited supply if any is available, but might be ones to consider in future years. Going into the green pea acres, so CDC Striker, that was released in 2002 and has uh, steadily declined over the past few years in favor of some newer higher yielding varieties. Uh, Greenwater, Razor, Limerick and Spruce all had rapid uptake, but are now starting to decrease in favor of uh, CDC Forest. So here we can see a little bit more detail on the green peas as well too. Uh, higher yield potential than the older variety striker based on the long term data. Husky is a very high yielding one to watch for in future as it'll be uh, a couple of years before a seed is available commercially, uh, CDC Rider is another newer one that may have seed available and has the best lodging rating. Both have improved fusarium root rot resistance over forest and better bleaching. Forest is still the dominant variety and highest yielding that is commercially available. Uh, one thing to note there as well is CDC Limerick. It's showing the highest protein out of all of our peas, yellows and greens inclusive, but has a little bit smaller seed size. Now we'll run through the lentils here, small reds. 
So as Carl mentioned previously, CDC maxims are dominant variety. We've started to see it uh, decrease slowly. So, um, you know, this year we saw 55% of our small red lentil acres planted to the three leading varieties, Maxim, Impulse, and Proclaim. Last year, this was 85%. So we're starting to see a bit more market share taken up by a few different uh, varieties here. Um, CDC Impulse and CDC Proclaim were both released in 2014. Both represent a 6 to 9% yield advantage versus Maxim in the south, 3 to 4% in the north. Impulse is also our highest yielding clearfield variety in the south and also has the largest seed size at 44, 000, 44 gram, 1,000 kernel weight. Next highest, for example, would be Proclaim and Maxim at 40 gram. The variety CDC Red Moon continues to be our highest yielding conventional small red, yields 113% of Maxim in the south, 107% in the north. Released in 2015, uptake's been a little bit slower due to the lack of any tolerance. However, um, we're starting to see yield advantage of this variety might offset that uh, lack of tolerance, especially as we start to see a few more herbicide options uh, in the residual category available for lentils. Saw a slight decrease in acres in 2023 with Red Moon back to 2020, 2021 levels. And then Simi and Nimble are two of our emerging varieties, both released in 2019. We're starting to see uh, acres of those two slowly increase as well as we get more seed, uh, more seed available. So a little bit of info on the on the details with the reds. Um, Again, we, we talk about CDC Red Moon having the highest yield potential, and that's under our weed-free conditions in our regional variety trials. Um, most varieties now we do have are, are available with the Clearfield Tolerance trait too. Uh, impulse and Proclaim, pretty widely adopted, as we saw in that previous slide. Um, and then when we start to look at some of our potentials in the large reds as well too, we have uh, uh, CDC Sublime and CDC Monarch are the top yielding varieties, but Sublime, you can see, has a uh, green seed coat color. So because of that, it was uh, it has to be grown under contract. Monarch's the new one that's coming out and uh, has correct seed coat color, but not yet commercially available. So here's a demonstration we did um, just south of Rose Town this year. This was a field scale showcase site of uh, six small red lentil varieties. We had it uh, randomized strip trials and triple replicated. So you can see the error bars are going to be our highest and lowest yields of those varieties. And the uh, the green bars just our mean average of that variety. So Red Moon led the showcase with an average of 49 bushels per acre. We had Nimble, follow, Nimble and Impulse chasing at 48 and 47 bushels per acre. Our pictures here were taken on August 2nd. Uh, all our small reds, if you go on the SAS seed guide, are rated E to M for maturity. Um, but we could see just visibly uh, the impulse there were, were a couple days later in maturity than the rest of the varieties. Mike, you've yep. got a couple minutes left. Man, am I going to get through the chickpeas? My favorite. Uh, variety portal. So this is percent of maxim. This is this is one thing you can look at here. Um, five small red lentils at Elrose and Swift Current for 2022. And this is this is the yield of the check uh, as a percent. So if we now look at the actual yields of those, um, Elrose yielding less than 20. So there were challenges at this site, and under those con challenging conditions, the three newer varieties performed slightly better. At the Swift Current site, it was a uh, fantastic yield, and it was really about seeing the genetic potential of those varieties, and and that's where Red Moon came out on top. As we start to get more data into this portal over time. Um, will only get uh, more accurate representation as well too. Large green lentils. So we have uh, four varieties. Green Star has been uh, been one of the top varieties consistently. We're starting to see a decrease in uh, Greenland and in power. And now Lima is actually really starting to take off and we're expecting it to compete uh, this year for the, the, the large green lentil crown of acres. So looking at the varieties we have available, Three large or three clear fields uh, with Grimm and Lima having improved yields. Grimm has improved resistance to Anthracnose race one and the largest seed size, um, but you can still see why Green Star is popular due to its yield potential. Highest yielding in the south, but Lima is now the highest in the north, uh, and Lima still has good potential in the south as well too. So this is another way of looking at the data in our regional variety trial portal. Um, Swift location, we can see how these have fared over time. Um, with Impact and uh, and Lima and Grim and Green Star. 
Now into the small greens. So Invincible is basically taking a big chunk of the 90% of the acres of those three varieties there. Um, Viceroy has remained relatively flat and Kermit's been slowly creeping up. Jiminy is one of the new ones that uh, is upcoming here. It's the highest yielding small green in the north and the south, slightly larger seed size. We expect this variety will probably be competing with uh, Invincible in the near future um, as the uh, leading clear field variety, but uh, we don't have a disease package rating on this one complete yet. So here's the small greens over time at Swift Current, showing the improved yield of, uh, of Kermit over the past uh, in five out of eight years over Invincible. And then uh, Jiminy in the blue over the past three years is starting to look even better in this area. What do I got? Three minutes? Minus. Minus. I'm done? Just wrap it up. Okay. Chickpeas, kabulis, a lot of good varieties that we've got coming out that are available. Um, one thing I'll note is Lancer's the new check now. So remember the AMITs in the B90s uh, used to be the check. Now, if you look at some of the other varieties, that's why they're 90s, uh, 80s, because Lancer is a high yielding um, new check. So here we can see one of our new Desi ones. Um, this is CDC Cala. So it's the um, a black seeded Desi and is the earliest chickpea available. And then we have a couple new uh, Kabulis as well too that are that are looking to come out. So we have 36 bags of 230715, 35 bags of the 2335. Um, these will be released in 2024 to select seed growers. Um, the uh, 2307 has long, larger seed, and the 2335 has the best rating for resistance to ask Akita. Uh, also, if you have any name ideas for this, Bunyaman's the breeder at the CDC, and he's currently interested in anyone who has any ideas for names. So send him an email if you want a, a name. That's all I got on those new varieties. How'd I do? Kind of motored through at the end there. Okay, thank you, Mike and uh, Carl. Is there any more questions? I probably have a few seconds for questions for Mike on the varieties. Okay, I, I wanted to answer like kind of as a farmer to farmer for Shanna's question too on the, um, I guess we're shooting for a situation where it's not like canola. In canola, the old varieties get deregistered really quickly. You kind of have no choice even to keep growing what you've been growing. So on my farm, if the new varieties of lentils available, if as Carl mentioned, wheat is two dollars an acre. If they don't, if the new variety doesn't provide a two dollar an acre return, I'm going to keep growing the old variety. Is so that's and, and going into the future, you might ask like you know, what happens when it's 20 years down the road and now those old varieties are 20 years old. To me, that logic still holds true. If it's 20 years down the road and there's been no improvement in varieties that don't justify the royalty, then somewhere something's gone very wrong. And our goal is to develop as many partnerships as we can to create competition between different um, providers of seed, different breeders of seed. So that's, I guess that's kind of my, farmer to farmer response is that I don't grow, I don't do anything on my farm that doesn't, if it costs me $2 an acre for the seed or $10 an acre for the fungicide or whatever, if I don't feel that it's going to give me a return, I just keep doing what I'm, what I've been doing. So. Yep, for sure. And, and that's, you know, canola is, like I said, a different beast where, you really don't have, pardon me, canola doesn't have farm saved seed. You can't grow farm saved seed. Whereas with this, you know, I'm, I shouldn't say this, but I'm still growing green star lentils, which are a pretty old variety. And I continue to do that until I see something that is better than that. So. Yeah, that's correct on those varieties. So the difference here is that we have varieties that will continue to be royalty free for the foreseeable future. So there has to be an improvement. 
we are still looking at different if someone comes along that's willing to breed royalty free varieties we'd definitely be interested in doing that but at this time we haven't had any there's no option for royalty free so oh 100% and that's the plan is as many partnerships as we can to have a competitive environment and to keep seeking out new new partners so that's we have a second for any any questions in the room could you just step to the oh, mic so yeah. everyone can hear thanks so, so what happened with the cdc like you know it's 25 years of good news that we've done together with them we, did we have it too cheap for too long can we still do something with them and just have to pay up more dollars now? I would argue it wasn't cheap. That mm -hmm. was a pretty expensive breeding program. I can't speak to what the CDC, why they weren't interested in continuing their previous agreement. They came to us, we tried several times to convince them to continue with the same model. They weren't interested in discussing it even. So I, I can't speak to that. I can't, we, we tried to speak with them a few times. They weren't interested in continuing the same model yeah. i i know yeah i you're you're preaching to the choir 100 percent. so that's correct and the new i don't know if carl can carl's had more dealings with directly with them but i i can tell you that we have we're working with cdc currently but they're not interested in a royalty-free model so yeah I just add to that, um, you know, we we are very much focused uh, for the you know for the future with the the CDC. As I mentioned in my presentation, we are working on a new agreement with you know new terms and conditions, and we're excited about that. We think CDC is going to be a very important player alongside uh, others in uh, developing, continuing to develop new uh, pea and lentil varieties. But the model the model will be different. The varieties will be commercialized in a different way. So we envision ourselves being you know, a, you know, one of multiple funders, one of multiple investors into multiple breeding programs. So with the CDC, for example, we uh, will be making a smaller, you know, upfront uh, overall uh, investment there being, being one of several funders. And, and again, looking to have a say on, you know, on some of those commercialization uh, in decisions when, when new varieties come out. So I just wanted to stress that, you know, even though we've, we've, uh, we've had to move in a different direction from where we've been in the past. You know, we, we're expecting, and we, we really do plan to have a, a new agreement with CDC, but under a different type of a commercialization model. So, yeah, I'm just in the interest of time, I'm going to be around and there's other directors and staff around all day. So just to keep things moving, I'll end questions unless it's a quick. Okay. No, so we have the we have a seat at the table this deciding on when varieties get deregistered. And I can tell you that we have no intention unless there's, you know, a quality question or a you know market access question would be the time that old varieties would be deregistered. It'd have to be a a major problem with the variety. So so yeah, like I said, and there's directors around their staff. I'm totally happy to have long conversations about this. It's it's been a lot of conversations involved with it. So uh, seek us out and ask, feel free to ask away. So um, next up, we're gonna have a breeding, an update on Lima Green's breeding program provided by Lorena Paul, commercial product development manager with Lima Green. Lorena is responsible for commercialization of pulse varieties in Canada and the US with over 20 years of experience in the pulse and cereal seed industry. Uh, please add questions to Slido during her presentation. Uh, welcome Lorena. All righty. Good morning. As introduced, my name is Lorena Paul uh, with Lima Grain. New to Lima Grain, I joined in July of this past year. As mentioned, it sounds like I'm old with experience, but I've been in the seed industry specifically in Western Canada for over 20 years. I've had various types of roles, um, including executive director with the Provincial Seed Grower Association, marketing, agronomy, strategic marketing, and now in this new role with Lima Green. 
As a quick side note, uh, we farm as well, just outside of Strathmore, Alberta. But I'm finding I'm spending a lot of time in Saskatchewan, especially when our uh, breeding operations are based in Saskatoon. So first of all, thank you uh, to the staff and board of directors for inviting Lee McGrain and myself today to share a quick update on our pulse breeding efforts. We are a young breeding program. As Carl mentioned, our partnership finally came to fruition in 2022. And our main goal and objective is to deliver new and improved pea and lentil varieties to farmers in Saskatchewan through innovation and collaboration. Your needs and challenges that are identified by you as farmers, they drive our breeding priorities. Those include yield gains under varying conditions, understanding and trying to provide uh, resistance and protection against the entire root rot disease complex, being a Phanomyces and Fusarium. Considering the challenging uh, weed pressure, in particular kochia that was talked about earlier, is finding alternative herbicide tolerant system in lentils to help you overcome those challenges. And then lastly, as we continue to push yields, especially in peas, is ensuring that we meet the minimum protein requirements that our end users are asking for. Now, of course, to support uh, these packages, these characteristics that um, the varieties are delivering, we can't forget about what I call all the other table stakes, the maturity, the height, the seed size, seed coat breakage. That's all important in what, what we're in how we're assessing, what we're assessing and what we're bringing forward to the market. I want to take a step back because, of course, I was in 2022 as an outsider uh, looking in, and I was quite surprised and actually intrigued to learn of the Lima Grain partnership with, with pulse growers in Saskatchewan. Lima Grain being the fourth largest seed company, investing in what you consider a, a small scale crop on a global uh on a global scale, but oh, so important to farmers in Western Canada. But really you take a look at Lima Grain, farmer owned, farmer led, governed board of directors. What a wonderful opportunity to partner with growers in Saskatchewan and work in delivering new varieties for you. We have our cereal breeding operations uh, based in Saskatoon. So we were able to build on what we established a few years ago and uh, really in the center of the world's largest pulse production areas. We bring over 30 years of pea breeding experience from Europe. We have access to global expertise, germplasm, technology and innovation that we can bring here into Western Canada. We are committed and continually to investigate and find new technological advancements. They're really rooted through genomic selection. And not lastly, but certainly not the lowest priority is really the continued collaboration and thought sharing. I'll go back, I think it was my second day, second day um, working with Lima Grain where I spent the time walking through plots with SPG staff, and board of directors, so invaluable. Those conversations, the feedback, talking about so important to, to you as farmers, our breeders love that. They lapped it up and we have to continue. So anyone that hasn't spent time walking through plots, going through the greenhouses, understanding all the efforts behind the scenes to bring new varieties, I encourage you, please, please join us in the field and take a look at what we're doing. Quickly, I wanted to highlight three of our major pulse breeding initiatives. The first one is really around how do we bring new and better varieties faster and quicker to the market? So it's accelerating the breeding process, product development process, looking at how we can maximize the number of flips or generations starting in the greenhouse, looking at contra season production, not only in our breeding program, but in seed production. And then also uh, the continued development of genomic breeding tools like marker assisted selection so that we can predict 
the performance of crosses and lines before we enter into the field trials to really understand their performance. As I mentioned, we just started in 2022. We're young. We spent the past couple of years building up our confidence to deliver uh, the activities within the greenhouse and our field trials. This year, we're really able to build a robust testing network across Western Canada so we can truly understand how our new varieties are performing. And lastly, but again, not, not of any least importance, is enabling high throughput screening capacity for the root rot diseases. So we ran our first set of material or our material through our first um, uh, process uh, with phanomyces, and then we're qu quickly building up the, the protocols to develop and test for a fusarium. Wanted to take you through a quick journey. Lima Grain Cereals Research Canada, which we commonly refer to as LCRC, was established in 2015. It's a joint venture with Cantera Seeds. We've been successful in breeding and releasing uh, wheat varieties during that time period. And then they quickly expanded into peas and lentils when the partnership formed in 2022. So not only um, enabling field scale testing for peas and lentils, but also with the crosses and those first generations in the greenhouse and then assistance around pathology. We had a first set of uh, lines supported for registration in 2022. Um, those will be commercially available through our seed distribution partners as early as 2025, uh, thanks to their efforts to fast track that some of these varieties. We continue to receive approval for registrations in 2023. And then right now, um, we are uh, knee deep in analyzing all our data and making decisions of what we want to bring forward for registration in 2024. And I have to give a lot of thanks to, to Sherry Lynn and to Lori early in the fall going through the, uh, the data and really helping us making the best decisions uh, focused on what farmers needs. What I'm looking forward to is watching and understanding how our partial resistance phanomyces lines perform in the registration trials over the next few years. And with that, I really need to give thanks and huge acknowledgement to the team within LCRC. I couldn't do what I do today without this team. We have our, our breeders, our greenhouse team, our field trial uh, team, pathologists. It really is a true team effort. They're young, they're passionate, you build off that energy, and we're super excited to be doing what we're doing and uh, continue to grow going forward. So with that, I'm um, glad you didn't have to cut me off. I think I'll wrap it up there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorena. Um, are there any questions? And just to note, if anybody's asking questions in the room, if you could go to the mic, just it's, uh, there's quite a few people online and they can't hear you if you don't, if you're not at the mic, so. Okay, thank you very much, Lorena. That was excellent. Um, next, we're going to have a coffee break. We're running a little bit behind, so I think we're only going to do a 10-minute coffee break instead of a 15-minute coffee break. Um, I'd like to acknowledge FMC Canada for sponsoring this morning's coffee break. Uh, we'll reconvene with the presentations at 10.55. Thank you. Okay, welcome back everyone and uh, thanks again to FMC Canada for providing the uh, coffee break. Um, over the past nine years, SPG has committed over $10 million in funding for research investments into mitigating root rot in peas and lentils, which was leveraged again for a total of $25 million in research funding on root rot since 2014. SPG recognizes the importance of this problem and uh, I personally believe it's an existential threat to pulse production. Um, in January of this year, SPG announced where the issue of root rot, rot was included, uh, the SAS Ministry of Ag's Agricultural Development Fund, as well as their strategic research initiative and the new pulse science research cluster. SPG is leading a root rot task force to coordinate research and extension across Western Canadian researchers, industry, and producers. 
Our next presenter is Shama Chatterton, is Dr. Shama Chatterton, who will be speaking to us on the topic of root rots, giving us an update on the current situation, as well as discussing some of her most recent projects. Shama has worked for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada at the Lethbridge Research Centre since 2011 as the Paulson Special Crops Pathologist. Her research focuses on aphanomyces root rot in the Canadian prairies and supporting pulse production. Um, again, during her presentation, please add your questions to Slido. Uh, so welcome, Shama. Am I saying your name right? Perfect. Okay, I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's been a while actually since I've been to Saskatchewan. Uh, it's nice to kind of be back in these meetings and give an update on the research that uh, we've been doing. Uh, so I think we all know pea and lentil root rot is the biggest issue that the pulse industry is facing right now. I'm going to just give a very quick introduction onto our pathogens because I think by now, you know, 10 years ago, no one even knew how to say aphanomyces, and now it's unfortunately become a household name for pulse growers. Uh, so we have our root rotters that are caused by a complex of pathogens, which is really a, one of the reasons why it's so challenging to deal with. And our number one, kind of our big bad, is Aphanomyces eutyches, and it's helped along by a number of Fusarium species, including Fusarium avanaceum and Fusarium solani. And then along with that, we have our kind of bit players, Pythium, Fusarium, Rhizoctonia species that we often also find associated with these root rots. I'm just going to go over very quickly the Aphanomyces life cycle. I think by now we're all fairly familiar with it as well, but um, this life cycle is pretty unique and it plays into why it's a difficult pathogen to deal with. And then when I bring up some of the research, we're going to come back a lot to these ooze spores. Uh, and these are these thick walled um, resting spores that are produced in the roots. Uh, you can see them there in the picture. Uh, they have this nice a lipid granule in the middle, which lets them survive in the environment for a long time. And then they have that thick cell wall, which also makes them um, able to survive in our wet, dry, really cold conditions. When we add our uh, recipe is pea or lentil roots and water, what these ooze spores do is they produce uh, these zoo spores. Um, and you can go from one ooze spore can produce thousands of zoo spores. So you're really ramping up your infection court. Uh, those zoo spores can swim short distances in water pores in the soil to find the pea roots. They infect the pea and lentil roots. Within seven to ten days, they can co they can colonize that entire root structure. Once they've used up all those juicy bits um, in the roots, then they go back to producing ooze spores. And it's these ooze spores that then survive in the soil for a long time that makes it really difficult to manage. Uh, Fusarium has a less complicated disease cycle, but we actually know a little bit less about this disease cycle. There's still some unknowns. Um, it does produce either these resting spores called chlamydospores in the soil, or some species don't produce resting spores and they just survive on residue. Uh, so you can see kind of a picture up there of crop residue, which is hosting particularly Fusarium avanaceum species. As the peas grow through the residue, they pick up the spores and then you get infection on the roots, on the tap root. Uh, the part that's unknown is that we often find these fusarium species on above ground parts of the plant of the pea and lentil so we can find them on seeds we can find them on the seed pods we're not quite sure how they're moving from kind of infecting roots and the, up the foliage and into the seed and not totally sure how important that seed borne infection is to contributing to root rot but for the most part a seed treatment does take care of that seed borne infection Okay, so I, um, Mike actually went through this quite nicely, so I don't need to go too much into what the current uh, situation is. Basically, we find root rots in pea and lentil fields every year. Um, I have more detailed data from Alberta on how aphanomyces root rot is really tied to precipitation levels. Um, the Ministry of Saskatchewan, when they perform their surveys, they send me roots from peas and lentils for us to to test for aphanomyces, but we only get a pretty small proportion of those roots because they only send us the really diseased roots. So I don't get a complete picture of what the actual prevalence and incidence is of um, aphanomyces on roots. But in Alberta, we test every single field that gets surveyed. 
So what we can see is that in those really wet years, which was uh, 2015, 2016, 2020, and 2022, we saw a very high prevalence of root rot. And then those dry years, which was 2015, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2021, we see the root rot prevalence really decrease. 2015, you're probably thinking I'm a liar because 2015, it actually that purple bar is quite high. But in 2015, it was when we were still trying to figure out what was happening with Aphanomyces. So in that year, we actually only tested fields, like we only surveyed fields that had root rot. So it looks like the prevalence is really high. But if you look at that incidence, the blue bar is actually quite low. So what we're seeing is that wet years is really when we have an Aphanomyces problem, uh, which really matches with that uh, uh, disease cycle where I showed you that you need a lot of water. And then those dry years that Aphanomyces root rot uh, reduces, but it kind of can lull us into a false sense of security because we think the root rot problem has gone away, but we know that those ooze spores are staying in the soil. So when we talk about research, and like you said, it has been going on for the past 10 years. We are doing a lot of research. There's a lot of researchers involved in this now. This is really our vision for root rot management and where we're hoping to go. And it is kind of building on this foundation of a soil test because we don't know how many ooze spores are in that soil. What we're really trying to develop is a soil test where you can test your soil and get an accurate quantification of the number of pathogens that you have in your soil. I'm going to get I'm going to talk about that later. It's been more challenging than we thought 10 years ago. I was like, easy soil test, do it. Well, nothing has been that easy working with this pathogen. Um, and so the other thing that we're trying to move towards is also patch management. So when you look at, you know, when the disease is starting, you often will notice the yellowing patch in your field and maybe not pay a lot of attention to it. But if we're talking management, that's what we start to need, need to start paying attention to is those patches, because that's where we can manage it before it spreads to the whole field. So we want to start with a soil test, so knowing what's in your soil, and then looking at what are some other management options. Um, how long do we need between a pea and lentil crop? What are there some beneficial rotation crops that can help us? Also looking at seed treatment and other products. And then building on that is the use of partially resistant cultivars. I know people are questioning, when are these partially resistant cultivars coming? Uh, I think as uh, Carl and Mike talked about, it's a long lead time for breeding. So there is going to start being some Aphanomyces partially resistant lines entered into co-op uh, registration trials uh, fairly soon. But in order to deploy those partially resistant cultivars, we need to know what that acceptable pathogen levels are in the soil because they're not going to be kind of... Um, you know, your silver bullet where you can put them in a really highly infested field, we're going to need to manage them. And then on, and on top of that, we have to continue trying to find new sources of resistance. So with that kind of overall uh, research vision, um, this is what I've worked on in the past 10 years. I said there has been a lot of research involved. You know, at the beginning, we were really looking at surveys, how much, what's our problem? Uh, how extensive is the problem? And then we've moved on to doing, we start, we've done a lot of field trials since 2014. So we've been doing 10 years of field trials, trying to look at different uh, products that might work. Um, and then today I'm really just going to focus on talking about some of the research updates and those three bullet points um, of projects that started in 2021, the ones that are highlighted. Because if I tried to talk about everything on this screen, I'd probably be here till 5 p.m. and I think they're going to kick me off. <laughs> so, okay, so what I'm going to talk about first is soil test. And like I said, you know, when you first started this in 2014, it's very naive. I thought, yeah, we're going to have a soil test in two to three years. Now it's just about 10 years later, and we're still struggling with really trying to get an accurate soil test. There is three different methods to do a soil test. The one is culturing. That one does not work. So I don't think many labs are offering straight culturing from the soil. You just cannot get those ooze spores to germinate in culture. So, um, you know, it could be fat. It's fast from the roots, but you also get a lot of other things coming out from the roots. So it doesn't work that well. The soil bait is really um, the method right now that is the most reliable. You use a larger soil uh, sample size but it can only be semi-quantitative. So it's kind of, you look at the range of disease that you get out, but it doesn't tell you what those levels are in your soil. Um, part of the issue is it can take a fairly long time. You usually have to grow uh, seeds in the soil for about four weeks. It takes up space. It's fairly labor intensive because you have to grow out soil from a field um, in these pots. And sometimes the root symptoms can be confused with other pathogens. 
So we are really trying to move towards this DNA-based um, quantitative PCR test. It's very fast. You can get results from soil within 24 hours. Um, it's high throughput, so we can do 98 samples at a time in a plate. It takes about two hours to do a DNA extraction and another two hours to run the qPCR. Um, and it's quantitative, quantitative if it works. And that's where we're really struggling with is getting that quantification to actually work. So on my cons list, I have the fact that it is not always reliable. Uh, we can often get a positive result, but you can't get that quantification that we're really trying to get to. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about then is what we're trying to do to improve that quantification method. Uh, so what we did was pulled samples from 100 fields, um, and these were fields that either had just come out of a peer lentil crop or fields that had a peer lentil crop four or five years ago. So we just tried to get a really big um, kind of variation in fields. We collected the soil, we brought it into the lab, pulled out some some soil to do with a pre-bioassay soil qPCR quantification test. And then we set up the bioassay, so you can see what a bioassay kind of looks like on um, that middle picture there. And then after we pulled those roots, we tested the roots for aphanomyces, and then we also tested the soil. And so what you can see in the graph is that in that pre-bioassay soil, um, we got a lot of all the fields tested positive, but they're all falling below. So that red line that goes across the graph there is telling us that that's about 100 oospores per gram of soil. You need to be above that amount to have disease. And so what we can see from that graph, the pre-bioassay soil graph, is that all of the fields are falling below that threshold. And then if you look across the bottom where we can see disease severity, we can see our disease severity is going up to our maximum. Here it's five, so it's saying the roots are completely dead. We can see that we're not getting a great trend line between that pre-bioassay pre quantification. Then we tested the soil after we pulled out the, the roots, and then you can see we get a much nicer um, line, and they're all falling well above threshold now. So the th threshold is way at the bottom. We had to start it at 100 just so that everything would be above. So what this is telling us is that it's those oospores that are really recalcitrant to decay in the environment. They also are really recal recalcitrant to DNA extraction. So they do not like their cells being cracked open. So what we're trying to do then is look at a method where we know qPCR is the best way to quantify it, but the soil bait is the best way to tell you whether you have a phanomyces or not. So we're trying to develop kind of a hybrid method. And so what we're doing now, what we've done is taken peas. We do see treat these with a fusarium um, and pythium seed treatment, just so for now we're just trying to deal with the phanomyces issue. And then we plant a lot of peas in a small amount of soil. So we're really trying to like urge those oospores to germinate and infect peas. And then we tested them every two days, tested soil and roots every two days for 32 days um, to see where, when we can start picking up a better quantification from the soil. And so what we find is this is really what's the whole life cycle of Aphanomyces is that a pre-bioassay, we're sitting at very, very low, like 50 oospores per gram of soil we picked up after five to seven days, you see that ramp up. And that's where you see this big multiplication. So we're going from 50 and then all of a sudden we're up to, what's that number there? 100,000 is what we're detecting. And you can start detecting that at about five to seven days. So we did this with all these 100 soils to look at these growth dynamic curves and then put all that data together to come up with one table that's telling us when is our qPCR DNA test best correlated with our root rot severity. And it's really five to seven days after planting and we can test the roots or we can test the soil and it gives us a good, a better positive. So we're trying to move towards this in 2024. We're going to hopefully get a whole bunch more fields. We did it, tested it on 30 fields in 2023. 2024, you want a whole bunch more fields just to validate this model and see if we can move towards a quantification slash bait test that'll only take five to seven days rather than the bait test now taking about 28 days. Um, and so then just in terms of soil testing with the with the protocols that we have now, you know, we are still recommending a soil test just with that knowledge that the longer you've been at a pea or lentil field, you might start encountering a false negative. But the detection is usually good. Like usually you get a yes, no, you're just not at that quantification step yet. So if you're thinking of putting peas and lentils 
you know, in a field in 2024. This is just kind of my um, recommendation. So think back to the last pea or lentil crop that you got. And really the biggest part of root rot management is keeping good records on your pea and lentil crop so that you know how it did the last time you had a pea or lentil in that field. So if you think back to four years, 2020, that was a wet year. That's bad news already for 2024 because it means we probably had more root rot in 2020. But if you had a pea or lentil, well, this is just a pea field, but if you had a lentil field that looks like this one, then, you know, go ahead. You're safe to plant pea or lentil in 2024. If in 2020, this was actually that picture down at the bottom there was from 2020, you know, it was really wet. It was pretty bad. We saw some pretty bad fields. If your fields look like that, even without a soil test, it can tell you do not put a pea or lentil into that field. It's these ones that have these patches, and I'm not sure how well they show up on the um, slide there, but it's the ones that have the patches that are a little bit harder to know what to do with. You know, you saw some yellowing spots. Maybe you had this field in 2019 and it was a drier year. Is it going to be okay? Uh, so what we do recommend is to soil test those fields, and particularly this is why it's so important to keep records or keep your yield monitor. Go and soil sample from those spots that you saw yellowing that were maybe really low yielding in your yield monitors that you know is where water tracks run down. You know, if you go and sample from a green, an area where you had really high yielding, it's probably not going to have a phanomyces, but we have to start being able to recognize where those patches are because that's going to tell us um, what's, what's, gonna, what's coming in those fields. Um, yeah, so soil test those patches. Well, I'm like, I got a lot to talk about still. I'm like, I'm running out of time, pulling a mic. Um, yeah, so where we're going with this soil testing is, like I said, we're, we're finding this poor, it's a, it's a mouthful, poor pre-plant soil DNA quantification. Um, you come back with not great results, especially the longer a field has been out of pea and lentil, which I completely recognize is the biggest challenge because those are the fields that you're like, well, I had pea in 2016. Is it okay for me now to put a crop in in 2024? Those are the fields that are unfortunately the hardest to get the more your more reliable uh, DNA test or soil test from. So we are moving towards this hybrid technique. And maybe, you know, I know Saskatchewan Pulse Score is really concerned with looking about standardizing testing across all the different labs that offer these tests as well. Um, so in 2023, we've tested a whole bunch of fields. We just haven't pulled all that data together. And then 2024, we're hoping to test more. So always a shout out. Every meeting I go to, I'm like, we need samples. So find me, send me an email, find me on Twitter, and um, just get in touch with me about how you can submit samples. Okay, so now I'm going to move over to some of the work we've been doing on field trials and managing disease. And a big trial that's been going on since 2022 was looking at evaluation of calcium liming products and then also any sort of new seed treatment, biocontrol, any company that kind of says, oh, I have something that might work. We're like, okay, we'll test it. Uh, so the first thing we've done is look at lime, and that's looking at liming rate, product, and application timing. So you apply in the spring, you apply in the fall, and then how does the pea crop do on that? Um, and so really what we're thinking of is some of these soil amendment products like lime and musk grow that might be are harder to apply, recognize you cannot put them in your whole field, is again going back to recognizing where these patches, where these disease foci are in your field, and that's where we want to target. So I don't have a lot of fields with nice pictures of patches, so it's the same one from the previous slide, but go and think about those yellowing patches and think, okay, can I apply lime or musk grow there? Um, so we had really nice results from Swift Current in 2022 uh, with the bar right at the end is the no product and we got a yield there of about 1500 kilograms per hectare and if you look at the lime and particularly if you move from hydrated lime zero grind and then you look at gypsum you can see that application of gypsum doubled our yields on Swift Current. Surprisingly we didn't actually see a lot of difference between disease severity um, but Disease severity is hard to measure at exactly the right time. So it's sometimes it just could be that the phantomyces came on like two weeks later because of the Lyme, and we just didn't catch that in our disease severity um, assessments. But so we are really, really excited about this because I've been doing field trials for 10 years and it's rare that we see this kind of response. So then we ran it again in 2023 and we did not see the same response at all in Swift Current. We didn't see any effect of Lyme, um, likely because 2023 was such a dry year, 2022 actually was a fairly good moisture year. 
Uh, and then we run this trial again at Scott in uh, multiple locations. So I'm just going to show you the results from Scott in 2023. Again, there was a yield bump from the application of the Lyme products, but it didn't end up being statistically significant. But, you know, if you're still looking at kind of a yield bump from 4,000, 4,500 in the no product up to over 5,000 in the, the Lyme applied, you know, that's a pretty good yield bump, which we saw in 2023 in Scott. But in 2022, we didn't see a yield bump at all because of Lyme. And in fact, in 2022, yields in Scott were sitting around 2,000 kilograms per hectare, whereas in 2023, they were up to 5,000 kilograms per hectare, right? So these big differences in yield from year to year. Um, and just kind of saying, you know, we saw much higher yields in Scott in 2023 than 2022, but the disease severity, again, was the same despite those two um, different years. And 2023 was a much drier year than 2022. So I think that just also played into these yields and what the yield potential is that we can see. Um, and so there is a relationship between rainfall disease and yield. I just am not like, I've done field trials for 10 years and I can see that there's a relationship there, but I just cannot figure out like what it is that's driving that relationship. But basically, um, you know, it's like peas and drought. Peas don't like drought. Peas don't like too much water. They don't like phantomyces when it's wet. And then, so it's just really hard to tease that all apart. Um, and so then the other thing we we're looking at is these new products in the pipeline. So we evaluated 12 products in 2021 at four sites and then nine products at five sites in 2022. And then we also looked at Musgrow at three rates at three rates at two sites in 2022. And again, in Tabor, which is just right next to where I am in Lethbridge, uh, we saw a really nice effect of, of Musgrow in 2022. Again, almost doubling of yield because of that Musgrow application. So very excited about that. And then in 2023, no effect of Musgrow at all. So 2023 was incredibly dry in Tabor. We had 45 millimeters of rain over the whole growing season. So, I mean, the peas are just going to struggle no matter what you're, you're putting on that. Um, and so the other thing that we're looking at, like I said, all these different products. So I'm just going to kind of break down 2023. A lot of the products we have to sign kind of confidentiality agreements, so I can't tell you what they are. Um, but we looked at, you know, some chemical seed treatments, some biocontrol seed treatments, a different kind of calcium product. We have some uh, aphanomyces tolerant lines with the genetics from Europe. And so we tested those with Rancona seed treatment and very... Nicely, we did see a reduction in disease severity. This is like, hallelujah, 10 years. This is the first time we've actually seen a reduction in disease severity with anything. So it was very encouraging that, you know, there's a phantomyces tolerant or partially resistant lines that combined with a seed treatment are going to actually give us some sort of management option. Uh, but then when we look at yield, we didn't really see any yield effect. And that's partly because there are European lines that are actually still a powdery mildew, which we can't even, we can't register powdery, if, if a line has powdery mildew susceptibility, we can't register it. So they're just not actually as high yielding as our Canadian cultivars anyway, even under a phantomyces disease pressure. So we saw that reduction in disease severity, but didn't see that sort of corresponding increase in yield. So I think once we start getting some Canadian cultivars that are adapted to our Canadian environment with some of Phantomyces partial resistance and look at them stacked with seed treatment products, I think, you know, we'll start to see that we can bring that disease severity down. Um, so if you have a Phantomyces, you know, the question is what can you grow? We all know, don't grow pea and lentils or you have to avoid putting pea and lentils into that field. We have looked at soybean, fava bean and chickpea and they are good alternate pulse crops to grow in these infested fields, but I fully recognize that they're not adaptable to all the pulse growing areas. Uh, dry bean is fine. I you know you're not going to grow it down here. Um, it is susceptible to a different race of the phanomyces, but that race can infect peas. Alfalfa, um, it is a host, so you have to watch out, you know, if you're coming from an alfalfa to a pea field, that can sometimes be a, be a warning. Uh, vetches, and there's some interest in putting them in cover crops. Vetches are extremely susceptible to aphanomyces, so not a good idea to have them in your cover crop mix if you're using them. Clovers uh, really depends on the species. There's lots of different kind of clovers. I can break down the list. I don't remember offhand, but some are susceptible, some aren't. And then lupin, which I know are, have interest as a new uh, pulse crop, they you can grow those. Those are resistant to aphanomyces. 
well, I'm going to run out of time. Um, so when we look at sort of crossover of pathogens, uh, we did this trial as part of the previous iteration of the pulse cluster from 2018 to 2023. And here we were looking at either including soybean, chickpea, or fava bean in a rotation with peas in these aphanomyces infested sites, just to ensure that they, yes, they were safe to grow. So I'm just going to show you the results from chickpea because I know that's sort of the chickpea growing region down here. But basically what we saw is that if you had pea and chickpea side by side, a um, lot less root rot than the chickpea compared to the pea. And again, we can see that um, effect of rainfall where 2020 was our pretty wet year and we had much higher disease severity in the pea there. And then what we looked at was these pathogen, root rot pathogen levels on pea and the chickpea roots. And so you can see right away that those chickpea roots really did not support any infection by aphanomyces uh, compared to peas. It's that gray, sort of the gray bar in 2018, 2020, and 2022. We can see we had high aphanomyces levels on those roots, as well as the fusarium species that can colonize peas. So we have uh, fusarium solani and fusarium redolins were mostly at the swift current site. We can see that on chickpeas, they really did not support those pea root rot pathogens. Uh, so for this section, um, you know, we have, I do feel like I stand up a lot of these meetings and I give depressing news in Alberta. They do call me the Grim Reaper because I'm like, yeah, your plants all died. Um, so we have done 10 years of product testing. Like the research is happening. Just so far, we've found very little that has been successful in the field. We've found one seed treatment product five years ago that was quite successful, but it wasn't economical for the company to register it. So unfortunately, we don't have that option. And then we have, you know, so finding these aphanomyces tolerant lines that showed a response with the seed treatment was like, yay, for success in 10 years. Um, but, you know, so it was really exciting for us. So hoping to do more kind of research, looking at that stacked stacked products, especially once we have partially resistant cultivars. Uh, there's some research coming out of North Dakota State that shows that seeding date can reduce aphanomyces root rot levels. Um, but whether you get enough of a yield bump, uh, I don't know. So you still get a fair amount of disease. You just get a little bit of a yield increase. So whether that's enough to still grow peas or lentils in an emphatomyces infested field? I don't know. Um, there's been almost no field trials with lentils. Everything we have done is with peas, sort of assuming, well, if it works on peas, it's gonna work on lentils. So I think we do need to start some of this testing. You know, if we start, find something that works on peas, then we for, for sure start working on it in lentils. Um, and then I think, you know, what the other kind of research success has come out is that you can replace or pea or lentil mm -hmm. with one of these resistant pea crops, fava bean, chickpea, or soybean. Again, recognizing they have, you know, they don't have the adaptability that pea and lentils have. Uh, so I'm going to move on to kind of the last um, section of research, uh, and that is this big project called Genomic Solutions for Aphanomyces. This is funded by ADF, uh, SAS Pulse Growers, and WGRF. Uh, we have a really big list of objectives, and a lot of these were actually kind of, we were able to use the matching funding from SPG to kind of roll over into the much larger Genome Canada project. So this is kind of a small piece project that we had started already, and now it's being really ramped up to this really large Genome Canada project. So what we're looking for is genetic traits that confer broad spectrum resistance to the whole pea root rot complex. So Mostly we've just been kind of screening against aphanomyces. We're going to try to start screening against all of the pathogens all at once. Um, looking at new and more precise phenotyping tools, and I'll show you in one of my last slides why that's so important. Uh, we haven't been able to do a lot of work with Fusarium solani because it's a risk group two pathogen and that it can cause issues to human health. So we have to be really careful how we work within a lab. So we're trying to develop capacity to actually be able to work with Fusarium solani. And then we are trying to take, develop these new sort of uh, modeling tools as well with a modeler in Brandon, Manitoba, to look at kind of pulling together historical field maps, all your pathogen data, all of your topography data, and kind of come up with, with models. So for field screening, uh, what we did in 2023 was pulled out 250 P accession lines. So these are like way, way pre-breeding lines. There's some of them are purple. They have like really different characteristics. So we just wanted to screen them in the field <laughs> rather than try to do them in the greenhouse. We wanted to put them onto a Phantomyces nursery and just see how they do. 
So then they assess for root rot 35 to 40 days after planting. And then we also collected roots and soil for testing for their microbiome to see if there's also a kind of microbial composition that is either helping some of these lines or making some of the lines worse. So this was also very exciting because I said we see a lot of root rot. So it was really nice to have 250 lines uh, in the field and find that there's a very small portion there on the far right graph that have some really nice resistance. And this is exactly the sort of graph that we were expecting when you see that it falls along this normal distribution where you have sort of your tail end of some very resistant plants and some very susceptible plants. So, you know, I think what we ended up there was about 12 or 16 new lines, new kind of accession lines that we can use as sources of resistance. So we also wanted to see how that compares to greenhouse testing. So we grew them out in the field, then we screened them again in the greenhouse because screening in the greenhouse is much easier than screening in the field. Um, and what you can see is that there's a low but significant correlation. So things in the field tend to have much higher disease severity than in the greenhouse. And that's because in the field, we're looking at the whole root rot complex in the greenhouse. We're just looking at a phanomyces. But there was a few promising lines, again, down that right quadrant that showed resistance in both the field and the greenhouse. So those would be sources of parents now for breeding program. Um, and so the other thing that we're looking at is trying to, like I said, identify these site factors that drive root rot development. And so what we want to do is select fields and sample them quite heavily in 2024 and 2025 and put together this whole pathogen sort of array and a whole microbiome array. And then is it high spot in your field, low spot in your field? So what we're looking for is lentil or pea root rot, fields that had lentil or pea, rot, pea root rot in the past one to three years that also have detailed field history and yield historical yield maps. So I don't know how many people hold on to their yield maps, but what we're really trying to do is like look at those patches, right? Can we identify where root rot patches from a yield map? Um, so if you have that, and they should be close to swift current, so Michelle can go out and sample them. If you have that, let me or Michelle know if you're interested in, in having your field sampled. Um, it said like Fusarium salani screening. Uh, this is happening at AFC Saskatoon because they were able to develop a, risk, uh, a containment. So you can see the door there, it has to be containment level. There's a whole bunch of procedures that you have to go through. So we're just starting the screening of with Fusarium salani. So for this section, uh, you know, we are moving towards this much larger screening effort now with this Genome Canada project. We're hoping to screen 2,000 P accession lines to find novel sources of resistance. Uh, so there's a really large and collaborative projects that are just about to, they're just taking off now, really drilling down into the genetics. A big problem is there's my happy, not happy technician. You know, when we pull out these boxes and boxes and boxes of of plants from the field that we then have to go through to assess for root rot. It's a lot of work. Um, so it's, it, and it's labor intensive work and labor means expenses, right? So it's not as easy as like a foliar disease where you just walk through the field and score it. No, we have to dig up roots really, really hard in these dry conditions. And then we just have like an army of students that spend their whole summer basically washing roots, chopping roots, tubing roots so that we can test them for what the pathogens are. So we are trying to move towards a better screening system that we can maybe use like these high imaging drones and tech to actually see if we can match the shoot symptoms to the root symptoms so we don't have to spend months digging up, washing, raiding, tubing roots to figure out what's going on. Uh, so just perspectives for solving root rot. Yes, it's very challenging. Foundation is knowing what's in your soil. We've been saying that for a few years, and I'm hoping that we're really working towards a system that's going to work better. Um, we are working on disease management strategies, and a lot of it comes down to this improved resistance, um, both like really looking at the genetics of the host. And I think, as I said, there's some big projects that are just going to start delving into more of this sort of genomic selection ability. Um, so with that, I'll just wrap up, thank all the funders and thank all of, um, I have a huge list of collaborators that work on this, that we're working on it all together. Um, whoops. And then, yeah, that's the end. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, Shama. Do we have any questions? Slido. Oh, there's one on the Slido. Uh, we'll do the Slido one first, Shama, and then. 
Yeah, so why was Rancona used instead of Intego? Uh, someone's very sharp in picking that up. Um, <laughs> partly because in our testing that we've done with products, we have had have seen a better response in terms of reduction in disease severity with Rancona rather than Intego. So Rancona, both Ran Rancona and Intego are registered for suppression of aphanomyces, and we have tested them both quite extensively, and we did just find that Rancona was a little more consistent in providing kind of that early season suppression than Intego was, so that's why we used it in our trial. My question was, has anyone looked at soil compaction and mechanical uh, ways of alleviating soil or compaction and how that works into all that? Yeah, that's a good question um, because we tried we tried to measure compaction in a lot of these fields that we collect soil samples from, and we couldn't even get the penetrometer through the um, through the soil just because it, the, it's been such dry conditions. It's kind of like everything is so hard that we couldn't even like measure compaction. Um, so I would say overall, in terms of how big of a compaction is playing, it's not playing a huge role. Like, because when we look at a phanomyces, you kind of see it over the whole field and it's not like the whole field is gonna be, have compaction issues, right? Um, I know, and then I was like, yeah, so it's it's a tough one. There's a tough one to answer. Um, ways of breaking up compaction. Like we've looked at tillage and I don't actually know if tillage maybe breaks up compaction at the top, but just adds more compaction at this, the sub layers and we didn't see any effect of, of tillage um so yeah um it's a tough question that i can't give a straight like a kind of a straight answer to but i would say just in the grand scheme of things i don't think compaction is playing one of our biggest drivers in seeing root rot occur yeah I don't know. Yeah, we haven't we haven't tested that. The only tillage that we've tested is like, yeah, the surface surface tillage. Um, I don't know if I want to start recommending that people do deep tillage again. So, yeah, that's that's a tough question. Pammy had a had a a research project looking at tillage, but I can't recall what like what types of tillage. And we did test those soils for aphanomyces and found that there was no difference in their different tillage treatments. But I just don't know. I can't rec recall offhand what their different tillage treatments were. I just have a quick question uh, to do with rotation. So you sort of like the eight to 10 years. Yeah. So I'm just wondering you do I, I you sort of covered this before, but I just want you to expand on it maybe. Yeah. If you use chickpea in there, do you have to start that timeline over again or is it doesn't support it enough that you have to start over for no, some Yeah, you wouldn't have to start over again. So it would be like you could have pea and then like chickpea four years later and then you know your clock is still ticking from that pea. So it's the eight years between your pea crop and then if you put a pea or chickpea or fava bean in between it doesn't count it doesn't restart the clock yeah oh oh no i have not tried doing rancona and intego together we will add that to our treatment list for 2024 yeah intego solo comes as a co-path with um Apron Max, right? So we usually do when we've done Intego Solo, we've always done it with Apron Max. I don't know about mixing Rancona and Intego because it's not on the label that they can be mixed. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Why did gypsum do better than lime? That is a very good question. <laughs> Michelle, do you know? Michelle ran the trials. Um, and we do have um there's a soil biogeochemist that's doing a lot of the soil testing of all, all like I just saw her lab yesterday and she's got, oh my God, this amazing number of soil samples to test that have come from these trials. So when she does some of that micronutrient and calcium analysis, she might be able to tell us more what's going on with that. I mean, gypsum, the lime actually affects the pH, whereas gypsum doesn't, it's just more of a source of a different kind of calcium. So it could just be that it's that different kind of calcium and I'm completely blanking offhand what the calcium type is in gypsum versus lime 
Um, but it could just be it's a different a different kind of calcium and affects the soil chemistry differently. So when Barb has those uh, results on all the different soil chemistry, then you know we could take a closer look at what was happening with the gypsum versus the lime. Major difference. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you remember what the different types of, yeah. Um, yeah. And we've had some questions about sulfur. Um, and I think there was some interest in testing a calcium sulfur product and then the company kind of pulled out and we never, we didn't actually test it. So yeah, for sure it could be that reason and sulfur might be something that we add to uh, testing on or adding. And, and I don't know if it's the availability. And so the zero grind lime doesn't actually release a lot of calcium right away. It takes a lot longer for it to be released. And it could be too that the gypsum, that that calcium sulfate is in, is in a more like immediately usable form as well. And thank you for knowing what those differences were. Oh. Sorry, could I ask you just yeah. to step up to the bike? Thanks. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's if a the pat the uh, root rot has a pathogen, mm -hmm. and b is there something in our rotation systems that is contributing to the loss of that pathogen? Therefore, we're building up, we're breeding up something ourselves, which we're we're going to run into trouble, in which we are. Yeah, and and you know the other thing is, what kinds of things could we like? On our farm now, we're just about to the point we can't grow lentils. Yeah. And, you know, we're record keeping is getting much more important. But from our experience this past year, and having heard other guys who've been out of lentils for eight years, went in this year, still a dry year, and yet a wrong week period, they got whacked. So yeah. if we don't do something as an industry, we're going to lose our primary cash crop in this thing. And, you know, is there something we can do in our rotations that are, because right at the moment, I don't see a whole heck of a lot is coming down the pipe in the soil treatment that's going to work. Because, yeah. you know, when the plant is little, like two or three inches tall, soil treatment really at that point, I don't mm -hmm. know whether it's going to really help much on the on the seed. Maybe it will, but after that, when it's six inches, it's yeah. already dead. Yeah. There's no coming back at that point. Yeah. No, you've hit the nail on the head with all of with all of the issues that we're facing with trying to deal with this problem. And I completely like recognize it. Um yeah, so like the mic the microbiome is sexy right now. Like everyone's trying to look at it. Um, we have come across uh, what we call disease suppressive soils actually just completely by accident when we test our you know 100 soils there was one we added oospores we added oospores we could not get disease and you're like hey what's going on with this soil so we are trying to you know look at some of these disease suppressive soils um and see like can we pull out that there's some beneficial microorganisms in there that are suppressing ephanomyces the problem is the everyone wants to do the research but the science isn't there yet so we can get these like lists of like oh it's in this genus all oh, these genus are are contributing but you can't pull out precisely okay which one is actually like the pathogen of the pathogen right so um and then if we tried to culture and michelle's done some work with this you try to culture and you you end up with thousands of organisms coming out of the soil and you're like how do we pick the one that's maybe contributing to this disease suppression um and you know it's also when we're looking at these partial resistant lines there is this question too is is this microbiome these beneficial microorganisms are they preferentially associating with some of these lines rather than you know and excluding the pathogen so there is a lot of interest in work and there it's just like research is slow and I know it's frustrating, but we're like picking the part at it. Like, you know, I feel like we're just like pulling out little tiny threads and seeing which one is actually gonna unravel. Um, and yeah, I completely, completely understand. Like we've been doing our field trials in the same field since 2016 and we have not seen a, the, like the Tabor site that I showed you, 
that last had peas in 2016 and we've been doing field trials in there ever since and we have not seen a yield we haven't seen the yield come back yet right whereas we had a field in lacombe p yield came back after four years so you're like why why there is it because it's um black soil zone it's got peas are a little bit better adapted you know we've had some rough rough years down here so it's just like what's going on yeah but i i totally hear you and um I wish I I wish I could come here and always come up with better news too, but we're we're picking away at it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Shama. Uh, Shanna actually stole my question. I think on our fields we notice it starting in the low spots, and it definitely travels up the wheel tracks. So I don't know. I'm I'm a little bit on the compaction side myself, whether the, whether there's truth to it or not. Uh, okay, so that concludes our morning sessions. Lunch today has been sponsored by Gowan Canada, so we want to thank them and invite them to the podium to uh, say a few words before we break. Uh, Gowan Canada's Southwest Saskatchewan sales rep, Phil Diebold, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Sean. My name is Phil Diebold. I'm the Southwest and West Central Sask uh, business rep for Gowan Canada. I cover Rosetown, Kindersley, I go over to Gravelberg, um, both the U.S. and Alberta borders as well. I've been with Gowan Canada for eight years now and was actually born and raised in the Need Path area and currently live in Swift Current. Um, on behalf of Gowan Canada as a lunch sponsor, we hope you are all getting the information you need for the upcoming crop season. Uh, Gowan Canada is a market leader in Western Canada, a lot of pre-emergent herbicides, um, and really our role is helping combat herbicide resistant weeds with some of the technologies we brought back or acquired um, pretty important role uh, in pulse crops as well as other crops grown here in southwest sask you know the number one enemy in the field continues to be kosha um, we're seeing group two four and nine resistant kosha now just a reminder edge microactive is a group three mode of action uh, registered on a number of pulse crops uh, including lentils, peas, chickpeas, and faba beans, as well as canola and other broadleaf crops. Um, you know, anytime you can get it on in the fall is great, but also have the opportunity to put it on the spring as well. Uh, if wild oats are a problem in the field, we do supply Avidex and Fortress in the market. Um, the latest survey in 2020 on wild oat resistance showed that 70% of the field surveyed on the prairies had some kind of group one or two resistant wild oats. So um, Avidex, Microactive, Liquid Avidex and Fortress, they're group 15 mode of action um, and they're important in managing those group one and two wild oats. Um, again, registered on a number of different crops, including wheat, durum, barley, peas, lentils, mustard and canola. Uh, Fortress, I do get a lot of questions on Fortress. What exactly is that? Um, our supply of Fortress into the market is good. I should note that actually all of our granular herbicides are made in Fort Saskatchewan, um, Edge, Avidex, and Fortress. So um, cranked up capacity and no supply issues on those products. But Fortress is essentially Avidex and a little bit of Treflan in there. Um, Going to get wild oats, um, green foxtail, and does have suppression of some broadleaf weeds as well. Uh, finally, we did launch a new pre-seed product last spring called Insight. Um, really, its big feature is it's a non-selective herbicide, so it gets both grassy and broadleaf weeds. Um, grassy weeds, including wild oats, broadleaf weeds, uh, kochia and Russian thistle have been two really big driver weeds. Again, we launched that last spring, available into the market this year. Uh, first crops registered are going to be spring wheat in Durham. Um, one comment we've gotten back from growers that have tried it is, you know, how quick it's worked in the spring. And uh, if you purchase Insight before the end of April and you've used Edge, Avidex, or Fortress, uh, you get 50 cents an acre back rebate on your Insight. Um, I'm going to be sticking around until the end. So if you have any questions around Edge, Avidex, Fortress, or our new pre-seed burndown Insight, come and find me and uh, can definitely fill you in on that. I want to thank everybody here for your business. Uh, contact me to discuss any questions you have. Um, here at Gowan Canada, we want to be your herbicide resistant management partner. Have a safe and productive growing season. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Um, okay, enjoy your lunch, everyone.
if uh, please note that if you have a special dietary requirement, uh, the staff at the buffet will be happy to help you. So the lunch is out these doors. I believe there's four lines set up for you. So if we could try and arrange to go in one door and out the other and kind of make a loop would be great. We'll um, begin the presentations again at 1230. Okay, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks to Gowan uh, Canada for sponsoring the delicious lunch. Um, and the caterers as well, it was excellent. Um, so our next presentation is focused on agronomy for lentils, presented by Kritz Holtzapfel. I hope I got that right. Research Manager at Indian Head Agricultural Research Foundation. Chris uh, manages a wide variety of applied agronomic field trials and demonstrates with IHARF. Again, remember to post questions in the Slido during the presentation. Welcome, Chris. Yeah. That was a pretty good job, my last name. I've heard much worse over the years. So, um, as, uh, as always, I've got a lot of material to cover in a fairly short period of time, but I think we'll just, you know, dive right into it. And I'm told this is a, a dynamic group with lots of good questions as well, too. So we'll, we'll try to, to leave enough time for that. I guess just a few of the topics that I was hoping to hit on. And this is going to, you know, we'll go through things fairly quickly. I think my slides are, are pretty easy to digest. But we'll look at some lentil seeding rate uh, work combined with different foliar fungicide on options, uh, some timings of fungicides, dual versus single. Uh, just a quick recap on some lentil fertility work that wrapped up last year. So primarily focused on fo phosphorus, but we also touched on some nitrogen management considerations there. And then we're going to finish off with a new project that's actually still ongoing, but um, this will be the first time I've I've shared some of this, looking at how lentils respond to to soils with very high levels of residual nitrogen and you know whether that's that's a feasible cropping option for some of these fields that you might find yourselves in especially after after some drier seasons so getting right into it i guess here the first thing we'll look at is our lentil response to varying seeding rates and fungicides so i can't really use my pointer but um, i think the big thing to look at there is first our locations we ran this at Indian Head, where I'm at, thin black soil zone. Scott, up in the northwest part of the province, is the dark brown soil zone. And then right here at Swift Current. And we uh, ran that over a, a two-year period from 2021 and 22. Our treatments uh, were pretty straightforward, just three seeding rates by three fungicide treatments. And our seeding rates uh, range from 130 seeds per meter squared, so about 12 seeds per, per foot, um, probably the more traditional recommended seeding rate for lentils up to 190, which is kind of a, a more aggressive seeding rate, really looking to, to fill things in a bit better, maybe choke out some weeds and even things out, and then 250 seeds, which is starting to get quite high at that point. For our foliar fungicides, of, of course, we've got to have a control where we don't apply anything. Uh, one uh, single application, and that was actually just diax at early bloom, so kind of just your standard practice, probably what many of you are already doing, waiting for the crop to flower, give it a week or so, get out there and spray it. And then our third treatment would be where we follow that up um, after about 10 to 14 days with a with an application of lance in this case, which does get a fairly broad spectrum of diseases, but would really be targeting, I think probably um, sclerotinia, maybe if you have a wetter environment, really heavy crop canopy. A uh, whole bunch of data collection. We're going to focus mostly on plant densities and yields here. So this is just uh, very quickly our our just look at how plant densities responded to different seeding rates. So not rocket science, very straightforward, pretty much exactly what you would expect. Um, obviously, plant populations are going up with with seeding rates. Um, we do see some different site effects there. So uh, you know, at some sites we just had lower over mortality due to the environmental conditions. Was a bit of an interaction, really not important. Just some kind of subtle variation that that we're, we're seeing kind of amongst the, the rankings of the sites at different seeding rates. That black uh, dash line in the middle, that's our, our overall average there. Moving on to yields though, this I guess would maybe be a little bit more interesting. This is, this is what we're seeing for some of the yield responses to those different seeding rates that we had. So, um, you know, a little bit unexpected, I guess, when we kind of did our work that preceded this, we saw predominantly positive responses to the increasing seeding rates where, 
here, uh, you know, my first year at Indian Head, I did have, that's that blue line, Indian Head 2021, uh, just a very shallow kind of positive response to the increasing seeding rates, right up to the highest rates, but it was, you know, all in all pretty flat. Um, that was our only positive response, though. We had a couple negative responses. Again, you know, I don't think anything to be real alarmed of, but we do see just that gradual decline in, in seeding rates. And, and I think this is consistent with some field scale work that, that SAS Pulse has been following up with, where we do see the kind of mixed bag of, of responses there. And then we had a couple sites with no response at all. So, so two very slight negative responses, one very slight positive response, two sites where, where nothing happened at all. So all in all, I mean, I think all of the seeding rates are performing quite well. Where I tend to land is on that middle seeding rate, not so much that it's going to guarantee you higher yields, but it is going to just kind of help you out with, with competition with weeds, which we know is important. Um, maybe avoid some of the downfalls that can come with a real excessive plant population, which can be worse disease issues, which we'll get into here. And, uh, you know, just, um, and also that unnecessary cost of seed, but a little bit of a buffer against some of the, you know, you know variability and potentially yield loss due to weed competition or high mortality that we might see at the lowest rates. Uh, this is just our overall average yield response here. So I think I kind of alluded to that earlier, but um, the linear response was significant for all practice and purposes, practical purposes, I would call that basically flat. We go from 34.4 bushels per acre to a range of 33.6. So pretty much the same. Everything's rounded up to or rounding to 34 bushels per acre. Looking at the disease, we see that actually disease was really low the whole duration of this study, which is kind of unfortunate. You know, it's good from a farmer perspective. We don't want disease, but when we're trying to test fungicides, it's nice to see a little bit. Uh, we had two locations where we had even just trace levels of disease, but this is actually a scale of zero to 100. So even those were really low levels. Um, Indian Head 2022 was our wettest season, and we do see just a very gradual increase in the prevalence of disease with plant populations. Scott that same year was drier, but with them at that highest seeding rate, we see things kind of pop up a little bit, but not so much at the, the lower rates there. Some of that can sometimes be confounded a little bit with senescence, because as we crowd these plants up, they do tend to mature a bit earlier. We do our best to distinguish, but sometimes that can be, be difficult as well. Yield responses in a very low disease pressure year, well, they weren't they weren't great. Uh, they were, in fact, significant, so um, it varied a bit by site, but um, our I guess our site by treatment interaction wasn't significant, but tells us that there was a reasonable amount of consistency. It just wasn't always big enough to pick up at individual sites, pretty small response. Um, our most responsive sites were Indian Head 2022 and Scott 2022, which were the sites that had the disease, um, but pretty small, just basically enough to cover that cost of a single application. We never saw any benefit to the dual application, but you know, I don't want you guys to necessarily rule that out as an option, but just, you know, it's certainly not something that you're gonna default to because particularly in drier years, we're just unlikely to see the benefit. We'll come back to some of this in our included comments. Uh, moving on to the next trial here, um, I just kind of quickly wanted to give you a few highlights, but it was just our lentil response to phosphorus rates, uh, nitrogen fertilizer applications, and rhizobial inoculation. So pretty busy list of treatments there, um, but you don't really need to dwell on it. Basically, we've got phosphorus rates ranging from zero up to 60 pounds actual P205, so about a you know, 100, just shy of 120 pounds of product, 1152. Uh, for our nitrogen treatments, we just put down 50 pounds of, of N as urea, either as a sideband application with the drill or an in-season broadcast, which we saw as maybe a, not so much a rescue application, but maybe a way to get some nitrogen to that crop without having the negative impact on nodulation. Um, and then what else did we have? We also threw in just some rhizobial inoculation treatment, um, and really just to look at maybe our response to, if our response to nitrogen differed depending on inoculation and vice versa. So we'll have a, a quick peek at that. Um, I don't want to spend much time on this slide, but I just want to show you that we had two sites at Indian Head, very, very low in residual phosphorus. Uh, our site at Scott had moderate phos levels, still quite low, only eight parts per million. And then swift current was uh, more moderate at 15 parts per million. So we're kind of just hovering on that edge of, of sufficiency. When we look at our yield responses, they did, um, you know, there was some variation by, by treatment or by locations, but it was quite subtle. Um, so the two sites at Indian Head, uh, you can see some really big yields at Indian Head 2022. We were up over 50 bushels per acre, but just kind of a, a linear response right up to the highest rates of phosphorus, interestingly enough. Not a strong response, but it's you know up over oh, eight to ten percent probably, so not not small. 
Um, even in the lower yields, we saw a similar response where it just kind of went right up to the highest rates, but not real dramatically. Scott, we had more intermediate POS levels and intermediate yields, and there we saw more of a quadratic response. Swift Current with the lowest yields and highest residual P levels, actually no, no response here to phosphorus fertilization. This is our overall average, which uh, you know I think is quite valid since we didn't have a lot of site-to-site -site variation. But this is showing it doesn't look like much, but it is in fact an 8% yield increase. Uh, about three bushels per acre there is what it worked out to. And really we see things kind of reaching their maximum, right or just shy probably around that 40 pounds P205 per acre. And interestingly, that's uh, it's basically, uh, that would be just over what is required to match crop removal. Lentils are approximately the new updated values here. One pound of phosphorus per bushel of, of lentils is what you're actually removing from the, the field. So that's a good number to keep in mind when you're trying to come up with your rates. When it came to inoculant responses, we didn't see a lot. Um, a bit uninspected, but unexpected, but not uncommon for these small plot trials. We'll we'll touch on that later, but actually no significant responses to inoculant. Some trends there, but you know, even that was kind of up and down as you go. Nitrogen, uh, actually a little bit more going on there. So uh, Indian head, even though we didn't see that inoculant response on its own, when we took the inoculant out, we did get a, a bit of an overall boost with the nitrogen fertilizer application. And then at Swift Current, the, the trends weren't exactly what we expected, but we did see a, a bit of a benefit there to, to some extra nitrogen as well. Um, I don't show the data, but the end responses were generally greater with nitrogen side batted at the time of seeding than they were for our in-crop, and we didn't see great responses there. When it came to protein, we were quite interested in this uh, just to see if, you know, uh, is there a way with management, with fertility, that we can boost protein levels in our lentils? And... Um, you know, I guess the the bad news and the good news is that we didn't really have any impact. So, I mean, that's bad in a sense that there's not much you can probably do besides genetics and environment to try to boost that protein levels. But the good news is that maybe it's something you don't have to really trouble your yourself with. You just kind of let, um, you know, the genetics and mother nature do its thing. Uh, we had some site differences there, which are yellow bars, but those were actually probably um, more genetic effects than anything, or could have been, because I used a different variety. I had Proclaim lentils at Indian Head relative to Impulse at the other two sites. So that could be what we're seeing there. No treatment effects. Last trial, and I think I'm uh, going through in pretty good time here, so maybe we can slow down a little bit and, and digest this one a, a little bit easier. Um, but so this is the new project, very interesting. Um, as many of you know, coming out of 2021 and even some years prior to that, we've been dealing with some pretty substantial droughts, especially in certain areas of the prairies. Um, not so much where I am at Indian Head, but you know, certainly here at Swift Current more, and as we move into Alberta, much of the brown soil zone. So a lot of farmers are left with fields where, you know, maybe lentils are what's on the rotation, it's what they've been planning for, it's what they want to grow, but they're looking at some really high residual nitrogen levels. Um, you know, maybe recognize that this isn't the crop to take advantage of those high levels, but you want to stick to your rotation for a variety of reasons. You know, can you can you do it? Are you going to have a disaster? Is it a is it a feasible option? So that's really what we were looking to get after here. Um, same locations that I've been working with this whole time. That's kind of our this is our core lentil working group is really Indian Head, Scott, and Swift Current. Uh, we ran it last year. We've got it in the ground again for 2023. So this is really just a preliminary look at results. Um, for our treatments, uh, this is kind of interesting. For our residual end levels, we tried to find sites that were initially low. Uh, we went out, we soil tested those in the fall. And then, so for one set of treatments, we just left it alone. For another, we called it elevated. It's really just a name, but we took our soil residual plus fertilizer. This was fall broadcast urea, brought that up to 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre that is what we applied. Uh, then for our extreme levels, we actually doubled that and brought our total amounts up to 200 pounds per acre. We also threw in a granular inoculant component. And then, of course, we do have our lentil classes. We did this one for both um, small red and large green lentils. I failed to mention, but everything I showed you previously has been small red lentils. Uh, really the interest there, you know, large greens, maybe a longer season variety that we don't want to delay maturity there or class, I guess, um, maybe potential for some excessive vegetative growth that we didn't want to get into and just wanted to see how those responses differed. In terms of what we actually achieved for our residual end levels, this is this is kind of interesting. You see Indian head started very low. Those brown levels or brown bars are what we measured in the fall. The light green are what we measured in the spring, but we didn't actually do anything there. Those were just, um, you know, no nitrogen applied, same levels, soil samples taken before seeding. 
The light green is our elevated levels, so where we had 100 pounds total, and then the dark green are extreme. Um, you can see not a huge amount of separation there between the elevated and the extreme, but um, it's possible that some of that nitrogen remained in the ammonia form, um, and there could have been some some losses as well. So, uh, you, you know, um, just maybe not quite as much separation as we would have liked, but all in all, the treatments did what they were supposed to. Looking at one site at a time, uh, we've got Indian head here first, and these are just our main effects. So for yields, really no responses other than our large reds were higher yielding than our small greens. There was a bit of an interaction for yield, where you can see actually for our small reds at that extreme level, we got a just a small yield bump there. Um, it doesn't really show up with our letter groupings, but it did show up in the overall kind of more powerful statistical tests, and you just see it with the trend. Green lentils were pretty flat. Chris, you've just got a couple minutes left. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get humming here. I, I backfired trying to slow down. Uh, so lentil seed protein, we saw a positive response there, actually. So higher protein at those low residual levels. Um, not, no difference between the elevated and extreme. Not really much for inoculant effect. Classes were not really that interested. The reds were higher protein. Scott, really no treatment effects whatsoever. So didn't matter with our residual nitrogen levels. Our yields were equivalent across the board. I think that's what really is important here. I want to get to swift current. No effects on Scott either at, or sorry, on protein either at Scott. Uh, swift current was a little bit more interesting. So they had very low residual levels initially, you know, coarser soil, lower organic matter. And here we did see a benefit to actually higher residual end levels. As soon as we got up to those elevated levels, we got a bit of a, a yield bump relative to the very low levels that we started with. And that just kind of stayed constant. Um, but when we look at protein, this is validated. You can see things just keep climbing. I should mention we had a big hailstorm at Swift Current that we estimate lost about 60% of our yield, but I think the results are still really valid. The, the variability was low, protein levels, you know, corroborate kind of what we saw there. Uh, there was an interaction with protein, but it, it really wasn't important, just some very subtle differentiation and kind of how they, they responded to the individual rates, but the trend was the same for both red and green lentils. And here we're into our take home messages. So hopefully I didn't do too, too bad with speeding things along. So um, plant populations, I guess targets, you know, about 150 to 200 plants per square meter. This is going to, I think, improve your lentils ability to compete with weeds, uh, improve field uniformity, hopefully minimize some of the potential downsides that we'll maybe see with the more extreme lentil populations um, or even the suboptimal populations, especially if you get into higher mortality. Um, except under extremely low disease pressure, uh, I personally would always recommend kind of planning for a single fungicide application. I think it's just risky business not to, but scout, you know, you can watch this, get out there prior to flowering, look for that disease. And I would continue monitoring right, you know, through mid pod fill just to see if maybe even under real wet conditions, that second application could be warranted. More often than not, it's probably not going to be. Um, on average, P rates that come close to matching crop removal are going to be economically optimal as well. So I think that's just a, a good number to keep in mind. And, and also your long-term goals. Do you want to draw down P level? Probably not too many of us want to do that. Do you want to keep it where it is? More would fall into that camp. Many of you are probably trying to build levels. So just something to think about when it comes to coming up with rates. Uh, the nitrogen provided by your PNS fertilizers will usually be sufficient. Um, we see some exceptions. Particularly, it seems to be in these drier areas of the brown soil zone, like Swift Current, where we do maybe have coarser soil, lower organic matter. Um, that's where we're, if anywhere, where we're more likely to see a bit of a benefit to a bit of extra nitrogen seems to be those locations. Um, while lentils are unlikely to benefit from the high residual end to the extent of crops like wheat or canola, our preliminary results say that it is still a solid cropping option for those fields. We we really didn't measure any downsides other than that small protein penalty, I guess, at Indian Head. But that came, you know, we had a little bit of a yield bump there. And at Swift Current, we actually saw positive responses. Scott, really no effect at all. So, you know, it's maybe not the best crop to take advantage of residual nitrogen, but it's not going to to be a disaster anyways. Um, demonstrating results to or benefits to inoculation has been pretty elusive in some of our trials, um, but I'll certainly stop short of ever recommending anybody not to inoculate their fields. I think it's just too critical that we have adequate nit nodulation and fixation. So take that with a grain of salt. You know, we try to do this work, but um, I'm not going to, to really, uh, with any degree of confidence, recommend that somebody skip their inoculant. With that, I am done and uh, We'll see, I guess, what we have for, for questions here. Do I advance to the next slide? Or do we have none? Thanks. Advance.
I'm seeing nothing. Hey, Chris, did you yeah. uh, soil test those plots post harvest to see about end residual following the, the harvest? No, we didn't, Tom. Um, and that would be, I, you know, I guess that wouldn't, I, I don't know if that is the, the best measure or not. I suppose it wouldn't hurt because it would tell us if the, the high nitrogen plants were still we're using that nitrogen or still fixing nitrogen. It might give us some insights into that. Um, one thing I think would be useful for sure going into spring is testing for ammonium as well as nitrate just to to see what the, what's there. But that isn't something that we did. Uh, it wasn't part of the proto protocol. We could revisit maybe for this year. It's always kind of a busy time of year because we're, you know, we're right at gearing up for harvest and all of our summer staff have gone home and things like that. So, but it's a, it's a good question. And unfortunately we didn't do it. Yeah. Cause we always, we speculate on scavenging versus fixing. It. Yeah. Yeah. But I've never seen any real numbers to, to validate that. Yeah. And, and in reality, it's hard to say how good of data we'd get. Cause some of that stuff does tend to be, be pretty variable, but um, it's, um, it's certainly, um, it would be interesting to see some insights in those high end fields. If the crops were actually fixing or just, just pulling that nitrogen. Uh, I think the results from Indian head maybe provide some insight where we had no yield impact, but maybe a little bit higher protein at the low residual end. So that maybe makes me wonder if we weren't doing a little bit more scavenging, the plants got a little bit lazy and then started to run short of nitrogen late in the season, which didn't show up in yield, but we did, did see it in the protein, but yeah, that's, that's only speculation. I do think the ammonium would be interesting. Um, you know, some locations we only broadcast our fertilizer. Swift Current, I think, was November 2nd, and winter was knocking on our door. And then lentils are one of the first crops that we get in and seed in the spring. So some of that nitrogen just may not have even converted to to nitrate yet by the time we, we got there. But I think it still would have been good results because it would have certainly, what wasn't lost, converted through the season and and helped to, to test the premise. But I think it just would have been interesting to see what was there if we had measured both forms of nitrogen. Just a quick question. I was wondering if you did any uh, testing on row spacings, like say 10 inch versus 12 inch. We never have with lentils and it's been on my to-do list for a, uh, for a long time. So, so I keep trying. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully one day um, we have a drill that we can do from 10 up to 16 inch spacing. And uh, anecdotally, you know, certainly see no issues going from 10 to 12. We grow some really nice lentil crops on 12. Uh, I know growers who are growing them at 15 and are really happy with their crops, uh, they feel that they're maybe kind of keeping disease levels down and then still have yields that, you know, anecdotally are, are on par with past production in the neighbors, but that's, that's just anecdotal. So it's on the, it's on the wish list. I just have a question. Sure. Quick, Chris, um, were any of those sites with the increased nitrogen rates, were any of those sites an average moisture to above average and do you feel if they weren't could there potentially be an issue if it was above average uh yeah and and maybe it would be more problematic and above average i guess the first part of the question is were they or were they not uh, indian head and scott were both well below average at indian head we were about 45 percent. i think scott was right over 50 swift current was pretty much right on average but unfortunately a bunch of it came in the solid form um but uh you know my concern with wetter conditions would be that maybe we do, you know, not necessarily get that stress to put the crops into seed production. And that might just be exaggerated by those high nitrogen levels as well. So, you know, hopefully we, hopefully we get some wet weather here. One of these, these years, you always have to be careful what you wish for, but this, a lot of what I presented today was, was tested under below average moisture conditions. Yeah. Right on. I'll be here for a while anyway. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. I know I always uh, look forward to the research from the sites around the province. I think it's some of the most practical research that we see. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. We have Amber Wall, and she'll be discussing agronomy for chickpeas, including key takeaways from recent trial research. Amber has a Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences from the University of Calgary and works as the Assistant Manager for Wheatland Conservation Area and Swift Current. Uh, please post questions in Slido during the presentation. Welcome, Amber. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Amber. I'm at the Wheatland Conservation here in Swift Current. Um, today I'm talking about agronomy for chickpeas. Um, we've had many research projects funded by the Pulse Growers over the years, a few of which have been focused on chickpea health. Uh, symptoms of the health issue that we've kind of heard about were first reported 
in chickpea fields in southern Saskatchewan during the 2019 growing season and continued to manifest over the next few years. Uh, there's a wide range of evaluations currently in progress to identify what's all contributing to this to better understand uh, the impact it has on chickpea crops. So that's where this research, uh, these research projects at Wheatland, uh, that's how they came about. Specifically, we just finished up two pretty large projects uh, that each took place at two locations over two site years, so four site years of data for each. The first project aims to investigate if crop management factors such as herbicide use and fertilization with potassium chloride play a role in the onset and development of those symptoms identified in chickpea crops. Uh, second project looked at incorporating different biological products to improve disease resistance, enhance crop stress tolerance, uh, and increase chickpea yield without compromising economic return due to the additional cost of those products. Pro products. Both of these sites took place over the 2022 and 2023 growing seasons in Swift Current here at our main site, as well as in Hodgeville, Hollenquist area. General weather conditions, um, pretty similar to what Chris just covered. Um, this precipitation data is provided to us by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So this is only from our Swift Current site. We actually don't have a, a weather station out at Hodgeville, but we know that it's comparable just from keeping tabs on it, um, with the exception of that narrow strip of hail that came through on July 22nd at our Swift Current site. Most of you likely remember that, it was pretty bad. Uh, luckily, the chickpeas were on the edge of that, so they didn't get hit, hit quite as hard as that lentil trial that Chris covered. Um, but it did result in some yield loss and some poor seed quality. So just to keep that in mind going forward, uh, we received 97% of our average precipitation in 2023 from May to August. Um, but like we said, it came in, came in one shot there, most of it. 2022, we received 87% of our average precipitation, uh, which again, doesn't sound too bad, but both those years, the number of rainfall events were sparse and combined with the above average temperature left the crop stressed for long periods of time. Overall, low disease, weed and insect pressure uh, and swift current, no grasshopper damage like lots in the area have recently experienced, but there was some out at Hodgeville uh, last year, we sprayed a couple times, but in the end, we adjusted those plot lengths uh, in the first rep there where they caused a lot of damage and we were able to save that. So I'm just going to focus on one of two projects today, um, that being investigating the impact of herbicide stress and potassium chloride nutrition on plant health of chickpea. We had eight treatments, uh, pre-seed application of either edge or authority. Uh, with basic NPS, nutrient side banded at seeding, next to pre-seed application of either edge or authority, plus a post-emergent application of metribuzin at the one to three node stage. Again, basic side banded nutrients. Um, previous research has indicated that the symptom severity in chickpeas increased um, in fields receiving metribuzin relative to those, to those without. So we want to look at that herbicide effect, effect specifically. And the re remaining four treatments are those herbicides repeated, but additionally, we have 35 pounds per acre of potassium chloride side banded at seeding. And potassium chloride is known to help with water regulation in plant cells. So starting with our composite soil samples of each site area were submitted to a lab, um, fairly similar site years, fewer residual nutrients overall in 2023, uh, the biggest difference was nitrogen and also chloride, which is the last column there, both sites having very low residual chloride in 2023 and medium residual levels in 2022. There was a lot of data to collect for both of these projects, so a few we'll focus on today are emergence and early vigor uh, to note any nutrient deficiencies and early crop health, crop stress. This was a visual rating for symptoms before and after the metribuzin application. Visual weed control rating differences among the herbicide treatments, as well as visual leaf and root evaluation to rate the symptoms and severity of the chickpea health, uh, yield and a return on investment. 
So plant counts were taken four to six weeks after seeding. All sites were sheeted targeting 44 plants per square meter and resulting means of the four site years averaged together ranged from 37 to 41 plants per square meter. No significant year fertility or pre-seed herbicide effects were detected. Although plant stand, plant density at each location varied with Hodgeville having a slightly higher plant stand. Likely a combination of a slightly later seeding date at Swift Current and the timing of the rainfall received. Uh, essentially, there was some increased seed mortality at Swift Current, but other than that, no significant treatment effects or trends for plant establishment. A visual re weed rating was taken after the post-emergent metribuzin application. Ratings ranged from 0 to 100%, 100 meaning complete control. Overall, we had better weed control in 2023 compared to 2022, so we'll look at those differences in each individual year. And it was also noted whether the symptoms of crop stress were apparent before and after the application or not. So there was some injury noted, uh, leaf tip chlorosis, some yellowing, especially on the, the lower leaves that is often noted after a metribuzin application. So we did see some differences in which herbicide had better efficacy each year and contributed to the overall weed control. Uh, the first graph in 2022, weed pressure was high at that post-emergent metribuzin application timing. And those plots with metribuzin had really good weed control, averaging 90% compared to those without that being either the application of pre-seed authority or edge and those averaged 65% weed control and were not significantly different from one another. Compared to 2023, the second graph there, the pre-seed authority alone controlled weeds quite well at 98%, compared to pre-seed edge alone averaging 86%. Um, very good pre-seed weed control for each of those products uh, and the addition of the, the post-emergent metribuzin not being significantly different that year. Uh, lastly, weed control varied by location just slightly. Hodgeville averaging 88% control compared to 71 at Swift Current. Not a huge difference, and that's partially attributed to the better emergence that we saw at Hodgeville, so just more competition for weeds. Uh, no notable fertility effects on weed control over the four site years. Uh, we also did some root and leaf visual disease ratings at flowering. So here I took a picture uh, of some of the summer students when we were out root sampling at Hodgeville. I uh, haven't analyzed the 2023 root ratings yet, but in 2022 we didn't find any large differences between treatments, locations, herbicide, or fertilizer treatments, and roots averaged a rating of 2 out of 5, so very low to no visual disease symptoms on the roots. Uh, leaf disease ratings were also done on a scale out of five at the same time, with zero meaning no leaf disease was present. Although overall disease pressure was pretty low, swift current ratings were slightly higher, and that was a result of the 2023 year. Uh, this could be uh, higher in this year as a result of the different soil and environmental conditions, um, topography of the land overall in every any given year we uh, our plots are on a flat area, but that does change a little bit each year. But we also just had some increased environmental stresses in 2023, uh, including that hailstorm, leading to some more visible symptoms of disease. So like I said, this rating's done at flowering. So quite a few weeks after that metribuzin application, there was a trend for increased symptom severity in those plots that received the post-emergent herbicide. And I just want to mention this is visual. As we've seen, these ratings are pretty difficult, uh, especially when disease pressure is low. There's no, you know, straight scale to follow with pictures. It doesn't look the same all the time. It's it's quite different. So, but this is relatively what we've seen in previous research done in that area as well. Um, for potassium chloride, there was a very very small increase in symptoms of leaf disease where potash was not included in the sideband, but. There's no significance on this. The CV is very high, and that's just due to it being variable and visual ratings for this at this point are pretty difficult. Uh, and due to this different level of disease and environment uh, from 2022 to 23, uh, when you combine the four site years of data, there's no significant yield response to location herbicide or fertility but we are seeing a higher yield in 2022. So let's look at the differences a little closer. So 2022, no significant yield response to potassium chloride or herbicide alone. 
uh, even though we did see that difference in weed control efficacy. However, there was a trend for those plots where metribuzin was effective at weed control to have uh, to have yielded higher. And recall, we didn't see any leaf disease, so that's not affecting any of those treatments, specifically where the metribuzin was applied, like we may have expected if there was more disease pressure. In 2023, uh, the addition of potassium chloride at seeding shows a small yield response compared to without, but it wasn't significant. Uh, and for herbicide, we did see that post-emergent metribuzin application resulting in a small decrease in yield, however, not significant compared to without. Um, but we also saw that higher leaf disease rating on those treatments following that metribuzin application. Uh, if disease was high, like many areas are experiencing, we could potentially have expected this drop to be much more significant. Overall, we want to look at the combination effect of herbicide and fertility together. No significant differences in 2022, so I've just included 2023 here. Uh, the four pre-seed authority treatments are listed first. You can see in the third and fourth columns, there was a decrease in yield when adding that post-emergent metribuzin application, and less potassium chloride was included in the sideband at seeding. And the same goes for EDGE, looking at the very last two columns, when post-emergent metribuzin was applied, with that addition of potassium chloride, that treatment did outyield the post-emergent metribuzin treatment without the potassium chloride. Moving on to a very basic economic analysis using a, a template from the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture. Um, this includes variable and total expenses to end up with a total return per acre. Uh, this is the very condensed version for the slide, so this will all be included uh, in the final report. I've kept the expenses and commodity price the same for both years. So chickpeas at 58 cents per pound, that is from December of 2022, and just changed out the, the mean yield per treatment each year. And ultimately, we ended up with the highest return per acre from treatments that did not receive the additional potassium chloride. Uh, in 2022, the top yellow boxes there, precede authority or edge with the post-emergent application of metribuzin. As we saw in 2022, metribuzin had great weed control. Weeds was one of the limiting factors that year, really, not a lot of disease. So we didn't really get to see how that would have impacted our treatments. 2023, the highest return per acre, resulting without potassium chloride and without the metribuzin application. Uh, but looking a little closer at 2023, if you needed that extra weed control post-emergence and did apply metribuzin, the addition of potassium chloride did help prevent that yield drop and increased overall return per acre compared to without the potassium chloride. This was not the case in 2022 as there was no differences in disease as shown by our leaf and root rating. So we didn't have the need for that additional potassium chloride with the post-emergent metribuzin that year. So to summarize, a post-emergent metribuzin application may cause an increase in disease severity. If the plant is already stressed, trying to fight off that disease and now you stress it out a bit more with that metribuzin application, you might be happy you added that potassium chloride at seeding. Uh, potassium is known to play an important role in water regulation and drought resistance, chloride and disease tolerance of some other crops. So it's not a stretch to assume that potassium chloride uh, may be eliciting more of a yield response where the crop was stressed out from that post-emergent metribuzin application. Overall, the metribuzin provided good weed control and the highest return on investment when weed pressure was high and disease pressure was low. When the soil and environmental conditions, uh, with the soil and environmental conditions we at our wheatland site often have, uh, an application of pre-seed edge or pre-seed authority usually works pretty good, uh, gets the crop off to a vigorous start, and then we can usually go in with a grassy weed herbicide for our in-crop. Um, obviously, a big thank you from the Wheatland staff to the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers. Uh, we enjoy working with them and all the great research projects they bring to us. This final report, as well as the biostimulant project uh, in chickpeas that I mentioned earlier, will be available online in the coming weeks. Uh, Mike actually showed uh, a little preview there in his slides as well. 
So I encourage you to look uh, look into that if that's of interest to you. There's uh, biological seed treatment and some foliar treatments there as well. Uh, in the meantime, I can answer any questions. So there's a question here, why did you choose four replications instead of three or five in the chickpea trial? Four is kind of your, your special number in research. That's just sort of what, what everyone does. That's sort of the accepted level of uh, response that you want. Less than four isn't really recommended. More than four, not always necessary. We usually do four, you know, in case you, you need to remove one, then you can do so. But yeah, four is kind of in research is sort of the special rec recommended number. And obviously space and budget and a bunch of other things, but. Uh, there's going to be lots of publicly funded trials and funded trials by SPG that we're doing this summer. If there's something you know of that you're interested and want to see, contact us or contact your, you know, your, a contact on SPG. We're happy to, happy to come have you look at it. That's why we do it. You know, new varieties and stuff, we want you to come out and view them. That's why we do what we do. So thanks. Uh, thanks, Amber. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Michelle Hubbard, research scientist of pulse pathology with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, who will be speaking about chickpea health. Michelle is based in Swift Current, where her research focuses on anthractose and lentil, ascochyte blade of chickpea, and root rots in pea and lentil. Uh, remember to post your questions in Slido during the presentation. Welcome, welcome, Michelle. Okay, thank you very much. Can you all hear me all right? So I'm going to be talking to you today about the chickpea emerging health or mystery health issue which is the same one as Amber was just talking about. Um, so my talk will give a more general overview of some of the recent and not so recent work um, I and colleagues have done on this issue. So um, the chickpeas, as I'm sure you're well aware, have a lot of benefits, including not being susceptible to a phantomycin root rot. Um, as well as being a good break from like another pulse option that you can get in there and having good nutritional value. However, they have a number of constraints like astrochyta blight, this mystery health issue, weed pressures, drought, and indeterminate growth leading to maturity issues. So some more details on the chickpea emerging health issue. It, as Amber already alluded to, was first noted back in 2019, and the symptoms can range from very mild leaf tipping or chlorosis on the tips of the leaves to chlorosis on new branches, um, all the way to wilting or to complete plant death. Um, different from metribuzin, where the leaf tipping is usually low down on the plant and the plant kind of grows out of it, the chickpea emerging health issue, any of these symptoms are most often on new growth higher up on the plant. And it's distinct from ascochyta blight, which is ascochyta blight is a well-known fungus and leads to leaf or stem symptoms. And in the more severe cases, stem girdling, and it can be low down or high up. The Chickpea emerging health issue was first noted in 2019, and here's some pictures of the complete devastation it has caused, um, but then it has led to more mild symptoms. And in some years, it's been widespread across fields, and in some sites and years, it's been really patchy. We've explored a wide range of different possible causes, some of which I'll talk about in more detail today. And these include ascochyta blight, um, root rot, wilt diseases, viruses, nutrient stressors, 
uh, nematodes, nodule feeding insects, or <laughs> drought followed by moisture being drought producing stress early in the season and then moisture later on being conducive to disease development. So I've been involved with or led surveys from 2019 up to last year. And in 2019, we weren't looking for the chickpea emerging health issue. I was leading a survey on ascochyta blight, looking at severity and the impact of intercropping and fungicide insensitivity. And um, the and then the chickpea health issue appeared partway through that season and kind of got rolled into this survey. And then in 2020 and 2021, Dr. Sabina Benitza with the Crop Development Center in Saskatoon led a survey on root rot in chickpeas with the goal of identifying pathogens responsible for chickpea root rot. And then so those could be used for breeding. And then in 2020, 2020 to 2023, we've been doing surveys that specifically looked for this emerging health issue. So I'll just highlight the results of some of these surveys starting with a publication that's come out of um, Sabina's work on root rot, where they found um, there were a, a wide range of pathogens, but three stood out as being the most common, and they were all Fusarium species, Fusarium, Regulin, Solana, and Avanesium. And um, Avanesium turned out to be the one that caused the highest level of disease. A few other highlights from this work is that um, a couple of wilt pathogens were not detected, but verticillium dali, which can cause root rot or wilt, was found in 2023, which was a hot, dry year, but not in 2020. Um, and this will tie into a, a work that I'll mention later in the talk. Um, but then a couple of other root rot pathogens such as Fusarium oxysporum, a, spe a species that's unique to root rot of chickpea, was not detected, and neither was another um, verticillium species. A highlight from the 2020 survey, 2021 survey, I should say, is we got a lot of information on the severity of the chickpea mystery health issue, and then data on whether or not specific herbicides had been applied to that field. And we found the only significant connection was between Metribuzin and the symptom severity. And that's part of where the work that Amber talked about, where the idea came from, is that um, Metribuzin does, is known to be linked to increased ascochyta severity from previous research. And here we saw that it was linked to this emerging health issue. The 2022 survey um, had very mild symptoms, so the, an average disease severity of just a little over one, with the majority of fields being just that leaf tipping. Um, and then one other interesting thing that was found was that the emerging health issue came on late as well as early. It most often had shown up around flowering or early potting. But in 2022, we saw another flare up in August, and that was linked to some pod scarring in combination with vascochyta blight as well. The 2023 survey, um, similarly, we found really mild symptoms with the majority of, of sites and fields being rated at one. And this was, as Amber explained on a zero to five scale, where five would be a dead plant and zero would be no symptoms. And this picture here is an example of what a one would look like. So really nothing to worry about on its own. Um, we did find that the later in the season, the readings were done and the field was surveyed, the more severe the symptoms were. Um, another interesting thing that's been done with some of the soil samples from the field is analysis for nematodes. And this was done by, I've done it by the University of Manitoba by Dr. Maria Tenuda and a technician in his group, Fernanda Herrera. And, but they found that while there were in some fields, very high levels of peritolancus or pin nematodes, 
there was no there was a wild amount of variation there were sometimes there were no nematodes detected in unhealthy fields sometimes there were high levels in healthy fields so there was really no link to the severity but in in an indoor trial that Mario's group did a couple of years ago they did find that sometimes inoculation with nematodes could mimic the symptoms of the emerging health issue we're still working on getting agronomic information back from producers and agronomists that were involved in this survey. So the data here is incomplete. Um, this is what I have so far for varieties. And this is exciting because in many previous surveys, it's been pretty much leader across the board for every field where we could get a variety reported. And that likely stems from the fact that in the first year in 2019, it looked like Orion was harder hit than Lita. And so with Lita and Orion being the two dominant chickpea varieties for at that time, people were probably just steering to Lita. But now more varieties options are coming out. And so it's nice to see that there's some other varieties being reported in this survey. So I'm hoping as we get a little bit more complete information from this year, we'll be able to do an analysis and see is there anything meaningful in terms of some one variety being more susceptible than another. Here you can see um, B90 or Amet has the highest severity, but it's only one field. That's what those little numbers in the bottom of the bar. So I would not conclude anything from that. I would not say that Amet is more susceptible. Um, if we ever get to a point where we could reproduce this in the lab, it would be wonderful to screen varieties for it, um, but that hasn't happened yet. But that does lead into my next slide of an interesting development from this year, that in regional develop, um, regional variety trials in red vers, and I heard but didn't make it out to the site near Saskatoon, we did see symptoms in these small plot trials of the emerging health issue. And so that led to an exciting opportunity to look at whether the whether it's something soil borne and also to look at the different varieties. So here's some pictures that either I or Ashita Patel, um, the um, a worker in Redvers, took of the symptoms. And so they do have they're more than a one. They have some of that wilting and leaf edge chlorosis high up in the plants. Um, and interestingly, this is a, some drone footage from the Redverse site. It was very interesting that there were some varieties were harder hit than others. And that depending on where you were in the trial, the symptoms were different. So down on the one edge where I'm calling it range six or rep three, um, the some of the varieties were fairly hard hit. But and then in rep two in the middle of the trial, if you really looked, you could see some symptoms. But on the other side in rep one, there were no symptoms. So what um, Victoria, who's here today and is a research biologist in my team, has done is is collected soil that we're calling unhealthy or healthy. So we picked one variety, in this case it was CDC Pearl, that was hard hit and took it from the Rep3 area where it had the had high symptoms and then took soil from the plot containing Pearl in the symptom-free Rep and used those as a source of soil for a greenhouse experiment. And so this greenhouse experiment has been run twice with five reps each time. And what we did here is use three levels of drought from well-watered, moderate drought, or severe drought. And then it was all CDC pearl in the hope that we might see the symptoms develop again. And we used the two soil types as well as a soil from close to swift current that has never caused root rot in chickpeas in the past as a control. Because in the Redverse site, it was the chickpeas did have some root rot. So we wondered if this issue was at least partially related to a soil borne issue of root rot. Um, and then we 
grew up the plants and collected data on things like height and biomass, chlorophyll fluorescence, um, the number of pods produced, and then also rated root rot and foliar symptoms. And then importantly, collected samples of roots and above ground material, which we're sending off actually today for metabolite analysis. Um, and so the experiment was run once that finished last fall before Christmas, and then once that just finished last week. So the results are still in the process of being analyzed. What I can say so far is we didn't see any symptoms of the chickpea emerging health issue. So that's disappointing. It's not something that either is so comes solely from the soil or from the combination of drought and the soil. And so these two pictures here, one of them is from the healthy soil and one of them is from the unhealthy soil. And I don't know if anyone wants to mentally take a guess at which, which of those pictures you think came from which soil. Um, I certainly wouldn't know if I, I didn't, I remember which is which, but just by looking at them, I wouldn't have been able to guess. So the upper one is actually from the unhealthy soil and the lower one is from the healthy soil. Um, and so there's more, actually, overall the ratings were exactly the same on average for, in terms of root rot severity between those two soils. Um, in, in this particular picture, which is just one example, there's even a little more pinching and blackening on the healthy soil, but there's maybe more nodulation. And I'm kind of regretting it now, but I wish we'd rated modulation. Um, but we still have more soil. We could go back and do it. And we sent the samples off both soil and roots for analysis, molecular analysis for root rot pathogens, and found they were the same. They all had um, a range of fusarium species. But another um, finding from this is drought, as one would expect, had an impact on most of the parameters we measured, but the unhealthy soil was less resilient to drought. The drought had a worse impact on the unhealthy soil. And I have another slide to show some details of that in a sec. But one other finding that came from soil from not from this experiment, so it wasn't divided into the healthy and unhealthy, it was just generally from that regional variety trial, is Maria Tenuta's group discovered another type of nematode that they hadn't previously reported in Saskatchewan. So not the pin or the peritolancus nematodes we've seen previously, um, but a spiral nematode. Um, and so his group plans to extract DNA from these guys and try to figure out which species they are. And then they are going to look at soil, the unhealthy and the healthy soil and do a comparison shortly, then see if there's any difference in the number of these nematodes. From the soils that we sent them already, there were some zeros and some counts. So we'll see what comes. Um, then this slide shows a lot of detail of an analysis Victoria did looking at height and how the soil types and drought impacted it. So this slide's a little busy, so I'll zoom in on a few important things. So um, when Victoria did an analysis um, taking into account the height measurements over time, she found that both drought and the soil type made a difference and that there was an interaction between them. And so if you look at this graph that I've blown up at the moment, it's just the last height measurement that we did before harvesting the, the first experiment. We haven't had time to analyze the data from the second experiment. But from this first experiment, exactly as you'd expect, more drought equals shorter plants. When you look at soil type, when they're well watered, there's really no difference. Um, so here we have healthy, unhealthy soil, and then South Farm is our control non-root rot soil. Um, and so when there was no when there was no drought stress or mild drought stress, there wasn't really a difference in terms of height. But in severe drought stress, we see that the plants in the healthy soil are taller. So there is there's not 
something easy to understand, but there's something going on with these soils. And so we're planning to do more analysis to try to figure that out. And first is analysis of the metabolites from the chickpeas. And that will definitely give us new information about how chickpea responds to drought, but might also help us figure out what these differences between the soil types are all about. And then we'll also do more testing of the soils themselves and try to see what what's different. Maybe there's something different in the texture or the chemistry or the nutrients in the soil. Then moving on to another experiment, looking at the chickpea emerging health issue. This one is led by Dr. Sean Sharp with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon. And here we're looking at the interactions between metribuzin and drought and ascochyta blight, I should say. And we found that we, as one would expect from previous field trials, when the two treatments are combined, there's the symptoms are a lot worse. These, um, I should say that the this experiment is still just wrapping up um, its second round, so we haven't done a statistical analysis, but just from the, these example photos, um, there's a additive effect of these two treatments. And when I went through the experiment and looked at, I could see at least one plant where having both metribuzin and ascochyta together led to symptoms that did mimic the emerging health issue. So not just that low down leaf tipping that's associated with metribuzin, but um, chlorosis high up in the plants. And um, and of course, the classic ascochyta blight symptoms of girdling and brown lesions with pycnidia forming in them. Um, but then there were also a lot of plants even in this same treatment that did not look like they had the emerging health issue. They had ascochyta blight, they had metribuzin damage, but it didn't look like this. This was like me hunting through many plants to find an example. Um, so I don't really feel like this is a full explanation. Oh, it was just a combination of metribuzin and ascochyta blight. But in some instances, that might be what's going on because it's common to use metribuzin. Ascochyta blight is also extremely common. In some instances, this might be what might be the explanation. And then a few other past experiments on this topic. Um, one very bizarre thing we've found or I've found is that autoclaving almost any soil can sometimes reproduce the emerging health issue. And so that's completely opposite to what I found. We were um, in another trial I'm working on with Dr. Jeff Shano from the University of Saskatchewan that was not intended to address this issue at all. One of his grad students found the mystery illness in her growth chamber trials. So then I took some of the soil and wanted to see if we could reproduce it. And so I had a student autoclave half the soil and not the other half, thinking maybe it will appear in the non-autoclaved, and it definitely won't in the autoclaved. If it's something soil-born, that should kill it. But that was the opposite of what we saw. It appeared faster and stronger in the autoclaved soil. So then we've gone and autoclaved a bunch of other soils, and we often find that, that we get this leaf tipping in autoclaved soil. Um, and then we've done some testing of seed lots that have either been grown in the field and we've seen the emerging health issue, or they've been produced by chickpeas that had the emerging health issue and have not found any anything reproducible out of that. And then we've done some work looking at verticillium dalli. So not a pathogen, Sabina's group was not able to actually isolate verticillium from chickpea in Saskatchewan. I had to request it from the Ottawa Culture Collection, but using a protocol that Sabina developed, we were able to get wilt from it that did look like the chickpea emerging health issue. Um, so that's interesting, but can't be the explanation because in 2020, none of the plants had tested positive for verticillium dolly. So it can't possibly be the explanation in at least some of the case, some of the cases. And then one final experiment 
is again looking at metribuzin and then drought. And here we, the study led by Sean Sharp, we saw again these metribuzin symptoms I mentioned a few times, the leaf tipping, but it was low down on the chickpeas, not on the new growth, so not the emerging health issue. And drought also didn't reproduce the emerging health issue. They both caused symptoms, as one would expect, and interacted with each other, but failed to reproduce the chickpea emerging health issue. So that's less promising than the combination of metribuzin and ascochyta. Another interesting avenue that I've looked at is the interaction between drought and ascochyta blight. So one of the theories of the possible cause for the mystery health issue is drought stress early in the season, making plants more vulnerable to being hit really hard later on if things got moist and ascochyta blight was inoculum was present. So in these greenhouse trials or growth chamber trials, what we do is water pots enough that the chickpeas would emerge. Then we'd subject some of them to drought stress and some not. And then we'd let them get to flowering and then we'd water them all and inoculate some of them with ascochyta blight to see if does, is the ones that were already stressed due to drought, do they get sicker? And in an initial experiment, that's exactly what we saw in leader. That's what this graph is showing. But then in subsequent experiments, we found that that was not the case. And in fact, in one experiment, we even found puzzlingly the opposite, that the plants that had been drought stressed actually got less severe ascochyta blight. But we also found that the drought stress response varied by cultivar. So that's an interesting thing to follow up on, especially with the new chickpea varieties that are coming out and drought stress being a common issue, is to further explore that and see how ascochyta blight resistance and chickpea performance in general holds up when there's early season drought stress. And so that brings me to the conclusions for this talk. So as I'm sure you've all gathered, my main conclusion is the mystery persists. We still don't have a good explanation, um, but that we are learning some interesting things about chickpeas in general and things that even if they don't solve this issue could be useful to know um, and some merit further explanation like drought, the impact of verticillium dalli, especially in hot conditions. Um, what if any role do these nematodes play? Are there other nematodes that we don't know about in chickpeas in Saskatchewan? How do different chickpea varieties respond to drought or to nematodes or to um, the chickpea emerging health issue? And then interactions between factors. So with that, I'd like to thank the funders, all the people who've conducted the surveys over the years, as well as the farmers who've allowed their land to be surveyed and have provided agronomic information. And then the many, many um, student and scientific and technical assistants who've made this project possible. And I will do my best to answer any questions. Can you any other jurisdictions in the world experiencing the same chickpea health issue? Yes, excellent question. And yes, there are. There's definitely in the US, just south of us, it's similar that there's no good explanation, but it has shown up, including sometimes in um in greenhouse trials in autoclave soil, but similar to us, nothing really reproducible. And I've also been in contact with researchers in Australia and heard some reports of it there, but no, no clear solutions have come out of that, just that the mystery exists in other places. Yeah. Any, is there anything been looked at for heavy metals in the soil or for herbicide carryover? So herbicide carryover or heavy metals? Um, 
herbicide carryover we've tried to look at through the surveys and haven't been able to get conclude like enough agronomic data to come to anything conclusive but i don't have any strong suspicions either and certainly not enough of suspicions to do the to well, one part of the project that i'm leading there was budget allocated to look for herbicide residues with that in mind but then we couldn't find any link to any particular herbicide making it seem worthwhile. So we decided to spend that money on the metabolite analysis instead. So I'm not, I don't have a lot of suspicion there. The heavy metals, I we haven't tested yet, but that's something I think we could look at um, or maybe changes in like solubility of aluminum or something to do with pH. That's, it's a possibility. We've, we have looked at nutrient analysis in the chickpea residue themselves and a lot of different soil testings like um, like salinity and pH and found nothing with any of those. And we do we have one more year where Jeff Shano is going to do nutrient analysis comparing the chickpeas from healthy and unhealthy fields from the 2023 season. And that's is we're still waiting for the results on that. Just wondering um, the rate of uh, um, growth of this or spread of this, is that something that's real concerning or is it seem to stay fairly isolated pockets or is it is it spreading rapidly? It I wouldn't say it's spreading rapidly. It was most of the it's most localized in the southwest of Saskatchewan, like around Assiniboia and Cornac. And we have seen some fields in this area, but I don't think it's spreading at all. Like, I don't think it's in the last couple of years, it's not like it's expanding. It maybe expanded a little bit between 2019 and 20, but I don't, I don't feel like it's spreading or in the last couple of years, it's been mild. Depth of unhealthy soil was collected for the greenhouse trials, and how is it collected and stored? It was fairly surface soil, and it was collected right after harvest. So um, Victoria, who's over here, um, and another member of my team, Lumin, went in September of this past year, and the chickpea was actually harvested that day, the day that they collected the soil. And then it was harvested just by shovel, so in the root zone of the chickpeas. Um, and then it was stored in, was it in the fridge? In the fridge for a number of months before we used it. So it came back mid-September and the la the second round of experiment was started in late November, I think. So the longest it would have sat would be about two months before it was used. Okay. Things show up after the leaves are plated out with tree helpers. No, we've tried that many times. Um, because what it really looks like is a wilt pathogen, um, like something that's clogging the vascular system. It looks like something that's cutting off the circulation of nutrients to the above ground material. And so there's fusar a fusarium oxysporum subspecies that could cause that or verticilliums that could cause that. So we have a good idea of what fung fungi should cause that. But when I've received these fresh samples that look like they have a wilt, we've plated leaves, we've cut into the stems looking for the visual symptoms of the vascular system being plugged and never found it. And occasionally something will grow from the leaves, but it's usually like a like alternaria, like something that's like a a saprophyte. It's not causing disease itself. It's something that would just grow on already dead tissue or else it's ascochyta. And then we, there's also pathogens that you can't culture, but they're there. So we've sent samples to um, to have DNA extracted and to have that analyzed. And we've found nothing, like no differences between the healthy and the diseased um, and no pattern, nothing that makes any sense as a possible explanation. Like, a, a wilt, like I say, wilt pathogen makes the most sense given the symptoms, but we've never detected it, other than that verticillium dalli that Sabina Benitez's group found in roots in just a few samples in 2021. Um, 
so there's been many, many samples that have this chickpea emerging health issue and don't have verticillium dali. Like that's all the questions. All right. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we're going to take a break now for some refreshments, and we'd like to thank Syngenta Canada for sponsoring this afternoon's coffee break. Um, get up and stretch your legs and grab a drink, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. Fired up here again, if everybody could find a seat. Uh, thanks again to Syngenta Canada for this afternoon's break. Um, we'll get started here. Uh, Jeff English uh, will now present uh, combating market access risks with targeted pulse market development and diversification. Uh, Jeff is Vice President of Marketing Communication and Communications at Pulse Canada, where he leads a team to support the pulse industry's growth strategy through marketing the sustainability, nutritional, and functional benefits of pulses. He also plays an active role in planning and executing Pulse Canada's government relations and advocacy strategy. Questions can be posted to Slido during the presentation. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sean, and thanks for the invite to be here today. <clears throat> uh, as Sean mentioned, my name is Jeff English. I'm here with Pulse Canada, and it's always nice to be back in southwestern Saskatchewan. Uh, I actually grew up in Redcliffe, not too far away, and my dad's from Neville originally, so a lot of time spent in these uh, parts. He was born in Vanguard, but don't tell anybody. Um, anyway, if we uh, we got a bit of ground to cover here, so maybe we'll just dive right into it. I, I was asked to come and talk a little bit about the market risk that exists out there in the Pulse trading world today and kind of what approaches Pulse Canada is taking to, to help combat it. I think if you take a look at the last even 10 years, you can see a lot of global trading risk. I have a few examples up there on slides, but... If you think about where we were even in 24 or 2014, 2015, and what's happened since then, there's been some major international international shifts uh, that are really going away from multilateral trading and really focusing on bilateral trading relationships. So you have the UK pulling out of the European Union through its Brexit vote, uh, the United States, which was one of the catalysts behind the the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, really pulling back from that agreement, and also uh, you know under the under the presidency of former President Trump. Um, pushing the renegotiation of, of NAFTA. Um, you know, you've had Canada, who did sign a free trade agreement with Europe, uh, known as CETA, who's really struggled to get that fully implemented and off the ground when dealing with these multilateral organizations. It tends to grind to a halt, as well as just the, um, you know, growing political tensions, whether they're abroad between different countries or, or certainly here uh, domestically. And I would point to two of particular significance that impact the pulse trading world. One is Canada's bilateral trading relationship with uh, and political relationship with uh, the two of the largest countries in the world, India and China. As you know, uh, back in 2019, uh, the Can Canada Chinese uh, China relationship uh, really took a halt with the arrest of Meng Wanzhou and the detention of the two Michaels. We have seen that situation resolved, but these relationships that were impacted as a result are continue to be uh, need to be nurtured in order to bring that trade back up to speed. Um, Pulse Canada was a big advocate, switching gears on the India file of uh, pushing towards free trade agreement with India. They are uh, one of our most important customers, certainly our most important customer on the lentil side of things. And it looked like we were getting there, but uh, you know the diplomatic tensions between our two countries um, saw those negotiations paused in, in late September of last year. And while that was unfortunate, certainly uh, from a from a Pulse trading perspective. There are certain political tensions that just cannot be ignored when it comes to how we can increase uh, you know, bilateral trading relationships uh, between um, Canada and our major pulse importing countries. Why it's important from a standpoint, if you take a look at the numbers on the screen, in terms of pulse production, Canada is a, a major global player, but not the biggest global player in terms of pulse production. But when you look at exports and trade, can Canada's pulse trade amounts for one third of all pulses traded in the world. And so, you know, we we send about 85% of what we grow to international markets, whether it's bulk or whether it's uh, well, otherwise. And that's important from a standpoint because pulse production continues to increase here here in the country. You can kind of take a look at the averages dating back to the the late 80s there. Um, but you know, averaging seven to eight million tons a year worth of pulse production, we're cognizant that that those uh, those um, 
pulses need to find a home somewhere. And so when we have major markets um, that are looking to to continue to import, but are looking at a little bit more who they're dealing with and, and seeing the importance on, again, uh, relationships and particularly political racial relationships in this kind of new world order we're seeing, uh, there's a lot of work to be done, not only to protect those markets, but to help expand in, into new uh, into new markets as well. So as I mentioned, Canada is the largest exporter of pulse crops. We are the largest producer of peas and lentils. Um, you know, and we are beholden to a handful of markets. I have some numbers up there on the screen that will maybe help shed a light on it. You know, with respect to peas, um, over 60% of our peas right now are destined for China. They've been a very consistent buyer of, of Canadian peas ever since India placed some quantitative restrictions on peas back in 2016, 2017, which I know for those who grow peas will remember as the, as the price kind of bottomed out and they looked for a new home. Uh, we've been able to grow back up acres and grow back up exports uh, thanks to the relationship with China. But China also has something called the, called the Belt and Road Initiative, where it's looking to get away from um, single uh, being beholden to a single source in terms of its imports. And so as much as they value the relationship with, uh, with Canada, and I know we had some directors, uh, or participation from, from SAS Pulse on a recent trade mission to China to kind of rekindle some of those relationships as it hadn't been there since the global pandemic. Now, they're also cognizant that they do not are not solely looking for a sole importer. And uh, they have recently allowed phytosanitary access to Russia and, and peas from the Black Sea region. And as in most world markets, price tends to be king. And it's a lot shorter uh, rail haul from uh, from the Black Sea into the Chinese market than it is from, say, uh, here in Swift Current to get on a get on a boat in, uh, in Vancouver and head over there. On the lentil side of things, India still accounts for about a quarter of, of all lentil imports. We've recently seen some movement uh, as they opened up their doors, as I'm sure uh, maybe John will touch on in the next presentation to peas for a hot minute till the end of uh, end of March. Um, you know, with respect to lentils, we've seen India as well has has had a position of of self sufficiency, um, really wanting to move away from a reliance on imports uh, pertaining to foodstuffs. They have at the same time dropped tariffs off lentils uh, through to the end of uh, through to March of 2025, which we do see as a good positive signal you know, in, in the short term. At the same time, we continue to face, uh, depending on what they do here at the end of March, quantitative restrictions in peas and some other um, um, non phytosanitary uh, what we call non-tariff trade barriers into that market. And they have a self-stated goal of weaning themselves off imports. And so you can see when you look at those two markets in themselves, uh, there is a general willingness from two of our major customers to not be as import reliant on Canada. Um, their market diversification strategies are what they are. Uh, we have uh, we have no real comment on on um, domestic policy of other countries, but we do have our own strategies from a, a Pulse Canada and I would say a Pulse Industry perspective. In our own regard, where um, you know board, consecutive boards for years now at the Pulse Canada table have seen this coming and have instructed staff and instructed uh, you know certainly instructor organizations to look to other markets, uh, which we know cannot be created overnight, and specifically to markets like India and China, you cannot replace 1.4 billion people in a market, but to look to the future to say, what can we be doing proactively rather than just sitting and waiting for the other shoe to drop? And a big part of that from a market diversification side of things is looking for new markets and new uses and new ingredients. And I have some examples up there on the screen of the types of things we're talking about. I feel like uh, a lot of it, gets lost, we'll say, in the kind of this, uh, when you when you hear pulses, and my God, buddies that joke with me all the time, like, you know, working for the pulse guys, I must be a vegetarian now. We tend to get focused on the, the meat alternative kind of space. And, you know, if you talk to our team, they would they would tell you that's a, it's a very small niche market. It can be an important market, and it certainly is one that, you know, pulses are able to serve, but it should not be or cannot be so the only focus. And so there's a lot of work being done from a Pulse Canada perspective across the table on things like dairy and dairy alternatives on blends with flowers getting uh getting products into more bakery products on pet food and on animal feed and you know we've got some um, work i'll touch on a little bit later going on in southeast asia right now pertaining to uh, livestock feed and, and including feed and uh, pardon me peas and feed rations and, and things of the like so there's lots of areas of opportunity whether it's fiber whether it's starches whether it's uh, flowers and whether it's proteins which we've seen even here domestically and that we're trending upwards. And when I say we, the global pulse industry has noticed that global food product launches continue to increase uh, with the use of pulses. So um, stats on the screen dating back the last kind of 10 years there. 
but as you can see, the the world and consumers, the customers are taking note. And there are a ton of companies that are investing in launching more products, which include a pulse ingredient, an ingredient being the operative word. And so it's a relatively new or newish space. And there's a lot of research when you say compare it to something like wheat or soy that just hasn't been conducted. And that's kind of where our team comes in, working with food companies, ingredient manufacturers to ensure that they have access to the latest science, to the latest uh, um, information on how you can include something like pulses into their products, because we know that there's benefits. There's not only envi environmental benefits, there's health benefits, and there's economic benefit for to us as a country for Canada as the world's largest exporter. Now, this slide just shows a number of uh, pulse ingredient processing uh, capacity kind of here in Canada, or the, the number of companies that are now processing pulses in Canada has gone from essentially none uh, you know, 25 years ago to, to upwards of close pushing 25 companies today. And the, our internal capacity, so our capacity to, to process here in Canada, um, you know, the a company Roquette came in a couple of years ago and opened the world's largest pea processing facility uh, in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Um, there is capacity that it just simply didn't exist 5, 10, 15 years ago here in Canada to be able to do a lot more work with ingredients and pulses and pulse ingredients. And so we need to, to find it a home. Right now, it's not a capacity issue here in Canada anymore. We have scaled up. It's about market demand and ensuring that that exists, not just south of the border, but in, in key markets and what we would call a more traditional high value markets so that they can drive return back to the farm gate. Jeff, you've just got a couple minutes. Couple minutes, that's all I need. Good, so as, as I mentioned, uh, there's, there's uh, there are numerous benefits uh, when it comes to pulses, whether it's on the health side, nutrition or sustainability. And some of the work that we've been doing from a Pulse Canada perspective has been really around that sustainability play. And so, uh, you know, we've invested into something called life cycle assessments, uh, which if you are a grower of chickpeas, please keep your ears open uh, in, in the coming months because we'll be looking for growers to participate in this. But uh, we've, we have we have quantified and we've taken SPG uh, growers and directors to Ottawa to help carry this message as well, that pulses are not just good for our economy, they're also really good for the environment. And we can prove that including a pulse in a rotation actually lowers the greenhouse gas emissions of agriculture. And this is work that's already being done. It's no government edict. It's no, it's no uh, dictation to you. It's uh, just the good work that growers are doing. And it's a really important thing when dealing with these food companies as well because consumers are more health conscious, they're more environmentally conscious. And we have a good story as a pulse industry to tell, it just hasn't been out there. Uh, more recently, uh, in, with respect to, to uh, something I will touch on here is, we have definitively proven that a pea grown in Western Canada, sold in the European market of France, is actually more environmentally friendly than a pea grown in France, and that's including our transportation costs. It's because of the work of folks in this room are doing in terms of their environmental practices, because the nitrogen uh, fixation benefits of a pea in France and a pea uh, in uh, Canada are the same. It comes down to responsible growing practices, and we can show that our peas are better for the environment. With respect to our ongoing strategies, I'll just touch on the two here, and then I can take any questions uh, that, you, that you might have. There's some really interesting areas for us in the world of food services. Um, SAS Pulse Growers have been a key investor in this kind of work, uh, working closely with companies in the United States to try to increase uh, you know, uptake of whole lentils and lentils into, into restaurants and certainly on campuses. I mentioned pet food on the pea side of things where we're looking at places in Southeast Asia to incorporate pet food and uh, peas into pet food rations. You know, markets of North America and Europe are really important for us because they tend to be that higher value and they tend to be at the forefront of kind of leading these discussions. And so all this to say is you can see our targets of our current, uh, where numbers fall currently in terms of a domestic, or pardon me, not just domestic use, but diversification use and where we want it to be. And we have some pretty ambitious goals and, and ideal scenarios by 2030. So just to move ahead, uh, you know, we're we're going to be uh, con consistently defending your international markets uh, that we have come to rely on, like India, like China. We do not want to see those go away, and we know that it's another bidder for you and for your crops, and and we want them to have them. But there is work that's ongoing right now into uh, into finding new uses and new markets. And SPG is a key contributor, not 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 just through funding, but through strategic resources around the table and and through staff and directors sitting at the Pulse Canada board. I would say protecting protecting the investment that we know that you make and that we appreciate you make, and really to help us, uh, you know, try to grow demand in those high value markets, as I mentioned. How is that? 
Amanda, we're good. Thumbs up. I can take any questions. I know I kind of rushed through a lot there, but happy to entertain any or, or catch me after. Right on time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, next is our last presentation for the day. A market outlook from John Dreger, Vice President at Left Field Commodity Research. John joined Left Field in 2019, adding his over 25 years of experience in Western Canadian crop markets for, to the team. If you have any questions for John, please post them in Slido. Welcome, John. Great. Well, uh, thanks for that introduction and uh, and thanks for the opportunity to, to be here. I know certainly uh, we, we have the privilege of working with a number of different uh, groups over the course of the season and events and those sorts of things. And certainly Sask Pulse is always one of the uh, uh, most professional and well-organized and, and enjoyable groups to work with. So, so happy to be uh uh, be a part of this this event and this meeting here. I know, you know, coming off of a, a stomach full of, of meatballs and, and pork, I don't know, maybe Carl can find in his budget to lace that magic pink juice with some Red Bull or something like that for, for next year to try and keep us going. But Either way, I'll, I'll I'll try and keep us on on track here, and uh, actually appreciated some of the things. Uh, so I guess just to kind of where I'm going here a little bit is is I want to just spend a few minutes talking about some some big picture stuff, and it kind of impacts all crop markets. And in some ways, you might almost arguably say that uh, you know somewhat less for pulses specifically, and and yet we're also not immune to it. So so I I'm I'm certainly going to you know walk through a, a number of slides. Uh, fairly quickly on on some specific things around peas and lentils and chickpeas, but also you know it, it's pulses aren't an island onto themselves of of course which we which we know uh, now also appreciate some of the comments that uh, that Jeff uh, had made here earlier because he touched on some things that we think a lot a lot about too in terms of of trade and and markets and just the overall broader uh, broader environment so so just a handful of things I want to touch on again that just sort of impact pulses from a bigger picture and then we can kind of drill down into the into the into the more granular uh, you know maybe the other just quick comment i'm going to make too is is you know kind of from a, a market outlook perspective to be quite frank it's uh it's almost a bit of an awkward time to do a market outlook because from an old crop perspective i suspect that the vast majority of the folks in the room here are either fairly well sold or don't have that much left in the bin or that sort of thing there's going to be exceptions of course uh, probably mentally thinking more towards new crop and yet there's all these things with new crop that we just honestly don't know how this is going to play out. And for a lot of these markets, you know, it's going to be fairly tight going into next year. Acres are probably going to be a little higher. Who the heck knows what's going to happen with uh, with the rain in spring, right? We know it's dry through a good chunk of Western Canada. If we get a few timely rains, suddenly everybody kind of forgets about those drought maps or it doesn't rain. And, you know, now we got a pretty dire situation and yet it's really hard to know. There's some other things that are really hard to know. So, you know, I guess, you know, one of the things that we try and do in our work is uh, we, we try to be pretty honest when we're not sure. And sometimes we don't know. We think we do a disservice to our clients if we sort of pound our fist on the table saying, yeah, this is what's going to happen. And in the back of our minds, we're just not sure. And there's some things we'll walk through here that, uh, yeah, we're, we're just not sure. And, and, you know, we try and be honest about that, but then think through kind of what that, what the implications are, depending on how some, some things play out. So, you know, in terms of some bigger picture issues, you know, one of the things that's going to happen in 2024 is I think they're going to actually break a record. I don't know, break a record. Sometimes these things are hyperbole, but, uh, but th there's a lot of major elections that are going to be happening in a lot of countries around the world, uh, an enormous amount. Now, you know, in terms of, of for pulses specifically, of course, you know, India has a key election coming up and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail specifically on, on peas, but, but that's one where, you know, there's a real specific interest in terms of pulse policy of which how that plays out might actually have a real direct impact on markets. And yet, you know, who, who, who knows, right? The hard part about things like trade policy and, and Jeff talked about and, and agree wholeheartedly that the trade environment is less friendly than it used to be a, a decade ago. And this is kind of pre COVID, right? Where things, you know, whether it's Trump, whether it's Brexit, all these sorts of things, that was already pre COVID when this whole environment got a lot more uncertain. And I don't think that's going to get any better or easier to, to figure out. Uh, sometimes that works in our favor. Sometimes it works against us. It adds a lot of uncertainty. And the hard part about that is that it's, it's people, right? It's, it's people making decisions. It's politicians making decisions. 
and that's always really hard to anticipate. Uh, you look at something like the USL, like, I guess if I would have prepared the slide, uh, you know, like on Sunday instead of Friday, I guess I would have just lopped off the Santa off that thing, I guess, right? So it goes to show you, I didn't, I should update this thing like the morning of, it just goes to show you how fast things can change. Not that he probably would have won anyway, but who knows? All that's to say, you know, the US election, Pulse policy, not that direct a link, but you know, it doesn't mean that that doesn't create a lot of uncertainty in terms of the broader macroeconomic environment, the geopolitical environment, you know, Mexico, similar thing, you know, Russia, maybe the only question about the Russian presidential election is Putin, is he gonna get like 99.8% or 99.2% or something like that? It doesn't mean that there isn't the potential for, you know, sorts of reactions, unrest, that sort of thing. All that's to say is, is it lends itself to a real un uncertain environment overall uh, and just a bit of a wild card. Uh, won't talk a lot about trade. Of course, Jeff, uh, you know, touched on that, but just, you know, the idea that again, it's, it's just a more uncertain environment than it has been. That's just our new, new reality, right? That's just our, our new reality. Uh, you know, transportation issues. I mean, it's, you know, logistics is always a challenge. It's always an uncertainty. Uh, it's often not seamless. Uh, but, you know, just from a broader global perspective, I mean, reduced movement through the Panama Canal. All of a sudden, there's a lot of ships through some real key shipping lanes that suddenly have to take a much longer trip to their end use destination. Uh, you know, the Red Sea shipping, you know, and some of these don't affect Canada specifically directly that much. Uh, but, you know, if it impacts either, you know, where supplies come from, where they go to, those sorts of things. You know, I, I think the logistic component of it and, and the uncertainty of it. Uh, has has been elevated as as well. You know, this is a graph of of crude oil, and uh, you know the only reason I kind of throw this up there a little bit is is just a bit of a reflection of uh, again just from a broader sort of commodity economic perspective. And again, you know these things do ultimately indirectly trickle down, I think, or can trickle down to things like lentils and 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 peas and those sorts of things in our own backyard. Uh, you know, so so oil should be quote unquote relatively tight on paper. Uh, we have a lot of unrest in a kind of important part of the world from an energy market perspective, and yet the price of crude oil is kind of going kind of going nowhere. Uh, and you know, I, I guess I find that kind of kind of interesting because in the past, you know, you'd see see crude oil typically spike higher. And I'm not an energy market expert. I'm not going to claim that I am, uh, but a little part of me just wonders how much. Like we've gone through the spike in interest rates, um, you know, kind of economies kind of slowing down, those sorts of things. Like, like, are there some broader demand issues underneath the surface? And I wonder if that impacts a little bit even broader grain markets, those sorts of things. It's not the same in every country, but just under the surface, are there some demand issues going on? I wonder if that's an issue of crude oil. I wonder if that shows up in, in some other grain markets that are just kind of a little more sluggish than they, you know, than they should be. Uh, and the really hard part about demand is you never really know until well after the fact. And so it's one of those things like, okay, so someone isn't buying as much as they should. Like, are they going to buy more if the price goes a bit lower or is it just delayed purchases and eventually show up? Or is that demand that's just not going to show up at all? And that's always really hard to know. Like an absence of buying is really hard to measure and know until well after the fact. And so, you know, I, I think there's, I think that contributes to a little bit of, of sluggishness. And again, it's not all markets. We're just seeing a couple slides, China, huge imports, right? We're seeing India, big imports for pulses specifically. That's great. Uh, but in other markets, other countries, I, I, I wonder, right? I, I, you know, we, we think a lot about that. Uh, other crop markets are weak, right? So here's a, a long-term futures chart going back about the last 10 odd years for corn and, uh, you know, kind of pushing through some key technical levels, right? The corn market's just kind of kind of heavy. And if the corn market is heavy, that contributes to everything else being heavy. And again, pulses up here have been a little bit of an island in many ways from a, from an overall price perspective, but it's it's kind of a tough looking chart for, for corn. Um, you know, here's a graph of soybean oil, you know, so apparently, you know, they're going to consume more canola and soybeans and everything else we can grow and they're going to pump it through a gas tank through all this renewable diesel. Soybean oil should be going to the moon. And yet you look at a chart like this and it's like, hmm, uh, you know, I guess maybe not yet or not so much. Again, we're not here to talk about soybean oil, but just a reflection that, you know, a lot of these other ag markets are, you know, they're they're pretty, they're pretty heavy, right? They're pretty, they're pretty soft and a little lackluster and, uh, you know, I, that, we're not entirely immune to that, right? In terms of pulses, again, in the short term, sure. Uh, but you know, it's gonna mean, okay, so now you plant a few more pulses instead of something else around the margins, there's some substitution and markets doing what they do. You know, there's elements of correction that come into that a little bit. So, you know, all that's to say that, uh, you know, these are just some things that we really, you know, we really 
think about from a bigger picture perspective. And, and I think we uh, we don't want to lose sight of some of these things as we think specifically about uh, about pulses. OK, so uh, looking specifically at, uh, you know, as we walk through uh, walk through some of these different markets, looking at, at peas. And so this is a graph of, of pea production in Canada uh, by type. And so you can see that uh, that production actually we took a pretty sizable drop. It was like the lowest crop in about a decade, aside from 2021, of course. Uh, you know, yellow's down about 21 percent. You know, green's down down even more, and uh, just a, just a real sharp drop. And again, the line on that chart shows yield. And so again, it's you know it's it's a, it's a yield yield problem. Of course, you know we we know how dry it was through a lot of areas excuse me, last, last year. And so, you know, pea, pea supplies are tight, right? And, and you know, particularly for, for green peas. And of course, we'll see in a chart here shortly, you know, the, uh, you know, the markets have been, been telling us that. Uh, this is a graph of pea production across the major exporters, okay? And so, you know, it's not, you know, like uh, as sharp a drop off, say, as we look at our production chart specifically, but, you know, kind of, as, again, aside from 21, when we had a really short crop, you know, kind of the, uh, the lowest since about 2015. Uh, down about a million tons. Again, we made up a good chunk of that, but but some others as well. And so, you know, that is limiting a little bit. You know, where other countries can source peas from. You know, if if our supplies are are a little bit tight. Uh, this is this is a, a graph of of Canadian pea exports, uh, and this is by destination. And so again, you know, our our expectation here is is that we're going to export probably about 2.3 million tons of peas, give or take. And it's kind of like, oh, okay, that's a bit of a disappointing number in some ways. The reason we can't export more is, is like, like supplies limit us from exporting more, right? So you might look at that graph and say, oh, you know, demand isn't isn't really there, and that's actually in this particular case not not so. Uh, this is a supply issue that's that's limiting exports. Uh, but you know, of of maybe particular note, if you look, for example, say since uh, you know 2019, 20, so the red portion of that is is shipments to China. And as Jeff mentioned, they they were taking you know like well over sixty percent or whatever it is of our pea exports, uh, and that has been the case up until now. Here we're starting to see a little bit of a shift here this year, and again with with India specifically, which is kind of the biggest news for for yellow peas. But uh, you know some shift in destinations over over time, and and again, but enormously important in terms of that 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 Chinese that Chinese market. Uh, so so this is a graph actually of month uh, monthly pea imports from from China. And and part of the reason I, I share this is, and it might be a little bit hard to see, uh, but the yellow portion, so this is imports by supplier. And so the yellow portion of those bars are Canada. Uh, the blue portion is Russia. And then, you know, there's sort of a smattering of other countries that uh, that su supply some, some peas into China. And, you know, a particular note, and also, you know, Jeff had mentioned this, so don't won't necessarily go into a tremendous amount of detail, but just how over the last number of months, actually, Russia has been a pretty significant supplier into China. So Russia is a pretty sizable grower of peas. Uh, they'll sell it cheap. And now the door has been open for Russian peas to move into, into China, you know, more so on the feed component of it, you know, so I think sort of the higher quality peas are still, you know, Canada's the preferred supplier. But just a, a bit of an indication here in terms of of the broader market, and just a just a, a bit of a uh, a reminder that there's actually other countries out there that also are you know suppliers of some size into some pretty important markets, and and so that is one of the things we need to keep in the back of our mind, and and it's one of a few examples where maybe say you know five, six, seven, eight years ago we were like kind of the the overwhelmingly dominant supplier. We're still maybe the most important one in global markets, but there are also other countries out there too that matter as well. And so we just need to kind of not lose sight of that when we kind of think a little bit about, oh, it's dry in Western Canada, what's going on? It's inevitably prices have got to go way higher. No, not not always necessarily, right? There's a few more layers to it. So we don't want to don't want to lose lose sight of the uh, lose sight of that. This is a graph of, of pea and, and desi chickpea prices in, in India. And, uh, you know, of course, in terms of, of yellow peas, I mean, the biggest thing that's that's really impacted markets here most recently is the fact that they they dropped a tariff. So we're able to actually move uh, uh, move peas into into India. Uh, and so you can kind of see the red line is is pea prices in India. Uh, the the light blue line is uh, is Desi chickpea prices in India. And so they've been moving pretty aggressively higher. And, you know, I, I don't know if I need to, uh, you know, take too many guesses as to what point they actually opened their borders to having more peas come in. That red line dropped off pretty sharply. And so that's obviously just an indication or, or a reflection of, of supplies coming into India, of which, you know, Canada will move a, a decent chunk and uh, probably maybe Russia and some others as well. Um, 
you know, it, it's it's really one of the challenging parts with this. And again, it comes back to sort of this trade and policy and, and elections and people component. Uh, so there's a very finite window uh, where this this the, of, of of opportunity for shipping at the end of March, you know, everything the way they look right now is is that you know this this window is going to close. Uh, will they extend it? Uh, will they not extend it? That's that's kind of hard to say. I, I we're 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 kind of optimistic that they they might, uh, and I say that cautiously because uh, by by no means is that guaranteed. But they've extended it for some other crops. Uh, you know, their key elections are in April and May. You know, so you you know prices are still relatively high for for a lot of pulses. You know, you the the pieces are sort of lining up that we might get an extension, and and if so, you know that that really matters and that's really important, especially if it's a window that maybe our new crop production could benefit from as well. But if they don't, then you know that kind of is negative damper on uh, new crop yellow peat prices, right? So it is really one of those things where we're just being honest and saying we just don't know. Uh, and yet the outcome of that uh, will, will really will really matter. So so we'll see. One of the things, again, we're watching uh, Desi chickpea prices in, in India real closely uh, because if they stay high, you know, again, I, I think that, you know, sort of helps our chances, if you will, for, for lack of a better term. But but that's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a real wild card and it's a real uncertainty. And, and yet it, it matters a great deal. This is a graph of Canadian pea ending stocks uh, between yellow and green peas. And you can, you can just see how incredibly tight these, these markets are, uh, particularly for greens. And, and that's been the case all year. Uh, it hadn't initially looked to be nearly that tight for yellows until, of course, again, you know, now that, that India has, has, has started to opening up and we're, we, we expect about 250,000 tons is what we're guessing we'll, we'll export to India. And, of course, that tightens supplies very quickly uh, in Western Canada. And so... Uh, you know, prices responded accordingly, and now suddenly we actually have a pretty tight yellow pea market going into into next year. You know, th this is a really actually a really noisy chart, and I just throw it up there. Uh, so, what this is, one of the things we tried to do is try and take a little bit more of a objective look at markets because there's all this noise, there's all these things swirling around. You hear this, you hear that, or whatever like that. What does it mean? One of the things that actually we just started developing here kind of this this winter is what we call a market strength scorecard. And, and really kind of what we do is we sort of take a look at what's seasonal trends because a lot of crops have a, have a seasonal component to them. Uh, we think a little bit about momentum. Are prices rising? Are prices kind of, you know, moving down? Uh, we think about something where a price is at from a historical perspective. Uh, and then also just, you know, on, is, is a price reasonable or the market reasonably tight from a fundamental perspective? Are carryouts tight or are they not tight? And we sort of mash it together and come up with kind of a number. And so if we look at what I have circled here for peas, you know, green peas, of course, you know, is, is yeah, prices are incredibly high. Uh, and so that results in a higher score. Yellows, a little bit less so. They, they've moved higher, but certainly haven't, you know, been as aggressive as, as greens. And so, you know, maybe almost as much as anything, uh, you know, you can see there's a lot of red on that chart and you don't have to look, okay, well, you know, feed barley's pretty, you know, soft. Some of the other cereals are soft, those sorts of things. You know, canola's been uh, been a little, a little ho-hum here as well. And so uh, anyway, all that's to say that, uh, you know, this is sort of something we sort of have mashed together as a bit of a barometer, if you will, of, uh, of one number. And it just, you know, again, just as a reflection of how incredibly strong green peas are uh, by a number of different different metrics. And so there's a lot on here. By the way, folks want to have, have questions about this. I, I got some cards on the table and I have my digits on the last slide here as well. Like if people want to ask me questions, because some of this I'm going to go through fairly quickly, like like please do, you know, shoot me a text or an email or a call and and happy to walk through all that. Uh, but anyway, just as much as anything, just reflection that, you know, that all else equal, you know, green pea prices are pretty good compared to, and yellow to a certain extent as well, compared to like honestly most other crops aside from from other pulses. You know, so looking ahead to next year, we do expect about a 10% increase in, in pea acres this next year. Uh, still much lower than what we were typically growing for about, you know, almost a decade before that though, right? So we'll see a bump in pea acres, uh, pretty heavily weighted to greens in our view, maybe a smaller increase in yellows. Um, and so that's kind of what, what we're thinking. Uh, now, if we get a bump in yields, of course, the production increase will be will be higher. Uh, but again, we I don't have to tell you guys how you know, how dry it is. This is a, dr a drought map of uh, of, of Canada, and uh, up to the end of December. 
And, you know, there's not very many parts of the Western Canada that aren't ranging from either fairly dry to extremely dry. Again, I don't have to tell you folks that. Uh, but it does, in terms of making a forecast, difficult. Because, again, if we have a few timely rains in spring, suddenly everyone's going to forget that this map ever existed, right? And yet we also come in, you know, kind of a little bit with our arms behind our back when it comes to a, a yield outlook if the rains certainly don't show up. And so, you know, we can project yields and all those things all, the, you know, all we want and look at averages and so on and so forth. You know, this is, of course, the reality that sits in the in the back of our of our minds. So this is the graph of Canadian pea prices. And so the solid lines of the green and the yellow are, are green and, and yellow peas for the, the current crop year. The dashed line reflects uh, new crop bids, right? And so you can see, you know, green pea prices just, you know, incredibly high, record high. Yellows, we sort of got this pop and now they've sort of leveled off a little bit. And that's probably a fair reflection of maybe where they where they should be at this point. And then, of course, you know, new crop prices are are well below uh, uh, below below old crop bids, more particularly for for green peas, and that that's probably probably fair because you know I think we'll see acres probably pop up pretty good for greens, and that's a market that's a little more vulnerable to being over oversupplied, and so that's where the risk is on on uh, on 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 green peas. Uh, so a couple of things we're watching. We are going to have very tight ending stocks coming into the season. Okay, so some of the reasons why we could potentially see, uh, you know. Kind of an ongoing strength in in peas is uh, is first of all you know yellow pea prices especially for new crop already you know quite discounted uh, stocks are really tight coming into uh, into this next harvest so there really is not a lot of cushion right so there's not a lot of cushion and it's dry and so it's not impossible if you start lining a few dominoes up okay it's really dry there's not a lot of cushion all of a sudden India kind of extends this window where we can ship some yellow peas and and suddenly you could kind of paint a pretty darn good potential price outlook. Uh, the thing is that, you know, there's a couple parts that, that are far from inevitable. If all of a sudden it rains and India kind of doesn't really buy or extend that window and we have decent pea crops in other areas, you know, that, that yellow pea price isn't going anywhere, right? And so there's just a couple real wild cards here. We just don't know how they're going to play out. And so a couple things to, to, that we're really, we're really, we're really watching. Um, again, the India terror situation, real wild card. Um, China will continue to buy from Russia, okay, and so now we're going to have a little bit more competition into that market that of which we had provided the bulk of it, and which was buying the bulk of our peas, okay. So that's uh, that's just a bit of a, a competitive reality that uh, that we're going to have to deal with going forward. Um, but you know, again, within all that, acres are going to be higher, but supplies are not going to be heavy or burdensome. You know, we're going to have a tight carry-in. The acreage increase isn't going to be that high unless we get weather conditions that just blow the doors off on yields. It's not like we're going to be crushed with pea inventory, especially for yellows, greens, maybe a little more risk. But uh, you know, that that's kind of kind of the backdrop as we start thinking ahead to some scenarios for next year for for peas, uh, peas specifically. Uh, looking at lentils again, you know, kind of a, from a production perspective, the graph doesn't look that different than it did for uh, for for peas, just in terms of of uh, you know drop in production, primarily from reds. Greens were you know relatively stable, but at at low levels in terms of of production. And so, just a, again, just another year. If you look at yields, there are three years in a row of of yields that were far below what uh, uh, you know what we had been accustomed to for a period of time before that. And and again, not not anything I necessarily am, I'm telling you, not anything that you guys don't already all. I'll know. So, you know, lower production over this this last year by by a significant margin, and particularly for for reds. Uh, so this is a graph of exports, and again, not entirely unlike on the P side. I mean, the stories, of course, are a little different. Uh, but you know, like okay, exports are are low. You know, that's not a demand problem. That's a supply issue. We just simply don't have the lentils to be able to export more than probably about 1.5 million tons. Is kind of what what our our thoughts are here. Is is probably a probably a, a, a maximum. Uh, again, with with lentils, uh, you know, more diversified than peas typically in terms of export markets. You know, things like that, things like that help. Which, uh, you know, in, in this case, uh, India is is the is the biggest and and most important one. So, you know, exports are limited because, quite frankly, stocks are just incredibly low, right? For this is a graph of ending stocks for lentils by type and and greens. There's just pretty much nothing left, and you know, I guess you know, prices are kind of you know kind of affirming that in terms of of old crop. Uh, Red stock supplies very very low as 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 well, you know. Part of what's you know what's sort of been driving that. This is a graph of India's lentil imports and just a, just a record pace. This is by uh, by uh, year from April to March. Okay, so this is cumulatively over the course of the year, and so we kind of got the last data that we got is for November, and just a, just a record record pace of of imports from from India. 
of course, you know, of which, uh, you know, we're, we're a major supplier, but also, you know, Australia as, as well. So, uh, again, you know, enormously important market, you know, as Jeff talked about, you know, there's maybe some, some government relation issues there that are, that are a bit of a challenge, but certainly they've been buying a lot of lentils from us. And so, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, and, and they've had a pretty ferocious appetite for it, not just from us, but from elsewhere. You know, in terms of the uh, the you know the outlook for for lentils and, and probably in terms of India, you know their demand is is maybe also impacted more so by their domestic production than say pea imports specifically, for example. And so you know it looks like they're probably going to plant more more acres here, likely record planting, uh, moisture situation, not terrible, not great. Uh, next few weeks, I think, will be pretty important, and so that's something we're we're really keeping an eye on. If suddenly they get some timely rains and some conditions improve there, you know, maybe maybe their demand isn't going to be quite as as robust as it was this last year. But but we'll see. You know, they're, we're kind of kind of going through a, a critical part of their their production window, and so you know that's uh, that's something we're uh, we're obviously keeping a keeping a real close eye on here as as we as we go forward. But you know, they had an incentive to plant more lentil acres, and and they and they have. So this is a graph of uh, of, of lentil prices for uh, you know for for old crop here, and so of course again large small green lentil prices just you know just just record levels you know and and again just reflecting the fact that there's basically no supplies left to speak of in in Western Canada you know drawn down to next to nothing, unlike red lentils uh, where there are maybe a few other countries that that can be pretty important suppliers globally, really nowhere but us in the U.S. in terms of green lentils, and so when we're drawn down to nothing prices kind of do kind of do this. And that's why, you know, for example, with red lentils, it's kind of, you know, the prices are still pretty decent from a historical perspective, but kind of just sort of been grinding along in a little bit of a range. And, and again, it's a, just a bit of a reflection that there are other countries out there, you know, Australia and some others that that are are can supply fairly sizable volumes and just provide a little bit more competition in, in global markets. Uh, you know, in terms of just, again, sort of going back to this, this market strength, uh, sort of metric that we use and so specifically for lentils again large greens and small greens you know like like you know very very strong by sort of these these various metrics that we put together reds a little bit less so and it's you know it's a function of of just the fact that prices have sort of been grinding along in a sideways sideways pattern uh, so that's kind of kind of a quick quick snapshot if you're going to summarize a few different you know seasonal components and those sorts of things in terms of of uh, our old crop red lentils so this is a graph of uh, of lentil acres here. We do we are looking for a small bump in acres in total, but again, they're going to be kept at a pretty low level. And we we've spent a lot of the day here and about you know some of the disease challenges and those sorts of things. And and ultimately between between just you know considering rotations and seed supplies and so forth, it, I guess I'd phrase it to you this way: it's certainly not a lack of price incentive to put more le green lentils in the ground. You know, it might be seed availability, rotation, some of those things that limit that. So we are looking for for a bump in in lentil acres. Uh, reds maybe just up fractionally, not very much. We think most of the increase will probably be in in green lentils, is kind of what we're anticipating here. Uh, which then, as we look ahead to next year, maybe has some you know some implications in terms of where some of the price risks might be when we, we think specifically uh, about lentils. Uh, so this is a graph actually of, of old crop and uh, of large greens and, and red lentils. And so again, just like the previous graph, sort of the, the solid line is, uh, you know, kind of the old crop prices and then the, the sort of the, the dashed line, it might not show up very well on the slide, is, is new crop bids. And so the thing about reds specifically, you know, so new crop bids are a little lower than than old crop prices, but just sort of, you know, kind of kind of range bound, and that's probably a reasonable, uh, you know, reasonable reflection of kind of what we think is a likely scenario going forward. Uh, that big gap between old crop and new crop bids for large greens. That's probably also pretty reasonable because if we do end up actually seeing the kind of bump in acres in large green lentils that we think is likely or or quite possible. And we do get any kind of a rebound in in yields, and of course, you know, if you know, there's a lot of ifs in those that th when you think about rain and and production and so on and so forth, you know, we are going to have that increase in green lentil supply that is going to put some pressure on prices, right? So that is really one we want to be mindful of 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 the risk of that market being a bit oversupplied. Now, again, of course, you know, obviously you've got to grow it. If it's dry and yields stink again or whatever, then obviously you know that changes things in a hurry. But acres are going to be up if yields improve. There is simply going to be more supply, and we're not going to see the kinds of prices we're we're seeing here today. And even those new crop bids maybe have some downside to them. So that's something that we're kind of kind of 
you know, cautious of and, and mindful of on, on lentils here, just based on, you know, kind of some, some likely scenarios that we see going forward or, or at least, you know, quite reasonable. So, you know, just kind of, kind of summarize, you know, some, some thoughts on the lentils specifically. Again, it's, uh, you know, very, very tight stocks coming into this next harvest. And so that is kind of the backdrop against which you know, for a lot of these crops, you know, is, is kind of sits there is, is because stocks are tight, there really isn't a lot of room to handle a yield setback. Uh, you know, there's, there's just not that much cushion. Uh, but of course, you know, if we do get the yields and the acres are higher now, suddenly, you know, there's a little bit more room in, in those markets, uh, continue to have solid export demand for greens. Uh, you know, India is, remains a, a, a key variable. Um, Area again, likely higher in Canada, but uh, you know it's it's you know supplies could feel feel heavier this next year again with with average yields and and again just sort of the obvious the obvious question around around moisture concerns. Um, but that's where the, we do see some some downside risk possibly in the in the green lentils in in particular. Kind of just looking specifically at uh, at, at chickpeas. Uh, so this last year, we actually saw a bit of a bump in chickpea production. We saw a pretty big increase in seeded area. Uh, so yields actually were were down, and but even so, you know, production was you know production was up a little bit because seeded area was was quite a bit higher. So uh, and and again, so the the, the bars there are are uh, are production, and and the the yellow line reflects reflects yields. So yields were were softer this past year, which kind of uh, but that was more than offset by the increase in acres. Even so, um, you know, supplies really tight for, for chickpeas. You know, we had a really small old crop carrion. Uh, production was up, but it was still, you know, not a, not a big number. And so overall supplies, you know, were, are, you know, again, the smallest since, you know, 2016, 17. So we have just a real, real tight chickpea supplies here in, in Western Canada this, this, this last year. Okay. Uh, the other thing too, is we, we've had pretty good export demand. So this is a graph of exports by month. To the various destinations, and so the bars show kind of what we what we are by month to the various regions. Uh, the the line, the solid line, is uh, what we did last year by month, and then the dashed line is kind of the five year average. And so you can see actually we've you know we've had we've had pretty darn good movement of chickpeas earlier on in the year here relative to last year and what we typically might do. And you know drawing supplies down. So what that gray bar is is basically the only that's all we're allowed to basically do on average per month going forward. Uh, because that's all we have for supplies, right? So basically, we're going to have to keep our exports to just barely over 5,000 tons per month here, kind of going forward, just because we simply don't have the supplies to export more than that, you know. So supplies are tight, big early season movement, drawn stocks down next to next to uh, you know no levels here for for the balance of the balance of the year. You know, one of the things that we have seen with chickpeas, so chickpea prices here have been relatively good, but not like, for example, you know, large green lentils or that sort of thing. This is a graph of, of uh, Kabuli chickpea bids across a bunch of different locations. And so you can kind of see, you know, in terms of Saskatchewan and, and, and U.S. prices, you know, like relatively decent, but on the bottom, they're definitely have not seen the kind of increase that we've seen in, in some other markets. So we definitely have been lagging a, a little bit. Uh, maybe a couple of reasons we've, you know, these some of these cases are kind of destination markets. Or, or other markets where it's you know been a little bit a little bit tighter than than we've been, um, you know certainly one of the things one of the things that does linger in the back of our minds a little bit is I think chickpea supplies might be a little bit underreported actually so sort of talking about oh, they're tight they're tight they're tight they are tight, uh, but there might be more there than what Stats Can is saying and so they're maybe not quite as tight as we think and that might be also partially what's what's causing a little bit of a price lag here, uh, but nonetheless you know we still uh, you know prices are still going you know, pretty. Pretty decent from a historical perspective. Again, looking at this sort of this this scorecard or whatever that we have, you know, again, Kabuli chickpeas here in Western Canada still still you know looks looks pretty good by a number of different measures. And again, it's it's just a reflection of the pulse complex compared to just about everything else is is kind of really what uh, what is sort of sort of showing up showing up here. Uh, we are expecting more acres in Western Canada next year, probably up to about 350,000. So, you know, it's actually, you know, pretty high by historical standards. It's, you know, over the last decade or so, uh, you know, not the peak, but certainly, uh, you know, certainly we, we think we'll see a, a, a bump in, in acres here to, you know, relatively, relatively high levels based on kind of what we've, what we've been seeing. And again, I think the incentive is, is there, is there to do so, uh, this is uh, this is a graph of uh, old crop and new crop bids for kind of what we're tracking here in Western Canada. And again, you can see, you know, the the, the dark red line is is old crop prices. 
you know, pretty good by any measure kind of, you know, prior or post, you know, 2018, give or take, you know, and again, markets tight, global markets are tight. So, you know, that's, that's pretty fair. You know, new crop bids are a little bit lower. That's probably also, also fair. And again, you know, if we do, you know, stocks are going to be really tight coming into this next season, but if acres are up, if we get a bit of a bump in yields, uh, one of the things with with chickpeas is is we're kind of a relatively small player globally in that market compared to say you know relative to like say peas or, or lentils where we have a much bigger footprint, and so countries like uh, Argentina have a bigger crop they're exporting more aggressively you know I think Mexico is coming around and and so we sort of we're sort of a little bit more of a follower in in those in those markets. Uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that the outlook is is pessimistic or negative per se, but uh, we are a little bit more susceptible to kind of what's going on in a in a few other few other important countries that that are our suppliers. So just to just to kind of summarize a few thoughts on on, on chickpeas. Uh, again, we have bigger crops, but but su supplies are supplies are low. Um, situation has been tight will remain very very tight for chickpeas. The the stocks just simply simply aren't there, right? It's it's uh, even if they are underreported a little bit uh stocks will be drawn down to drawn down to next to next to nothing um i think that india india's uh, chickpea area will be lower now that is mostly desis right so but their area will be a little bit a little bit lower but that's something to something to watch uh again we think that uh, area will be higher in canada supplies will still be pretty low right so even though acres are up and if we do get a bump in in yields it's not like we're going to get uh you know, get get run over with chickpea supplies, and we got you know bins and bins of it. And what on earth are we going to do with this stuff? That that's not necessarily the case. Uh, but also within that backdrop, mindful of the fact that prices are are pretty good, pretty good as as well. So maybe just a, a just a few a few summary comments, and then I, I think I do have time for for a few questions from folks if if you have any. Um, you know, again, it's it's one of those things when we take a step back and look at the bigger picture, we can kind of look at the granular on on pulses specifically, and I think those things are very uh, you know real and and you know drive prices for sure. Uh, but we don't want to lose sight of of kind of these bigger picture things as well. And uh, you know, we've been really you know the the pulse market has been really strong relative to most other crops. Uh, I'm not here to do an outlook on other crops, but I would say the outlook is probably you know maybe maybe mixed at at best depending which crop you want to talk about. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's something we just got to be a little bit, a little bit mindful of as much as pulse supplies are tight. Uh, you know, a lot of these other markets, you know, can be definitely be a little bit of a, a little bit of a headwind with, with some, you know, markets doing what markets do and some spillover effect. You know, how much upside is left for old crop? I, I'm not sure, right? You look at something like large green lentils, for example, um, you know, it's not like there's any left to speak of, but that doesn't mean prices are going to go higher. You sort of wonder if we aren't sort of, you know, tapped out. Uh, something like uh, uh, green peas, probably similar, right? Like, I'm just not sure how much upside is is left in those markets and there isn't much supply left. And, uh, excuse me, you know, one, one of the challenges is even, for example, buyers being able to make commitments that they don't know they can source it. And so you end up sort of going maybe a little hand to mouth. You'll probably still have, uh, you know, end users or, or buyers sort of, you know, have a little bleeding specials here and there, but that might be kind of what we're resorted to. And it's just a function of it and not much of it left out there. So, you know, that's one of the things we wonder, you know, even in yellow peas and red lentils, not sure, not sure how much upside there is left on, on, on old crop. Uh, but, but we'll see. Acres will almost certainly be up in 2024. Again, there's rotation considerations and, and uh, those sorts of things that limit how much they would go up. Certainly if you look just at prices and relative returns, the increases would be much larger than they are. We don't think the increase in acres will be that aggressive varies a little bit by type you know larger production likely again with a big question mark about just you know how how dry it is and and you know what does that ultimately mean when we you know are we going to get the rain that we need or not uh but probably projecting to lower prices in 24 25 again a largely dependent on the on the rain um you know, so like a lot of crop markets are becoming, I, I sort of use the phrase more normal. You know, we're coming off a few years where, where markets were anything but normal. And we're probably sliding more into a window of time here where, again, whether there's uncertainty, the, the, the external uncertainty is as high as ever, even if sort of the grain market dynamics are becoming, again, somewhat more normal. It will be impacted in terms of, you know, maybe stormy seas in the world around us a little bit. But, you know, crop markets 
probably becoming a little bit more normal, all else, all else equal. And so, uh, you know, that, that's kind of, yeah, some, some things we're thinking about and, 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 and seeing, and, and maybe with that, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it open to some questions. As I mentioned, I got some cards on the, on the table there as well. I know I blasted through a lot of the stuff pretty quick. Uh, you know, if folks have any questions, you know, again, those are my digits, feel free to call or text or, or email. Um, if, if folks are interested in, in seeing some of the stuff we put on a regular basis, we do offer a, a, a trial and, and, you know, can reach out to me or our website as well. But, uh, you know, with, with that, I, I won't, won't belabor that point. And, uh, instead I'll, uh, I think flip over to the next slide here in case there are some questions that are popping up from the, from the audience or folks from the floor. And so, um, with that, I'll, I'll throw it open to any, uh, any, any questions that, that folks have. Mm -hmm. Would you need to do a new crop lentil and chickpea on track right now, this next week? <laughs> oh, the, uh, the, the, the nail me down for a price, uh, <laughs> question i you know I, I should have anticipated this no so i guess it phrased it this way and i'm not sure maybe over the last week or so what what we got for so do you think about large crop uh, or sorry large large green lentils and what what kind of are you seeing out there currently ballpark maybe yeah you know honestly oh i see i see some heads shaking in the room for new crop yeah 55. No, I, I guess I, would, I guess I'd probably phrase it to you this way. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, uh, I think at prices in those sorts of ranges, I guess I would phrase it to you this way. And this is, you know, so this is kind of where you slide from the market outlook perspective to how do you make a good business decision on your farm? And that's kind of a different conversation, right? That is a little bit of a different conversation. And so I would think of it this way, uh, from a risk management perspective, I think if you're looking at those sorts of prices for large green lentils that we're seeing here, you know, high forties into 50, 50 plus and stuff like that, I probably would be doing some of that in new crop. And that's not an absolute inevitable. There's no possible way that price can go higher. We know the things that we don't know. Uh, and those could end up pushing prices higher, but we also know the things we don't know that could see those prices, you know, maybe being happy to get low forties and higher thirties possibly too. And I would say that that is an equally plausible scenario. So I would say, you know, in terms of, from, a, of, uh, we know what we don't know and playing some defense. I think those sorts of prices are ones I would probably would give some pretty good consideration to all else equal. Chickpeas. And so what's the, what, what is some of the stuff you're seeing available or everybody is, Yeah, like like I would have a little bit of a similar mindset, and one of the one of the challenges I think with with chickpeas too is because you know we are a little bit more so even at the mercy of what's going on in some of the other other major suppliers as well. So I, I think I would have a bit of a similar mindset of the fact that you know playing some defense and and being able to lock in some pretty attractive prices. I, I think that's something that is is less about oh we you know and there's no way that chickpea prices can go higher. We can have a conversation next November and say oh geez you know you said the price in you know high fifties you idiot it's you know seventy two or something like that. That's very possible. But uh, again, I, I think the way the things, the, 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 the different pieces stack up, I'd be a little wary to the downside to at least not be complacent. I guess complacent, I, I guess avoid being complacent is maybe how I would phrase it when in, in my mindset a little bit. So I don't know if that's super helpful, but that's less of an outlook type of a comment, but more just thinking, you know, managing some defense on things that we just, knowing what we don't know, I, I guess is maybe, you know, how, how I'd phrase it, if, if that's at all helpful. <laughs> Uh, any thoughts on inflation and interest rates through this next year? Well, now I'm going to really step outside of my area of expertise here. I'll get, I'll get, you know, get, get pinned down and then someone from BMO or something like that's going to come and rough me up in the parking lot. But uh, anyway, you know, actually this is a really good question. And so, you know, one of the things, and again, I'm going to you know qualify this by saying that I am not a macroeconomist. But, you know, I think over a long period of time, you know, you sort of end up following people and, you know, not just some quack that gets thrown on TV here and there because, you know, they they look good and they work this and that or whatever. But, you know, like some people that I would say I genuinely consider like really smart and mindful over a long, long period of time on some of these macroeconomic issues. And just the 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 absolute polar opposite views on things like, say, inflation going forward, which, of course, then immediately backs into what our interest rate's going to do. Uh, 
I find it quite striking. And, and, you know, again, these are people that I think are respected and mindful. They're not just, you know, barking out something outrageous. So they get a, you know, get a, get on a headline or something like that. As if I sat up here and said, Canola's going to go to 30 bucks so I can be in the Western producer or something like that. Like people that, you know, genuinely, you know, try and mindfully put out thoughtful research, really opposite ends often of the spectrum on the inflation component. So there's two parts, I guess, that I think of, and I'm going to, it's going to kind of be a non-answer, but you know, if I look at a chart like that energy and that, you know, crude oil chart and, and energy drives everything and energy prices are grinding lower and like that must, I think that's telling us something. And so, you know, that'll trickle back in, I think to, you know, kind of dampening inflation. And I, I do think that that might end up ultimately being the case, uh, now, remember also inflation as a year over year comparison. So it doesn't mean prices all of a sudden start coming down for everything or whatever like that. All of a sudden that dishwasher isn't going to suddenly be dirt cheap. It's probably going to stay expensive. It might stop going up. So when I think about inflation, it's always a year over year comparison. And I, I wonder if that doesn't start to slow. I wonder if there isn't, you know, more issues in the economy and those sorts of things that, that end up, you know, dampening some of that. Um, but at the same time, you know, if, if trade is less, uh, there's a little more sand in the gears of trade, that's inflationary. Um, as long as our governments choose that fiscal restraint is less important than just about everything else, uh, that's inflationary, you know, so there's kind of some countering forces on that one. So I I, I don't know, I, I guess, to be honest, I, I don't know. So uh, that's, again, kind of a non-answer. I guess for what it's worth, you know, I had, I had a loan that we had to renew this year and we did a variable because it wasn't that much more than locking in for three or five years. And I, I sort of locked, I, I did a variable realizing that, you know, there's some risk to that. I don't know that rates can go a whole lot higher without breaking things. Uh, that doesn't mean they can't. So I don't know, for whatever it's worth, speaking in an area, and actually I'm not an expert in, but that's my, my two cents on the question that was asked. Someone asked, so you got a, uh, an amateur answer anyway. Any other any other questions from uh, from anybody? And and again, I'm I'm happy to chat with folks. I'm not running out here. I, again, I got some cards on the table. Feel free to call or text or email after. I know I ripped through a lot of slides in a in a, in a hurry there, but but happy to take a few more here if we do have uh, if we do have time. Great. Well, again, appreciate everybody sticking around after, uh, you know, a robust meal and uh, and uh, the opportunity to be here. And uh, again, uh, uh, happy to answer any questions or chat afterwards. So thanks, everyone. OK, thanks, uh, John. That concludes our program for today. We hope you found the meeting informative and we thank you for joining us. Uh, we'd like to thank and recognize our generous sponsors who helped make today's meetings possible, FMC Canada, Gowan Canada, Syngenta Canada, and Corteva AgriScience. Uh, thank you for supporting this event and Pulse Growers in Saskatchewan once again. We would appreciate it if you could take a few mo moments to complete a survey to let us know what you liked and how we can improve for future meetings like this. Uh, for in-person attendees, you can scan the QR code found on the card on each table. And for those of you joining us virtually, you'll receive an email following this meeting with a link to that survey. We are hosting additional meetings like this in North Battleford, Weyburn, and Humboldt throughout January and February. Uh, so please tell your friends, family, or colleagues. You can find the agendas and registration links on our website at Sask Pulse. So with that, have a great afternoon, everyone, and stay safe. Drive safe. <laughs>